This is Audible. Zombie Paradise Lost, Still Alive, Book 6. Written by Javin Bonds. Narrated by S.W. Salzman. Forward narrated by Eric A. Shellman. The events of Book 6, Zombie Paradise Lost, take place simultaneously as events in Book 5, Zombie River Run. Forward by David A. Simpson Right out of the gate, you know Javin's story will be different. He has a keen eye for the absurd, and sometimes his characters are laugh-out-loud funny, sometimes brain-bashingly brutal. There's not a whole lot of political correctness in his books, and he has no qualm skewering all the sacred cows. If you're laughing at something others would find a little offensive, keep reading. He'll probably get around to offending you later on so others can laugh at your offense. It's all in good fun. I believe the stories resonate with his readers and fans because they are about everyday people making the best of the end of the world. No up-armored gun bunnies with an apocalyptic stash of MREs and machine guns. No Tier 1 operators kicking ass while chewing bubblegum. Javin's characters are slackers and posers, strong and weak, smart and dumb, men and women, black and white. Everyday people who got lucky and survived, then got smart to stay alive. If you're reading this, you've probably already followed all of Moe and Company's adventures up to this point. I'm in the same pirate boat as you. I haven't read the following adventure yet and I'm sure you're anxious to get to it, not listen to me prattle on about how awesome Javin is. It's been said that southern men tell better jokes, and Javin takes that skill and transfers it to the written page. Enjoy the adventure that awaits. David A. Simpson, author of the Zombie Road series, available on Amazon. All is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate, and the courage never to submit or yield. John Milton Prelude Ma Gray Fox here, do you read? I was sitting on the main deck with the rest of the crew when the radio sounded. Wow, you're alive. How about those nightly debriefs? I hadn't heard from my father at the scheduled time last night, and I'd been somewhat worried. It took threatening not to go to Tuscaloosa to keep my brother from just turning the damn boat around. He fell into a more conversational tone. Yeah, sorry about that. We were at the church all night. I could hear his smile through the radio. Some temporary replacements are showing up. He said this for the benefit of the oracle. I turned to see my husky friend grinning as if he already knew. I asked into the radio. Replacements for who? Bob showed up. We also have a preacher now, and a sheriff. I was happily surprised. I knew Bob had to make it. Shit, I kind of want to go back now just because Bob's there. Why were you at church last night? It wasn't Sunday. He didn't seem to catch my sarcasm. Brother Brown was elected as the interim pastor. He gave us quite a story. My dad's choice of wording told me that he didn't believe the story was true. Gave? I take it you considered it was bullshit? I could tell he thought so. Meh, nah, there were a lot of holes in it. But you voted for him anyway. He shot back immediately. No, neither did your mother or Bob, but everybody else seemed to be in love with the guy. He continued telling us about how this charismatic speaker was immediately accepted by almost every resident of the island. Charismatic, huh? I thought about asking if this guy could become the dictator, but knew my dad had probably already been thinking about that. After a pause, I spoke into the radio. We've gone through a few dams. Most have been quiet. No losses. My dad added on to the end of my sentence. Yet. I begrudgingly affirmed. No losses yet. It's like he wanted us to barely make it. If we made it to the Gulf, he probably didn't expect three of us to be alive. I know as the hero I would have to be included in the three, but he would only accept that because it's the way things are supposed to be. He waited a long moment. How's easy? I knew it was coming. I'm here. My brother was sitting across from me. How's Haka? Daddy asked. 
She's here too. She immediately chimed in. Hey, Randy. She, like everyone else I've ever met, has already taken to calling my dad by his first name. I was guessing my mom would be Miss Collins. Speak of the devil. My mother came into the room and entered the conversation. They managed to talk to Smokes and every other member of the crew. Shit, even Crow got some airtime. I sat in lonely silence like an unloved stepchild. Eventually, my father remembered that I existed. Hey, Mo, your cousin is going to do a few flyovers of the county and look for more survivors. It's great that Gunnersville now has a big plane with a trained flight crew. I was glad Benji's skills were being put to use. I was about to speak when he started again. If he sees any hordes, he'll drop some 120s on them. I was hoping he would do just that. My mother chimed in. Elmo, Ezekiel, watch out for one another on your trip. I cringed at her use of my full first name. We smiled and nodded, then realized we needed to answer verbally. We both sounded back that we would. Well, good talk. Buzz you tomorrow night. Daddy was winding down the conversation. I laughed. You sure about that? You don't want to start making them bi-nightly? He fell back into his usual radio stance. Mo, yes, I'm sure. And no, we will continue with our set schedule. Ugh. Gray Fox over and out. Well, this carefree adventure is going to be business as usual. No twists and no surprises. Don't expect to read about any clashes with the evolving peavies. Their Northwood push started over a month ago, so the damn creeps have to be in New York by now. At least in D.C. I can imagine the monsters trying to bite Nancy Pelosi and getting silicone poisoning. Shit, never mind. You can't kill something that's already dead. Plus, she was only at work four days a year anyway. We won't come across a single living person. If we do, of course they won't have any ill intent. We are all just people trying to avoid becoming naked cannibals. Damn it. I don't remember coming across any incarnations of the villain, the dictator, or even the betrayer in my fourth journal. Tomorrow I will start a new journal. It will detail my boredom and our uneventful short trip as we travel to find the cure. You can expect absolutely, positively nothing exciting to happen on our zombie river run. One for number one. We'll be down at the Cinco de Mayo Parade on sunset in about an hour. The statement finished broadcasting as the radio stations were switched and finally turned off. Amy, the driver, a woman in her late 20s with flowing blonde hair, turned to her female friend in the passenger seat. She also was around the same age but with the shorter golden blonde hair. Like, what kind of coke you want? Amy asked as she climbed out of the car and walked toward the Exxon. A Mountain Dew. Her friend returned. Inside the gas station, the clerk behind the register was ringing up Amy's drinks. She put a 20 on the counter to pay for the drinks and the gas she was about to pump. Suddenly, a seemingly deranged and naked man came stumbling out of the bathroom in the back of the store. Disoriented, he was running into everything in his path, covering his eyes and screaming like a lunatic. Like, what's going on? Crazy old Coop must have lost his mind. Or it's just a perv, totally. Grabbing her drink, she ran out the door. Rather than pumping her gas, she jumped into the car and sat down, locking the doors. Looking back at the gas station, she could see the naked guy lunge over the counter at the clerk. This day was turning out to be a strange one. She spoke to herself in a whisper. What the fuck, for reals? Her friend looked at her eyes and followed them. What is it, Amy? The driver grew cold. More naked people were running across the causeway, headed directly toward the two friends. Every one of them had a blue tint to their skin and shielded their yellow eyes. I'm totally not going to that parade. We need to go home, dude. Amy turned the ignition over and put it into drive. The girl in the passenger seat saw the blue lunatics rushing forward. Good idea. What's going on? The fuel gauge may have been on E, but there was no time to get gas. They had to make it home, gather everyone, and get out of town. Radio stations were flipped through, getting only music or static. Either no one knew this was happening or they were willfully ignorant. 
Could this have something to do with that sickness down in Mobile? Luckily, Amy only lived a few blocks away. A couple of left turns and the car swung into the driveway. Slamming on the brakes, the driver turned to her passenger. I'll go get Mom, Dad, and Lacey. Wait here. And keep the doors locked till I get back. She sprinted to the front door. The passenger was getting antsy. She started hearing police sirens, tires squealing, what sounded like cars crashing into each other. There was even a gunshot. She was freaking out. Amy was taking forever. In the rearview mirror, she saw two naked people running down the next street. This is not happening. This is not happening. She jumped over into the driver's seat, just in case her friend never came back. Finally, Amy emerged from the front door. Behind her ran her parents and her older sister. Her father carried a rifle over a shoulder and a pistol in his hand. The passenger was so ready for them to get to the damn car. Just then, several of the naked Smurfs turned down their street. They saw Amy and her parents running toward the car. There was no time to think. She couldn't wait any longer. Sarah threw the car into drive, stomped the gas, doing a U-turn in the yard, slinging grass and dirt everywhere. Amy screamed while running after her. Sarah! Like, where are you going? Don't leave us! She wasn't able to hear Amy's frantic calls. Sarah had to go somewhere safe. Two. Systematic Annihilation The medicine man, wearing the Dark Lord of the Sith suit, rounded the corner gripping the thick wooden shaft of his two-headed mace. Pulling it on the ground behind him allowed the barbs of one head to spark and make loud noises as it scraped along the concrete. Most would call what he was doing insane. It was like he was ringing the dinner bell for the lunatics infesting this hydroelectric dam. If he didn't have a backup or reinforced plate armor, he would still be on the Viva Ancora. But calling the Peavies to come out and play was exactly what he was doing. He and Easy were ready. Easy, the protector, belted out a favorite death metal song entirely off-key. Unholy death! One last breath! How could you do this to me? He was teamed with the medicine man to protect Akka on yet another damn damn excursion. Wrenching death blood flows free. They'd walked her through nearly the entire dam and hadn't heard a peep from the rabid cannibals. The water level had dropped, the Cora entered the lock, the lock had been closed, the water level had been raised and the entire process had been completed. The team had remained entirely unmolested. Now on the return journey, the duo of armored heroes wasn't going to be satisfied, leaving without letting some infected blood. This was boring. Both main protagonists were itching for some action. They were too pumped not to be involved in mortal combat. Crossing the burning gate! Genocide! It's annihilation of the human race! He was screaming at the top of his lungs, trying to rouse up some of the filthy former humans. Finally, one of the creatures swung open a door with a metal clang. The starving beast stumbled toward the protector clad in Iron Man's armor. Attacking with no immediate reinforcements, the animal looked astoundingly gaunt. Only a weak and naked former senior citizen would act so unthinkingly. Easy drew his behemoth of a warhammer from over his shoulder as the animal drew closer on shaky legs. This was becoming nearly effortless. He laughed and looked over to Darth Vader. We're gonna have to start bringing a bottle of vinegar when we leave the boat, or make Moe come on every trip. He drew the hammer back, waiting for the slow creature to come within his reach. The barely reanimated corpse finally came within spitting distance, arms stretched forward, reaching out, just like a zombie in the movies. The protector yelled out the ending of existence sin's systematic annihilation as he brought the blunt end of his hammer down onto the head of the oncoming monster. Never stop until the job is done. Spilling blood. Die! 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 3. Introduction. Memoirs of Benji. My name is Benjamin Benji Collins, former naval flight officer in the United States Navy. I'd been taking the day off at Naval Base Ventura County the day the dead began to walk. 
my second-in-command, Devin Landers, somehow already knows every action that will be taken, as if the script has already been rehearsed. There's no way to know if it's he who is all-knowing or if he is merely channeling another. My mother is Korean. Most people find it strange to hear a southern accent coming from an Asian dude. All those names have been thrown around and I take them with a sense of pride. Call me a redneck zipperhead, a slant-eyed hillbilly, or a corn-fed chink. You can expect the same southern colloquialisms you would get in a journal by any other hillbilly from Alabama, like my cousin Mo Collins. Follow the chronicling of my after-Armageddon adventures in these memoirs. Remember, if you find this notebook unfinished, I'm either dead or naked and shitting in the woods. After returning to my Alabama home with a remnant of my crew, we made contact with a large group of survivors on Gunnersville Island. This group, led by Randy Collins, an older cousin of mine who I saw more like an uncle, was currently the interim mayor of the city of Gunnersville. After severing all land connections, he made the tiny island of Gunnersville a sanctuary for survivors of the zombie virus. The Walking Dead, or Zombies, commonly called Peavies, short for plague victim, aren't technically reanimated corpses. Sure, thinking of them as mindless, soulless, undead revenants was easier and didn't weigh on the conscience like admitting they were actually only turned into rabid animals. It was less disturbing for me to picture my bullet going through the blackened, unbeating heart of a dead person than to think that I'm murdering a sick, incoherent individual with no control over their actions. Anyway, Randy decided that I, as the leader of the only military-trained aircrew, should do some flyovers of the local area. We might find some humans in need of assistance. After we save them, then they'll be offered the opportunity to join our growing band of living people. We have plenty of space on our island refuge and we're always adding territory. I decided that taking one of the smaller planes abandoned at the airport made more sense than blowing Asriel 2's fuel on these short scouting trips. If we did spot a massive horde of undead on one of our journeys, we'd hopefully have time to get back, take the AC-130 up and drop some great balls of fire on the Blunatics. It was doubtful we'd see more than a handful together at one time. However, if I learned anything from my time in the scouts, it was be prepared. Large numbers of the infected hadn't been seen very often in the area since before I arrived on the island. On our flight to my childhood home within Marshall County in my heavily armed aircraft, leading a crew of several servicemen, we witnessed the despicable brutality of the evil known as Peavies. The loss of quite a few of our comrades on the cross-country trip was more than enough evidence of their inhumanity but the monsters were apparently starving to death or migrating out of the area. We hadn't seen the dozens or hundreds that had been decimating the towns and cities across the country beginning on May Day. Four. Into the Storm While most of the core characters set sail on the replica pirate ship Viva Ancora in search of the cure for the infection that has swept the globe, Randy Collins, his wife, and a select few of the protagonists remained on Gunnersville Island. As of late, temporary replacements have been showing up to fill much-needed roles. Before the Cora left the port to travel down the Tennessee River, Gene, the tech, had one last treat for Randy. Having been suited up in War Machine Storm Knight armor and brandishing the obligatory Nexus Blade, the interim mayor of Gunnersville couldn't imagine what Gene could possibly do to be more of a badass. He pulled up in the marina parking lot in his Humvee to find the gangplank lowered and waiting for him. Not even to the top of the gangplank and the mayor could see Gene rushing from the stairs. You have to see this! It's stellar! Randy could see the young engineer was carrying a set of what looked like Under Armour gloves. These gloves were intricately wired, leading to a small box in his other hand. Mayor Collins was excitedly puzzled. What's that? The tech answered his question with one of his own. Have you ever used a taser? Randy thought about it and shook his head. Not that I can remember, but I have seen them used plenty. Gene grinned wickedly. Well, you will never need one when you put these babies on. Roxers! Randy could only smile and laugh as he closed in on Gene. What's it do? 
he knew whatever excited the tech this much had to do something extraordinary. After sliding the gloves on, Jean pressed a button on the small box. I hate wasting food, but this will be worth it. He lifted a large mouth bass from a bucket of water. The robotics engineer gestured for Randy to stay where he was and stepped further away. He held the fish up and away, placed both hands on it, and gritted his teeth. An electric buzz could be heard. Suddenly the fish exploded as if it had been jammed full of C4. Wet smacks could be heard as tiny chunks of meat plopped onto the deck. Splashes in the water sounded. The mayor had a hard time believing what he had just seen. The fuck, white boy? You got fish on me! Crow screamed from her fishing spot. Sorry! Jean sheepishly threw an apology in her direction. Her acceptance of the apology was to wander below deck while mumbling something about motherfucking white people. Randy walked closer to his young friend. That was awesome, Jean. You could have just told me, though. Seems like an unnecessary mess. He looked the tech up and down, who was now spattered from head to toe with fish chunks and translucent scales. The comic book shop owner scoffed. Yeah, probably. But you have to admit, that kicks arse. He showcased his new toy. These gloves will replace the gloves of your body condom. He ran his hand along the wires to the box. The energy pack is solar charged. Unfortunately, it only has enough juice for a single punch every few hours. The tech looked wistfully at the gloves on his hands. The charge would not transfer to your nexus blade. I wish it could shoot lightning, but I'm not a miracle worker. Perhaps if I had more time. He thought as he raised a finger and lifted the energy pack. See back here? It attaches to your waist on the back of the suit. Randy raised an eyebrow. Storm gloves? The tech smiled. Almost. They will be inside the suit. Storm gauntlets. Days after the Cora left, Mayor Collins hadn't yet had a chance to try out his new toy. The charger added no noticeable weight to his armor, so wearing it became standard. Randy wore his armor whenever there was any chance he could be attacked. Rarely coming in contact with a single PV, his preparations seemed for naught, but he smiled at the thought. That's what they said about my freeze-dried food. Look who's still wearing pants. It was better to be prepared than to be confronted with obstacles and have no defense. Even if he wore the armor and storm gauntlets every day for the rest of his life and never had a need to use them, he would still be glad to have been equipped with them. Whenever things felt normal, as if there had been no zompocalypse and the enemy was not at the gate, Randy could almost convince himself it had all been a dream. Maybe there are no blue cannibals. Perhaps we're all just a group of crazy people that murdered a city full of innocents and fought a little war with the army. That couldn't be possible. The government would have just given up even after we handed their asses to them. But with the occasional sightings of lunatics by other townsfolk, however, the mayor knew the monsters would make an appearance eventually most likely sooner rather than later. Late one afternoon, Randy had been summoned to the gas bank. A quarrel had begun over a recaptured vehicle. Of course, the mayor was called to calm tensions. The gas bank was the depository for all vehicles that had been on the island or brought in by survivors and rescuers. Set up in the shopping center parking lot on the west side of Highway 431, just at the bottom of Sand Mountain and right before the causeway leading north into town. It was the perfect spot. Since Gunnersville Island was not very large, there was no real need for gas-powered vehicles. Other than refueling search and rescue or lawn equipment, the island used very little of the gas left in the abandoned vehicles. Regular shifts of attendants slash guards watched over the graveyard of every kind of car and truck you could imagine. They were, of course, well-armed and used the old bank building in the shopping center parking lot to hold up in during the night. I don't give a shit, it's mine! A short, clearly foreign man named Rommel was screaming at another in an almost comical accent. A taller man with graying red hair, Monty, held his hands up, palms facing out in the international sign of surrender. Why does it matter if it was your find? It can be used now to help everyone. One of the attendants of the gas bank had begun explaining the situation to the mayor on the walk from his Humvee to the back of the parking lot where this argument was taking place. 
one party found and reclaimed a certain vehicle. The other party claimed ownership to the said vehicle before May Day. Now the second party demanded rights to the vehicle be given back to him, and only him. Randy could sympathize with the original owner, but he also understood the rules changed the day everyone became blue and naked. It's all mine! I paid money for it! You can't have it! Randy almost laughed at the little man and his demands. Money doesn't mean anything anymore. I don't want it anyway. It's supposed to be used for the good of the community. Monty didn't want to argue. He just wanted to help where he could. The mayor came within speaking distance and looked at the man claiming to be the original owner. What would you do with it if you had it? You won't be using that thing on the island. Randy gestured to the massive black four-door pickup truck, suspended on a ridiculously high lift kit. It would take a ladder for even the tallest man to get into the seat. I'm not going to be here much longer. It's coming with me. Ronald was livid. Randy smirked. You're just going to leave now? You sure you didn't mind accepting the island's help before? I never needed any of you fucking people. You just threw your shit at me. The little man continued to scream. You're free to leave, but we'll need some kind of compensation for everything we did for you. The truck works as payment. It almost made the mayor feel sick. What he was doing would have been considered stealing before May Day. Though it felt like socialism to say it, the community came first, especially when it came to squabbles over things valued in the old world. The short man was enraged. My truck goes with me! Fuck you all! The man's heels were against the front left tire of his truck. Rommel violently jerked a pistol from his waist and pointed it at Monty. This is my truck. I paid a lot of money for it, and it's more important than some old guy's life and the lives of every one of those fucking moochers on the island. They won't have what I worked for. It's mine. The older man stuck his hands in the air. Whoa, now let's be civil about this. Randy picked up his pace when Rommel brought up his gun. Almost even with the back of the pickup, he was about to try and defuse the situation with some calming words. Before the mayor could speak, a shot rang out. Rommel had just shot Monty. The round hit the older man just above the sternum. The hollow point stole his ability to breathe. It instantly destroyed arteries and sent blood flying. A slow whistling started at first, then immediately quickened to a loudening hiss as unused oxygen and leftover carbon dioxide filtered into the air in a misty haze of blood spatter. The lead projectile exited out of his back, vaporizing spine and muscle on its first and only flight. Monty collapsed in a heap. No one but the screenwriter knew whether blood loss or lack of oxygen would end his life, but it ended quickly. Rommel appeared shocked, dropped the revolver, and turned to face the mayor. I'm sorry. I didn't know it would do that. Mayor Collins was stupefied. It was a three fifty seven. What do you think it'd do? It was impossible to understand Rommel through his mumbling and weeping. What could be understood was the distant, excited howl from the southeast. Zombies did not often encroach on the expanded green zone to the south of the island. A gunshot, however, would alert them to the opportunity of game, and they would eventually smell fresh blood. With the sun setting, they would be especially active. Starvation would drive most any animal to take ridiculous risks for just a bite of food. Boys, we got company. Everyone who had been alive since May Day knew what that sound meant. Rommel looked wide-eyed at the mayor. He pointed down at his pistol lying on the ground. Can I use that? Mayor Collins was glad the little man was respectful enough to ask. Rommel deserved to see justice. Randy was confident he wanted to see it as a human. I don't think you'll be shooting us. Keep it pointed at the peavies. Rommel daintily picked up his revolver, making a show of keeping the muzzle pointed far away from the other humans. The survivors waited in ready positions and were met with complete silence. They continued to watch, remaining as unmoving as everything else around them. Suddenly, twigs snapping and the shuffling of leaves could be heard. At the southeast end of the parking lot, a single revenant charged out of the tree line. Hunting with no clear path before it, the animal appeared puzzled. 
Randy lined up on the scourge with a 3X magnifier on his SKS. As he readied to take the shot, the little foreigner to his left began jabbering. You'll never take me from my things! He pointed and lined his pistol up on the PV. Before he could take the shot, it let out a screeching call, letting the others know dinner was served. Rommel sent three slugs at the creature and miraculously hit it with two. The first round caught it in the inside of the right elbow. As lead exploded out of the back of the arm, it forced out blood and fragmented bone back through the entry wound. The forearm was left attached only by a strip of dangling skin that would surely give way to gravity. Even if this had been the only strike, the monster most assuredly would have died from the massive amount of blood being lost. Almost at the same instant, the second round caught the zombie above the left collarbone. Traveling at over 1,450 feet per second, the magnum round vaporized bone, muscle, cartilage, and sent everything rocketing out of the gaping 12-inch exit wound, as a dark red liquid bubbled and gurgled continuously. Arteries must have been severed as blood nearly geysered from the new life-ending rent in its body. Surprisingly, the zombie turned to rush back into the cover of the trees, the dangling forearm slung around limply. The sound of a rubber band snapping sounded as the arm tore away from the ragged skin. The fingers on the blue appendage twitched briefly before going still. The rest of the body would soon become that way, whenever it finally grew too weak to press on. It might take several minutes, but the creature would succumb to the cold embrace of death shortly. Silence would be the last thing it heard before Blue Infinity overtook it. The mayor looked over to the smiling little man. You're an idiot. Rommel lost his grin. What? Why? I killed it! Randy opened his mouth to reply when barking was heard. It grew closer and more intense. His response was to cock his head and raise his eyebrows as if to say, See? Rommel opened his mouth and closed it. He understood what he put into motion. It was only a guess if the man was shaking with impotent rage or horrific dread. Rommel replaced the now empty shells in his revolver and prepared again for an incoming throng of the maniacal blue enemy. Bodies could be heard rushing through the foliage. Suddenly ten more peavies cleared the tree line in a dead run. In another instant, what had to be hundreds of sets of bare feet came slapping against fallen leaves and then the pavement. Company has arrived with several guests, plus one my ass, one of the men called out. In response, Randy checked to make sure his magazine was full and that he had a round chambered in his SKS. The call of the PV had been picked up by the other gas bank attendants and the alarm had been sounded. They retreated to a fortified and defendable location. Being able to strike back at their own attackers, they wouldn't be able to reach out to assist the mayor's group. The mayor, wearing his full armor carrying his SKS, the lightly armored gas bank official with a pump-action shotgun, and the worthless pipsqueak Rommel, wearing a t-shirt carrying his three fifty seven snub-nose were on their own about to face a horde. Randy had dealt with similar situations in the past. If it is a screenwriter's will, I'll come out of this. Up there! Randy turned to see Spencer pointing up to the cab of the truck. That would be great. There's just no way we'll be able to get up there. Just as Randy thought this, the lowest in stature of the three turned into a parkour ninja, ran up the front tire, jumped over to grab the railing, and heaved himself up to open the door. A rope ladder was suddenly flying down by the door. The screenwriter was smiling down upon them. They could do nothing but hoot and holler as they sprinted to their salvation. Sitting in the driver's seat, the mayor smiled at the man who just proved his worth. Good job, Rommel. Now I just wish you had more than a few shots. Rommel smiled and raised a finger. He popped open the glove box to reveal a 50-count box of three fifty-seven ammunition for his revolver. Randy chuckled. Hot damn, son. If I wish for some more seven six two, would you have that? The short man frowned, indicating he was all out of miracles. Down on the ground, zombies sparred to get first dibs to rip into the buffet that was formerly Monty. The body was being ripped apart, and peavies continued to fight for every last piece. Animals gashed into each other, causing each tender morsel to be paid for in blood. The sounds of snarling and angry yipping were the soundtrack playing over the horrific dismemberment of the now-fallen survivor. Spencer lowered his window behind Randy, shouting profanities down at the infected. 
He stuck his shotgun in the opening. Take this, you sick fucks! He sent shell after shell of superheated pellets into the throng. Blue bodies were ripped by the metal rain, getting wanted screams from the undead. Cannibal after cannibal exploded from back to front. Tiny pellets ripped through muscle, organs, and even bone to burst into grayish-red sloppy piles. A revenant would step over their fallen to get closer to the cuisine, taking the next volley of lead. Spencer continually fed shells into his shotgun's tube. Eventually running out of buckshot, he dropped the shotgun without a word. He screamed, on par with the infected in front of him, as he repeatedly launched pistol rounds into the mass of shit-covered zombies fighting for a taste of Monty. The onslaught falling onto them could not be realized past their insatiable hunger. Mayor Collins, however, was saving his rounds for when he needed them. Rommel wasn't going to waste bullets from his snub nose on targets at a distance he knew he would not be able to reach with assured accuracy. This was one of the occasions Randy approved of his greediness. Even six shots might come in handy. Spencer used every single shot he had on the horde that was facing the opposite direction. Not that Randy was upset he was shooting them in the back, he just thought it foolish to waste precious ammo on an enemy that was not currently attacking. They would be appearing soon enough. Randy was sure every bullet he had would be needed to fend off the monsters. Be smart. Be prepared. When Tiny Death began flying from the cab of the truck, the Peavies understood this was where the pain came from. The monsters had enough intelligence to stay away from the front of the truck, at least until they were up high enough to get at the tasty buffet inside. Randy launched a few pieces of lead at the animals as they ran under or around to the back of the truck. They weren't giving up easily. The occasional zombie caught around from his rifle as they rushed for cover. A blue skull would take a hit, caving in and spewing gray matter before the bullet continued on its destructive path downwards. Though momentum carried the truly dead undead bodies for several feet, they eventually slid to a stop, gushing lifeblood from the gaping hole in their cranium. Eventually, the asphalt began to disappear entirely under the sheer weight of sanguinary volume being distributed by the punctured peavies. One unfortunate PV took a round in the head of its erect penis. The full metal jacket 762 didn't slow as it went cleanly through this thin member. The head went flying like a wingless roach. Blood rocketed from the wound, and the PV almost instantly collapsed into a screaming heap. Incredibly painful, the animal could die from this wound as quickly as if an artery were severed. There's a reason it's called the main vein, after all. Unsure how they got up to it, the mayor watched the creatures lift themselves over the tailgate and into the bed. Spencer had already opened the rear window and plastered himself against the back of the driver's seat. Randy aimed at the opening and prepared to send some pain down range. Before they got to the window, he had an idea. Spencer! The young man looked up to see Randy throwing down a holstered pistol and attached spare magazines. Here, make it count! Peavies detected the scent of fresh human through the window, and it drove them into a feeding frenzy. Monsters careened at the opening, willing to do anything for a bite. High-velocity metal would keep the infected back, but not indefinitely. Incalculable numbers would overcome all defenses given enough time. Randy sent a shot through a blue face. It entered through the snarling mouth, shattering teeth and vaporizing the infected monster's tongue. The round exploded out of the back of the head just under the skull. Cerebral cortex, the spinal cord, and everything in between the back of the throat and the top of the neck disintegrated in an instant. Ballistic tip plunged into the back above the solar plexus and exited just between the kidneys. It slammed into the gut of the demon unfortunate enough to be directly behind the first. By now the three occupants of the truck cab were temporarily deaf from the rounds being fired from within the enclosed area. With ears pounding and hearing almost nothing but a constant ringing in their ears, they fought on. The onslaught continued with the occasional tracer round from the SKS. With each tracer, Randy was alerted his magazine was down to five rounds. Upon each reload, Spencer would assist by pumping a few forty-fives into the faces of death. Hopefully Rommel was smart enough to keep his snub nose as a last-ditch defense. A cannibal would start to slither through the gore-spattered window to be met with small-caliber torment. 
The hollow point pistol rounds would catch an infected under the chin or at the top of the throat. A monster would be rendered instantly brain dead as any connection with the cranium was completely severed. Undead compatriots would heave fall and back out of the opening so the next contestant could die painfully. Pop goes the PV. Next. During one of Randy's reloads, Spencer put down another zombie and clicked on empty. He hurriedly ejected the mag to replace it. Randy was nanoseconds from inserting his fresh mag when Rommel thought he would come to the rescue. He screamed in what sounded like a fearful glee and launched five rounds from his revolver at the beasts plastered against the window. Glass puckered and cracked under three magnum rounds. One of the inaccurate chunks of lead sank into the rear bench. Though he was not aiming anywhere near Spencer, the fifth and wildest round sank into the man's kneecap. The gas bank attendant screamed in pain. What the fuck, you stupid bastard? Enraged Spencer may have been, but he knew the little man didn't intentionally shoot him. Rather than fire at the idiot, he merely tried to retain consciousness and focus on the demons banging on the window. It was an accident! The moron screamed. Spencer wasn't willing to argue with the nincompoop. The injured, insignificant character reloaded quickly to annihilate the enemy along with rifle rounds from the mayor. With each forceful slam from the monsters, the cracking window spiderwebbed a greater area. It would soon pose no obstacle to the outside pressure. The number of undead were dwindling, but so was ammunition. At some point, Rommel had reloaded his worthless pistol and could only watch helplessly as the revenants hammered the window. He sat with his finger on the trigger of the hammerless pistol. Spencer emptied his last pistol magazine into the beasts and unsheathed his bowie knife. Nearly a full magazine left, Randy squeezed the trigger as rapidly as he could. Steel would soon be the only protection adequate. All the glass in the back frame suddenly caved in with a pop and a thud. The monsters immediately fell on Spencer, lapping up his warm blood on the floor and seat. Rather than simply biting the living human, they grabbed at him. Receiving a few slashes from his blade, they eventually grappled it from his hands. The reanimates eventually had him by his hands, dragging him out of the back of the cab, lifting him one over another like a mosh pit. The gas bank attendant screamed and flailed as the animals carried him. Realizing what was about to happen, Randy lined his sights up on Spencer. Shooting the man would be immeasurably more merciful than allowing the peavies to slowly take him apart. As he was squeezing the trigger, Ramo let out a squeal in Randy's ear. They're taking him! The unneeded exclamation jarred Mayor Collins. Not by much, but just enough that the shot was down just a few degrees from where he intended. It didn't hit Spencer, but it hit the wrists of the beasts carrying him. They jerked their hands down and the human fell onto the side of the truck bed. He bounced and began his final descent to the ground, screaming in agonizing horror. Spencer wheeled his arms in natural reaction to falling. Luckily for him, he landed on his head. His neck snapped and his skull ruptured. The body may now be picked clean to the bone, but at least he wouldn't be alive while it happened. No shit, dumbass! Randy wanted to kill the fool beside him. Seeing his last tracer, the mayor knew close combat would soon begin. With only a few enemies left on the truck, he felt better about the odds. Nothing could stop the enemy from coming in, and the rounds from Rommel's revolver only took down one. They drugged the little man out and began carrying him. Randy knew he had one rifle round left. In a split-second decision, he decided on exploding the head of a zombie in the bed of the truck not carrying the little man. It might be considered cruel, but the mayor could live with a cold decision. The zombies would deal a severely adequate justice. Though he might feel guilty for this razor-sharp reasoning later, he knew nothing the people of Gunnersville could do to Rommel would compare in the slightest to the punishment the murderer would rightfully receive. Rommel cried and begged for help as the PV stood at the tailgate. They held him over the edge and dropped him. His wailing was momentarily stopped by a sound that wasn't a body impacting the hard ground. The waiting revenants caught the falling man. The group of creatures on the ground screamed in delight. Though small, this cattle would serve to feed the horde for several nights. Randy unsheathed his nexus blade when the yellow-eyed animals turned back to him. He paused when they stood in the truck bed and waited. They seemed to be tapping their feet. The animals wanted to square off. 
He climbed out of the broken window into the bed of the truck. Randy faced his enemies for a brawl to the death. He began slashing and cutting with his sword. The downed beast succumbed to blood loss or dismemberment. There were two enemies left, pivoting to come at him from separate angles. In all of this blood and shit, he wasn't expecting to recognize faces. He squinted. Barry? Tilda? The male had obviously been shaved completely bald before the infection. Even with fuzz now growing on the top of his head, Randy recognized the peavies. Barry Gage, Bradley's father. The other was female. It was rare to see a female peavy. Most were tucked away somewhere pregnant with the next generation of monsters. Only older females that were not able to bear children would be on the hunt. There was no need for them not to be good workers if there was nothing in the oven. Bradley's parents. These peavies had been people he knew. Though never close, he was able to recognize them, even being blue and covered in weeks old crusty shit, blood and mud. There was absolutely no way these two being paired was a coincidence. Were they aware of the past they shared together before the infection? Were they paired as anything more than hunting partners? These were questions the medicine man would love to research. For Randy, there wasn't time to stop and think about it. Hey, Tilda, your meatloaf always sucked. God, that felt great to say. Both revenants charged the mayor clad in his storm knight armor simultaneously. Pushing the creature that was formerly Barry Gage back with one arm, he sliced into what used to be Barry's wife. He sliced clean to the bone on the front of its left thigh and jammed his sword against the leg bone on the inside of its right thigh. The peavy knew, just as the mayor, that the femoral artery had been sliced. Dark blood began pouring from the gaping gash. There would be only a few minutes left in the creature's unlife. The reanimated corpse threw itself onto Randy, causing him to lose footing in the slush of undead remains pooled in the truck bed behind them. Now on his back, elbow deep in guts, shit, and brains, unable to swing a sword in the close quarters fighting, he appeared bested. Mayor Collins smiled as the blue cannibal's teeth shattered on his reinforced armor. Dropping his blade, he stiff-armed the creature in the throat. Its windpipe collapsed under Randy's weighted, plated fingers. The animal drew back, gasping and trying to get air into its lungs. Lack of oxygen would render the beast unconscious shortly but the severed artery would inevitably end its life before suffocation. Not forgetting his last opponent, Randy sat up and was knocked onto his back once more by a full body tackle. Peavies didn't seem enraged more so than usual about the loss of a comrade. The zombie, formerly known as Barry, put a hand on either side of the mayor's helmet and attempted to pull the head cover loose. Similarly, Randy placed both hands on the one slick head of the demon. An electronic buildup could be heard humming through the armor. The blue cranium suddenly exploded between the storm gauntlets. What had been a snarling monster now had no face. Everything above the collarbones became like a watermelon at a Gallagher show. The now truly dead body went rigid, then instantly limp as the brain was completely destroyed. Nothing significant enough to be a solid tooth remained of what had once been a head. Forcibly kicking itself backwards with body-jerking spasms, the defunct PV lay on the bed of the truck, convulsing from the residual electric current. Randy could smell an unnatural coppery ozone in the air. Randy would never be able to tell Bradley what had just happened here. He thought he himself might be comforted knowing his infected parents had finally been put to peace. But then he would want to know the details. Randy knew that he would hate whoever did that to his kin. So Bradley, the paraplegic bodybuilder, could never know anything about what just happened. It might leave the old friend always questioning and always looking for his loved ones, but being eternally restless would be better than knowing the horrible truth of their demise. Unknown to Randy, this would be one of the last days he would have both hands. He would have used the appendage more if he had known. Driving, climbing a ladder, and pulling a trigger thousands of times wouldn't have been enough and vaporizing what was at one time a friend's skull wasn't one of the last things he wanted to do with his right hand. But then it wasn't his decision. Five. Memoirs of Benji, one. Another entry into my memoirs obviously means we had an eventful trip and I made it back alive. 
This day started like all the other days we did a flyover to find survivors. I don't think I needed to tell you who was flying with me. I'm beginning to think that maybe all the other people who volunteered to risk their lives, rescuing complete strangers, just never show up. Or my co-pilot, Devin Landers, is secretly giving them the heads up that they will most likely meet a horrible death on these trips. Regardless, this morning was like any other morning, nothing unusual. None of the thousands of cadets enrolled in the Collins Rescue Your Fellow Man from Turning Blue School were waiting in the hangar. Imagine that. As I walked into the hangar, it was pitch black, and I began fumbling for a switch to turn the lights on. Maybe I'm just a coward, but now whenever I entered a darkened building, especially a cavernous enclosure like an airplane hangar, it scares the shit out of me. On the island, I should know better than to even worry about lunatics charging me, but still, Mama didn't raise no fool. I eventually found the switch for the lights and quickly turned them on only to find Devin sitting with his feet hanging out of the door to the plane's tiny cockpit, not a care in the world, just spinning a few lengths of his chain in a small circle in front of him. He was, of course, outfitted in his Ghost Rider's black spiked leather jacket. He looked up at me and grinned. You ready? With him here, I knew there was something I would have to be prepared for. My shoulders slumped and I sighed. As ready as I'll ever be. Being one of the first search and rescue missions attempted from the air, we followed the main roads out of town and up over the mountain. Reclamation teams had already cleared most of all the highways. This meant there were plenty of landing areas if there happened to be a need for a quick touchdown. Those scouts on land have been pretty successful in rescuing survivors. We were hoping a buzzing airplane would be noticeable to anyone remaining in the area that had been missed or not turned blue. Well, I'm sure any of the yellow-eyed monsters that were awake would probably notice us. Here's hoping they don't come out. It was uncommon to see one of the former humans in the open daylight, but not completely unheard of. They'd been nocturnal until about a month after May Day. No one understood why they suddenly seemed to evolve. Is that the right word? Maybe. At least the PV seemed to drastically alter their behavior with no warning. Evolution usually takes generations to be successful. Either way, by this point, I'm surprised they're not already laying out and getting a tan. As we approached the Albertville area, we noticed someone flashing a signal from atop the Kmart building near the main intersection of Highway 431 and Highway 75. Drawing closer, we discovered there were several figures, actually. I was a little giddy. It seemed at first more than one person had survived, and they were waiting to be rescued. If we had known what kind of animals these sadists were, we would have bombed Kmart into oblivion long ago. But then a thought hit me. How is it possible for a group of survivors living in the middle of Albertville not to see other bands of humans? They should have seen the reclamation teams roaring through the city since scouting began. There must have been other groups of survivors they would have come in contact with. There would have been the occasional individual, at least maybe even a family passing by, making their way to the safe haven of Gundersville. Even if they had passed unnoticed, these people undoubtedly would have seen our scouts. Something smells rotten in the Albertville Kmart, and it is not the rotten produce in the grocery aisle. Then again, maybe they just decided to remain cautious and steered clear of contact with armored, organized groups of four-wheeling driving rednecks wearing camouflage. Have you ever seen a group of human antagonists in any post-apocalyptic story that isn't mostly bearded white guys carrying lots of weapons, wearing mossy oak and driving pickups? These people have been justified remaining unnoticed. Maybe I should join in on some land-salvaging expeditions. How confusing would it be to anyone to see a camouflaged Asian guy in a pickup? I might even smoke a cigar or something. The bad guys wouldn't even put up a fight. Their brains would just explode. Okay, are you done picturing an Asian grizzly Adam slaughtering zombies with a bullwhip yet? Back to the story. Well, that is if you think you want to know about even more crazy shit that's beyond fucked up. It's disturbing to see how twisted humans can be even when we're an endangered species. When we drew closer, it became more apparent that the flashes weren't signals at all. There was a small war taking place in the Kmart parking lot. That building was the castle being attacked by people with small arms. Wonder who would win the day. Just exactly which side portrayed the better intentions, defender or attacker, were still unclear from the air. Who were the good guys? 
Just as I decided to circle the battle scene again to see if I could decide who was who, the defenders on the roof started launching small caliber rounds at the plane. Shit, that kind of settled it. I mean, why would you open fire on a completely unbiased spectator unless you didn't want anyone to see what you were doing? I was just looking, man. I flew on, circling back around, landing on the northbound lane of Highway 431. Touching down, we taxied until the plane sat in front of the Santa Fe Cattle Company Steakhouse and a Bojangles. Devin and I started hoofing it down the highway to meet up with our new allies, not knowing if they would actually be our allies or not when we got there. But the other guys shot at my plane. My co-pilot didn't disapprove, so it would all have to work out. At least that has been the assumption so far. I know I said assume, and we all know what happens when you assume. You're always where you are supposed to be, right? Passing the abandoned Burger King, the only cover between us and Kmart was the China King all-you-can-eat buffet. I could see the attackers taking cover behind parked cars in the lower section of the parking lot, which was at a disadvantage due to the hill the Kmart sat on. They just didn't give off a vibe of being murdering rapists, so I'd give them the benefit of the doubt. What's going on? I screamed over the gunfire and shouting of people focused entirely on combat. This could have been a foolish move on my part. They hadn't yet noticed me, and I could have observed for a while longer to try and discover their intent. If they were going to be immediately hostile to me, they could have just blown us away when I screamed out like an idiot. Before I yelled like a retard, I would have hoped Devin would have stopped me, if it wasn't part of the plan. Actually, maybe it was part of the plan for me to get riddled with bullets so he would allow that. Shit, now I'm scaring myself. Who knows? They could be like I was about the dark, but instead it's about strangers yelling questions in their ears in the middle of a gunfight. A startled man looked over at me. You got a radio? He yelled. I nodded and he spoke to one of the other men. He turned back to me and told me what channel to switch to. What kind of bad guys would give me their radio channel and offer to have a conversation with me? I say state your name and business, boy. Blinking, I looked to the man yards away, speaking to me through the radio. He didn't look like Foghorn Leghorn. My name is Benjamin Collins. Almost forgetting any formality, I quickly made an addition. I was a flight officer in the United States Navy. With whom am I speaking? Not important. I guess cordiality went out with civilization. After a few seconds, I realized that was all the greeting I was going to get. Well, what's going on here, Bubba? I could see the man thumb to Kmart. Those some bitches took my wife and girls. They ain't the only ones they took neither. He spits out of his side of his mouth. We're here to get them back. Not Foghorn Leghorn said through a wet and sloppy mouthful of chaw. Well, it looks like I picked the right side unless these guys enslaved the women to begin with and are delusional in rescuing them. I know, I know, I'm overthinking it. I do that sometimes. Well, I think we can help you with that. I turned to tell my co-pilot to sneak around to the other side of the Domino's building, which was in a better strategic location than we were in now, and put down a few of the guys on the roof. He was already gone. I hate it when he does that. There's no way to know if he's already read this entire screenplay, or if he only gets each scene just before it unfolds. If he woke up this morning with every minor detail already played out in his head, what the hell's the point in waiting until now to go over there? Why even follow me to this point? He could have gone over there, popped every single one of them, and gone in the building to save the day. Maybe it's just coming to him one snippet at a time, or maybe they just had to expend a certain number of rounds before he would be allowed to act. From around the corner of the Domino's building, several small pops sounded. I could tell from the ricochet's pitch and angle it was enemy fire from the roof of the Kmart. No death screams were heard. The shots from the enemy tapered with each round from Devon's M4 until things grew completely still and silent. You could have heard a pin drop. The four men crouching behind the parked trucks peeked over their cover. No movement. No sound. Nothing. It was like there had been no shooters on the top of the Kmart. How the hell did he do that? About 20 years ago, this Kmart had become one of those big K superstores when they tried to become like Walmart. It didn't sell fresh meat, but this Kmart had a few aisles of groceries. Not that it would feed hundreds of people for an extended period of time, 
but it'd be a decent haul for a small group to live on. It would be especially if that group supplemented the stockpile with material stolen from other survivors. A band of raiders could settle down here indefinitely. That is until they pissed me off. Looking up at the roof of the superstore, we could see where a shooter had been camping, using the top of the sign that crested over the roof as cover. He had been lying down behind it, peeking his head and rifle around the corner of the arch. Now his rifle poked out and we could see the shoulders and nothing else. What was left of his skull and brains were now spattered on the sign to his left. Chunks of gray matter and pieces of bone plastered and rapidly congealing blood clung to the sign. My co-pilot had clearly pulled off an expert headshot. On the other side of the sign, not as noticeable, was another orbless corpse. The remains of the poor bastard's cranium must have been littering the roof behind the body and down on the ground. Devin had popped at least two of the weasels hiding above and there were undoubtedly more bodies I wasn't able to see from my angle. I needed to look for a barcode on the back of his head. Was he a professional assassin? Landers came wheeling around the corner of China King. Clear! Move! Indiana Benji Jones, Ghost Rider Devin, and the four survivors sleuthed around the Domino's Pizza building and came up to the corner of the Kmart. Well, Indiana Jones and the four survivors sleuthed. Ghost Rider walked single file behind me. His M4 hung loose in its sling, obviously feeling no need to be stealthy. He walked casually as if this were any other day. He acted as if there were no naked cannibals that had overtaken the world, nor were there any villains waiting with guns just around every corner. If Devin didn't want it to appear that he had an advanced copy of the damn script, he needed to start pretending to be less omnipotent. God controlled our fates. That's what I always believed. Now if it was God, he had been watching some seriously fucked up movies. We stayed against the wall pressed up to a line of coke machines. I stopped and waited for my co-pilot to do something. There was no point in even asking. He would do something even if I just froze. Devin again proved he had already seen this movie. Waiting no longer than a heartbeat, he walked around me with a sigh. I would have called it stupid if anyone else had done it. My co-pilot stood right in front of the glass entryway without even raising his weapon and pulled open one of the side doors, which was of course conveniently unlocked. This Kmart was old enough that while it did have automatic sliding entrance and exit doors, there were also doors that simply pulled open. I wouldn't have expected the Kmart manager to have locked the doors back in May, but I figured the marauders holding out in Kmart would have found the damn keys by now. He held the door all the way open and waved his arm gesturing for us to enter. He stared stupidly at me. Well? If he wasn't with me, there's no way I would do it. There was no need to worry about getting shot. I exhaled, smiled, let my carbine hang on the sling and walked to the door my friend was holding open. Thank you kindly, sir. I smiled back at him and walked on through. There were now three choices. The automatic sliding exit to my left, the automatic sliding entrance in front and to the right, or the hinge door in front of me. For a second, I wasn't sure what to do and paused. Landers made an agreeable noise when I moved to the door in front of me. We both stood in the building proper. The only light in the building was the occasional skylight. The large building was utterly quiet, just like any busy day at Kmart pre-apocalypse. The two of us stood in the musty opening, waiting for our reinforcements. After several minutes of standing still and peering around, they came behind us, at a snail's pace. Was every buccaneer taken out on the roof? Our comrades also saw nothing in the gloom. In the few minutes we had to talk, I learned that the names of our new acquaintances. Eddie and Mike were the older two, while Toby and Tony were young teenagers. I guess we got them all. Toby spoke entirely too loud, walking toward the back of the store. I screamed a whisper. What the fuck is wrong with you, kid? Get back... My warning was abruptly cut off by more than one rifle firing. The shots came from somewhere on the other side of the jewelry counter. Both bullets caught Toby in his left ribs. Bone was shattered and fragments of white speckled a torrent of crimson that spilled from the boy. Immediately his lungs were punctured when everything from the left of his sternum caved in. Toby didn't even get a chance to fire back. He just fell to a pile on the floor, screaming and sobbing. Mike and Eddie propped their rifles on the closest checkout counter, scanning for enemies. I dropped down where I was. Waiting there, I looked behind me. 
It was clear Landers had quietly stepped back until his heels were against the door and squatted. Why would he allow an innocent young man to walk into a bullet? If he knew it was going to happen, couldn't he have stopped it? Perhaps it was supposed to be. Maybe it would have been me dying on the floor if Toby hadn't played his part. Tony started running toward where he thought the gunfire had originated. Squeezing his trigger repeatedly, he screamed, I'll kill every one of you! That was my brother! I would never have a chance to ask Tony if he and Toby had just been close or were actually blood-related. As expected, multiple rounds ripped into him. Tony sank to his knees as a bullet started flying. Just as the boy began to tip backward, one more shot rang out. It hit him in the chin. There was no way to know if he was alive when he hit his knees, but that final round ceased any brain activity, along with concerns on retrieving him for medical attention. Colors were dull in the weak light, and we were not able to see the rainbow geyser from the ragged stump where his head used to be. I'm not sure if Mike or Eddie were either the boy's fathers, but they remained calm. No screaming, no rounds fired in insane vengefulness, not even a whimper. Whether or not any of them were related, they had survived this together, so they had to be close. Perhaps not blood kin, but family all the same. Most would call their stoic acceptance of their loss cold. Really, I thought it just seemed professional. They must have been former military, at least I hope so. Otherwise, they were Texas Chainsaw-style serial killers to be so calm. I opened my mouth to ask when Eddie let one round fly from his scope 30 6 From my vantage point, nothing happened. The round sunk into the blackness and quietly disappeared. We just waited in silence. Finally, from somewhere near the back of the building, a voice was heard. Will Banks? There was a long pause before more frantic whispering could be heard. Shit, Will Banks is down. They got a sniper. It had been so long since I'd been in this building that I didn't know the state of the sporting goods section. Hell, for all I knew, any item that could inflict pain has since been removed to appease the easily bruised offense gland snowflakes seemed to have. They probably followed the footsteps of Walmart and removed their evil black rifles. Camouflage might even have been banned from sporting goods on the grounds it incites violence. Regardless, these guys probably had a National guard size armory worth of arms. At least they didn't get it from the armory in Albertville. I heard the story of that band of former military loonies that used it as a base. The guy in charge sounded pretty villainous. The surviving soldiers from that group swore allegiance to Gunnersville after their boss was killed, and they had since cleaned the armory out of all its supplies. I really didn't want to walk into a face full of machine gun bullets. With Devin Landers at my side, however, that seemed impossible. Mike and Eddie might be murdered in grotesque fashions, but I knew at least I would see another day. Maybe I would be cast as the hero in my cousin Moe's stead. The hero doesn't die. He saves the day and gets the girl. I'd still like a designation that sounds cooler. Maybe the badass or the stunner. What was that line from the Sandlot? Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Mike, who had been crouching on the other side of Eddie, managed to sneak around the line of checkout counters. He had silently vanished in the dim interior of the building. I could make out a shadowy figure hugging against a large shelving unit holding tobacco products. Well, it at one time held tobacco. Being occupied by typical marauders, I'm sure anything containing nicotine has been spent. Except possibly the nicorette patches in the pharmacy section. I'll bet any of that gum was gone the first day they got here. After that point, I could no longer see Mike. The man completely disappeared in the distant darkness. It would be the last time I would see him. There was no way for me to know what actually happened during his self-sacrificing action. The heroic final deed of a man I didn't even know the last name of saved the life of his daughter that day. Mike rounded the shelving unit that once held tobacco products, moving into what appeared to be a section containing clothing. He was freer to move. There were racks and tables lined with apparel between him and his enemies that were not only muffling the ambient sound, but blocking line of sight. There were no shouts of alarm nor cries of surprise. The survivor was creeping up on the enemy completely undetected. Tense whispering could be picked up nearby. They might know there was an enemy somewhere, but they wouldn't be able to zero in on him. The marauders weren't even watching for an attack from that direction. How the hell would I know how many there are? They heard us both fire, so for all they know, they could be more than just two of us. 
Mike heard harshly whispered words between two deviants. There were only two of them, that is, in this immediate area at least. Who knew how many more were in the back rooms behind them, or even in the loading bay? They had to be defending something. If they were merely maintaining ownership of the building, one would think their defensive line would have been closer to the front. Or maybe they had no former military training and just hid in the back like most cowards. The former Navy man's wife and daughters must have been what lay behind them. No quarter will be given to any of the bastards. Mike was so close enough now that he thought he could hear their heartbeats. At the moment, Mike could see the man only feet away from him, but the earlier whispered conversation told him there were still only two. God willing, there would be no more surprises. Seeking to rescue his family even if it cost him his own life, Mike was willing to sacrifice more than just these idiots. He held down the spoon on the grenade and pulled the pin. If he wasn't walking away with his loved ones, neither would they. Mike launched himself up to stand behind a squat, pudgy man with long, dirty hair. In the instant it took him to rise, he could see the other kidnapper to his left, pointing a rifle to where they had shot Toby. He put his arm around hostile hillbilly redneck number one's neck before quickly turning to face hostile hillbilly redneck number two with his gun arm extended. Neither of them had time to act. Mike had the opportunity to simply end them before the conflict could even start. Being a civilized, fair person, he at least wanted to give them a chance to redeem themselves. Had he understood the pathetic, twisted minds he was dealing with, Mike would have killed them both right then and there. Tell me where they are! He screamed at the surprised man in his pistol sights. Hostile hillbilly redneck number two turned to Mike and his hostage. Who? The man asked stupidly. Fearing for the lives of his family, Mike responded with incredulity in his voice. My girls, you dumbass! Hostile hillbilly redneck number two rolled his head to the left. I reckon they're still back there. He spat a stream of foul-smelling brown tar-like liquid from his cotton candy purple lips to his side and smiled wickedly. That is, unless Gumby got done with them. Mike was enraged and spoke through gritted teeth. If any of you hurt my family, I'll kill you all. Just then a monster of a man came out of the back room. He stood at least six and a half feet tall, wearing what appeared to be a butcher's apron covered in blood and gore. Gummy obviously hadn't realized they had company. What was that shooting? Is somebody... Shaken for only an instant, Mike turned to his left to face Gumby. With a pistol pointed away from him, hostile hillbilly redneck number two took the chance fate had given him and shot Mike in the side. The bullet tore through his arm above the elbow and dug through his ribs. The arm around hostile hillbilly redneck number one was now only attached by a few stringy tendons and skin. Nerves lost contact with the brain and released the live frag in his hand. In the few milliseconds it took for the high-powered rifle round to tear through Mike's lung and other vitals, the shock forced Mike to squeeze his trigger finger. Gumby would definitely not be walking away from here. Serves the bastards right. The hollow point magnum round sank squarely into Gumby's throat under the chin. Arteries, windpipe, spinal column, any connection between the brain and the rest of the body were irrevocably severed, sending blood gushing outwards while simultaneously drowning Gumby in a lung-filled ocean of blood. The giant's body spasmed a few times before collapsing into a wet heap. Even without his little gift basket, Mike knew he was done for. Three lives for one, not bad. Smiling as he dropped to his side. The sacrifice was more than willing to pay any price for his family. He would give his life a million times over to save any of his girls. The grenade rolled in front of hostile hillbilly redneck number one. Eyes going wide in realization, he shouted to hostile hillbilly redneck number two. Dude, he's got a... The exclamation was abruptly cut off by a superheated fireball. Due to the gunshot Mike had received, he was fortunately very dead before the explosion erupted. It was seen the screenwriter had a penchant for sparing the lives of those he deemed heroic. A few minutes after Mike had disappeared, we heard some indistinguishable shouting between what must have been Mike and the marauders. There were two gunshots, one rifle and one pistol. There were a few more shots than an expanding ball of blinding flame consumed the area from where the gunfire came. 
Instinctively I knew this was a fragmentation grenade explosion. Maybe it was the color, or the fact that the eruption was confined to a tight circle. It was doubtful Mike would only throw a grenade just for the fun of it. At least we had been far enough when the grenade went off that the shrapnel blowback seemed to be tightly confined. I also had a gut feeling the grenade may have been a last-ditch, kamikaze play for the man trying to save his family. It might surely have taken out some of the bad guys, but Mike undoubtedly perished with them. He just made the ultimate sacrifice. I would make sure the price wasn't paid in vain. Looking back over my shoulders at Landers, I noticed he was now standing, propping against the closed sliding doors behind him. I now knew where Mike had gotten the explosive device, and I stared at him incredulously. He shrugged grimly. I had to. The three of us moved up to the slumped and punctured bodies of Toby and Tony. Eddie silently stared at the mangled corpses with no emotion. Kneeling, I turned to face the direction of the explosion. Leaning back like my superstar quarterback cousin Easy, I spiraled a flare to the back of the building. It impacted, rolled, and finally stopped so we could see a clear, charred, still smoking crater. There were no bodies to be seen. There weren't even blood spatters or chips of bone. The area was just a blackened hole of emptiness. It was without question that someone or something had been in this location at one time, now though it was nothing but a void. But as we watched a giant candy display setting on the edge of the void toppled and crashed into the spot, it was a cardboard display for Mike and Ike's. The flimsy sign bent in the middle, leaving only the top half showing within the smoking hole, and now resembled a makeshift grave marker that read Mike in playful block lettering. I gestured to my left. Eddie crept forward from that direction. I took the right, keeping my senses on high alert. We came to the scorched rift at nearly the same moment. I glanced over my shoulder to see my co-pilot standing casually, completely unafraid. What the fuck? Maybe he should have been the one to take point. It would have saved a lot of time. Hell, you'd think I would have learned that by now. Just send the guy that already knows what's going to happen ahead first. It had saved me time and heart palpitations. Devin came walking squarely down the aisle without glancing to either side, basically yelling. You know, you made getting from back there to here look pretty intense. It was well choreographed. I disgustedly laughed. Well, be sure the choreographer is nominated for an Oscar. Wait, the choreographers win Oscars? He cocked his head as if contemplating. Landers opened his mouth to respond when Eddie ran from the swinging doors to the rear of us, gagging and retching. I looked over at the man crying and vomiting and then back to my co-pilot. He shrugged and began moving mechanically. Eddie looked up as we approached. He wheezed and waved his arm. Melanie and Lacey! I looked at him confusedly and then walked around him. After taking a peek in the door he opened and ran away from, I knew exactly why he reacted that way. Anyone who knew these women, or what was left of them, would have reacted just as he did. Shit, I didn't even know them, but the fact that they were remains of human beings nearly made me lose my lunch. I was amazed he could even recognize the destroyed faces of the deceased people in that first small dark room. Maybe it was more of an instinctual and familial know who the corpses used to be. These memoirs would obviously be rated R but I can't even begin to describe what I saw. I especially wasn't going to contemplate what had been done to these unfortunate individuals. The closest thing I can compare it to is when you drop a jar of homemade chunky strawberry jam onto a cement floor. Now multiply that by several pallets of this sticky red icor. Sickened, I closed the door on this horror show and moved to the next closed door. Hopefully the same scene of utter depravity would not lay behind this door. Surely any enemy remaining would have come out to investigate the explosion and gunshots. I stood to the side and cracked open the heavy swinging door, pistol at the ready. No one came out or made a sound, but I could sense there was someone in the room. I spoke in a low voice. Hello? From the blackness, a raspy female voice came back. Like, who's that? There was no doubt the woman heard the explosion and had a million other questions. It made me glad she was being prudent. Benjamin Collins, who are you? Are you okay? I responded. Confident she was alone, I opened the door wider. She cringed at the light entering the room. Amy, 
Amy Rice. Like, where are my mom and sister? In the small dark room that smelled of urine and shit, chained to the far wall with a shackle around her neck, there was a dirty, naked blonde woman. She was trying to cover herself as best she could in the circumstances. As I was introducing myself to the imprisoned woman, the only other survivor, Eddie, made an angry exclamation. My sister! My niece! Having no idea he was related to the bodies he discovered, I stepped closer to Amy. Perhaps so shaken by discovering what he thought to be the last of his clothes family butchered, he walked off into the store alone. Though I didn't witness it myself, Devin later told me Eddie put his pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. There was no skull left to speak of, according to Landers. I guess the man just saw no hope left in this world. If humans could do that to humans, none of them, including himself, was worth saving. I wasn't aware at the time, but that meant we'd only be returning to Gunnersville with one survivor. It seemed like a letdown at first. I tossed my jacket to Amy before freeing her. You ready to get out of here? Six. Mo, journal entry one. Before joining the Viva and Cora crew, I think I remember a discussion on the Tennessee Valley Authority way back from my high school history class. It could be a lapse of memory, but I'm pretty sure I remember that there were only one or two dams on the west end of the Tennessee River before you cross the Mississippi state line. There is no way they could have built so many new dams in just a decade or so. I mean, come on. Have you ever seen the government move that fast pre-Blue Bastard apocalypse? It would take them ten years just to decide how much money they would need to appropriate. Clearly, the screenwriter can cut through the red tape. Seriously, I don't think all of these locks even have fucking names. They must have spontaneously appeared when this screenplay was written. And no, I didn't fucking look for titles. It just makes sense that they are impulsive inventions of the screenwriter's imagination. The Cora stopped at another unnecessary block of concrete in the water. I came onto the deck, already suited up in my Battlestar Galactica Cylon armor, carrying my Klingon Batleth over my shoulder. Why, you ask? I knew my name would be chosen to go out, so this just fucking saved me some time. I don't even know why they keep up the ruse of randomly drawing names. It looks like the lucky winners are Mo and Kumar. Congratulations. The expert was delighted to let me be almost killed again. Duh, I'm already ready. It was so exciting to go out and be touched by tiny blue penises. Is that right? Maybe it's like index. Or indices. Penises. Or even peni. Who knows? At least I was partnered with one of the physically fit badass Special Forces crew members. I still don't see why Akka doesn't just fucking demand Easy Bradley or one of the other super soldiers accompany her on every damn damn mission. You know, especially since she thinks I'm a deviant that watches close family members during intercourse. Come on! I only walked in on them one time back at the prison. By accident. I still regret it. Kind of. Well, it could be worse. I could be partnered with Jane again. I just finished getting the damn blood off the last damn damn mission we did together. I made my way to the gangplank, which was only lowered before entering each dam. Crow reminded us several times because Akka was going. If it was left up to Crow, I could just pull my motherfucking lazy white ass up the rope ladder and drop it every time we came back. Well, it was comforting to know that at least someone expected us to come back. As expected, the Phantom walked downstairs, and his armor magically appeared on him. He returned above deck carrying his tall wire and sporting a clone trooper battle suit accented with blue. Kumar Jindal, like all the Phantoms, carried a traditional Indian blade. I had already seen Sanjay Patel's Katar some kind of badass push dagger similar to Jean's adamantium claws. The talwar was a long, curved sword I would ignorantly confuse with a scimitar. It was nothing like most European swords. It wasn't really intended to stab or even cleave, but simply to slice and slash. Having no real way to dismember, the blade is light and fast. 
It's used traditionally to get inside of heavy armor and reinforced thick shields of the enemy. Peavies wouldn't be carrying their wounded from the battlefield, but there would definitely be a lot of blood for them to slip on. Change of scene a bit. Blood and shit. It wouldn't surprise me if I somehow lost my balance in it as well. Oh, God. That just sent me images of chunky Hormel chili swimming in tomato soup with sorghum molasses running through it. Why do I think these things? It struck me when I learned the hits all carried unique blades, except for Dr. George, the medicine man. I guess he just didn't have time to go home and pick up his unfathomable, awesome, funny-named piece of steel before diarrhea hit the fan. Making our way across the small parking lot to the front door of the dam, I suddenly felt a strange feeling. If you can believe it, I really wasn't worried about my well-being. I knew I would come out today as clean as usual. There was a sense, a feeling somehow different and yet also a sensation I knew I could instinctively trust. Some other main protagonist would experience a close call today. Was the Oracle sending me messages? Maybe I was being contacted by the screenwriter. Only time will tell. What the hell can I do about it anyway? I'm just the hero. Named again by this torturous band of brigands who claim to have only fairness in mind. Even when they keep pulling my name out of the damn damn rating party hat. Things were backward in this particular dam. The control room, or whatever you want to call it, was just a few doors down from the entrance. We moved into the room. The Cora made a successful pass through the lock and we headed toward the door, strangely unmolested. Of course, before we crossed the entry room, a hissing roar came from within the bowels of the complex. The undead would be coming at us from our six o'clock inside the dam. That was usually from behind, right? Why not just make a run for the ship, you ask? Well, I asked the same damn thing. I didn't even get a fucking response. I think Kumar was having too much fun slicing up the damn zombies. Whenever using the Batlith in combat, I feel like Worf. But shit, I'd rather just watch TNG on DVD with Gene, instead of almost being devoured by ravenous monsters. Thank the screenwriter that everything was smoothly paved on our journey of walking backward, and there were no missteps. But as slow as we began moving, there wouldn't be even a slight risk of that. My Mandalorian ally slashed every lunatic that came within reach of his weapon. He slashed open bellies, spilling out stinking guts or undigested raw meat onto the floor. There had to be more blood than I had ever seen flowing out before him. He brought his blade up and across two of the next attackers with horrifying results. The wound on the peavy to the left started above its left kneecap. Slicing up and over, blood began pouring from the open veins and dissected meat and tissue in the right thigh. Standing on useless legs, the animal collapsed as countless others had before it. Jindel's Talwar continued its upward journey right through the erect penis of the next zombie. Ever seen a hamburger bun as it sliced in two? Well, compare this to a hot dog bun. A really thin hot dog bun. Puree a red velvet cake and inject that into the piece of bread until it's close to bursting. Now when you break that tiny blue misshapen tubular bread in half, you have a pretty good idea of what I just witnessed. No men in black memory eraser device could ever get that image out of my head. The pavy didn't start screaming and fall over, putting its hands over the wound. It just fucking stood there in shock, unable to even make a noise. I'm sure it had a look of disgusted terror and pain on its face. I just couldn't tear my fucking eyes away from the most horrific sight imaginable. Not really knowing what to expect, I watched as the blue banana split open while still attached at the base. The lower half bounced against the shrunken testicles, while the top part of the member did a pirouette and sank into the matted pubic hair above it. There's got to be something wrong with me, because I spent the time describing that to you. At least you have a clear mental image and can experience sleepless nights along with me. Standing to the right of the phantom, I did the most merciful thing I could do. The revenant looked from him to me, pleading with its eyes for one of us to end the torment. I brought one end of the batlith around and jammed it straight into one of the thing's yellow eyes. Diarrhea violently shot from its blue asshole, 
sprang onto the creature directly behind it. The body went momentarily stiff before collapsing. Thankfully, it fell forward, covering the blooming tulip of an eviscerated penis. Thank the screenwriter, I would no longer be forced to stare at John Wayne Gacy's wet dream. I was surprised in the fact I held on to my bat lift and didn't just cut both hands over my crotch in knowing sympathy. Have no fear. There would be plenty more penis to view in the next few minutes. Aka graciously opened the front door so we could continue our slower than a snail's pace backward trot into the sunlight. I should have thrown a grenade up and over the heads of the undead as far back as I could toss it. Knowing my luck, one of them would put their damn hand up and it would bounce back and blow up at my fucking feet. Why is it whenever I'm confronted with untold numbers of cannibalistic nudists, they just so happen to be completely fine with a damn sun? They didn't even squint when stepping out into the blazing Alabama ultraviolet. Not only was I suffering from heat stroke, but I was also getting a damn sunburn while inside my armor. The peavies were soaking up enough sun I could get cancer just from being around them. You never believed these things were ever nocturnal. It amazes me we didn't just use our fucking firearms from the beginning. It wasn't like they didn't know we were here and we needed to be stealthy. That probably wouldn't be near as enjoyable for the audience, though. Would 300 have been the box office success it was if the Spartans had just used chain-fed miniguns rather than mince enemies up like they were fucking Emerald Lagasse on the Food Network? I guess that's why Kumar had the Talwar, rather than something that would kill instantly. Blood and screams equal a bigger opening night. Because I was being attacked constantly by naked monsters from the front, I didn't get the chance to look behind me and see the fucking gangplank wasn't lowered as we walked out the door. The rules demand if a PV is sighted, all access from the ground to the deck must immediately be disconnected. It goes without saying Crow made this rule. If there's even a question, it was definitely a relinquishment on her part to ever have the damn gangplank dropped. So when I do turn around and see that the gangplank is up, I see Hammer is on the dock, unarmored and now stranded. Don't ask me why someone like the delusional pawn shop owner would be caught out in the world unprotected when Ruskies and Tangos could infiltrate the lines and pull a grassy knoll at any time. I almost forgot what she looked like when not encased in metal. She took cover behind a parked car and readied her pistol for when we got out of the way. At least she was kind enough to give us a chance to move before she started throwing lead in our direction. After entirely too long, the rest of the Cora crew started launching rounds at the zombies coming out of the damn, damn door. You know, they were just being cautious when we were nearly half a mile away from where they'd be shooting. I glimpsed something the size of a Coke can fly over our heads. Upon the explosion, I realized my bodybuilding brother spiraled a grenade towards the door. A white phosphorus bomb exploded just over the heads of what had to be a thousand lunatics. Incinerating fire rained down, causing a few to look up. The stupid animals, unfortunate enough to be curious and gaze skyward, received splashes of liquid magma on their faces. Flecks of pain peppered blue cheeks, yellow eyes, gore-matted foreheads, and even burned through teeth and skulls like cotton candy in a raccoon's water dish. Peavies began to claw at their faces, tearing blue skin down to the bone, attempting to stop the fire from eating at them. Eyeballs popped and exploded like yolks on a fried egg, sunny side up. Tiny balls of fire burned through the front teeth in an instant and were already traveling to the back of the throat before the monsters could look down. They could do nothing but scream and shake their heads as the phosphorus sun-like explosion ate cerebral cortexes. It was sickening to watch naked former humans die, screaming in terror. However belated, the assistance of the others on the boat quickly shaved the enemy horror down to a manageable number. The number of mobile zombies standing before us became only a few dozen in minutes. This just shows what having more than two bodyguards at a time could accomplish. Better yet, why don't they just leave me on the damn boat? Then Akka would only need one bodyguard. Two lunatics came charging from the mass of dying and dead. Gripping my batleth in both hands, I pushed the blade straight out in front of me in a 180-degree line. It caught both PVs coming at me simultaneously. 
the inner points jammed into the monster's sides, sliding between their ribs and puncturing lungs. Both animals gasped for breath as I tried to wrench my alien blade from within them. No matter how much I jerked and twisted, the damn thing wouldn't budge. The peavies were trying to assist me, pushing themselves free. Even our combined efforts still were for naught. The blue-accented clone trooper brought his steel up and over, slashing across the monster on my right. His talwar gashed into the blue throat before him, exposing esophagus, trachea, arteries, and whatever the hell else is within the throat. Blood began pumping from the wound, and all the creature could do was desperately try to free itself from my Klingon sword. It thrashed and attempted to scream without any air. I had no idea what would kill it first, the lack of oxygen or rocketing blood loss. Maybe the combination of the mortal injuries and the insane panic combined to make the animal stop thinking or something. It started going slack and lost its footing. The dead weight on one end of the bat lift caused it to tip and pushed upwards on the other's one's rib. There was nothing I could do as one PV fell to the ground. The blade pushed against bone until I heard a snapping, and then a light pop as the rib broke. My bat lift was free on that end. Looking down for a second, I saw jagged and loose rib bones, now snapped open and leaking chunky barrel to the ground. I looked in shock at the zombie. Shit, man, I'm sorry. Even though it was just a revenant, that had to hurt. I didn't even mean to do it. Though in extreme pain, the injured reanimate realized it was free at the same time I did. It reached its arms out like a classical zombie and was about to come at me. Just then, the end of the blade that was dragged down by the opposing dying animal suddenly popped loose. I brought it up, and the outer point caught the beast directly in the temple. Recurved steel punctured gray matter and sent the PV into infinity, but not before it made a final squirt of black diarrhea. The screenwriter just gives us no breaks. Well, actually, I guess I do get the occasional reprieve, you know, since I now had my sword. But in the feces department... Yeah, we have to deal with lots of shit. Maybe I'll start a toxic waste cleaning business after this. Our slogan can be, We're number one in number two. Those peavies left living couldn't even get up. I spoke over the ragged moans of the dying ex-humans and turned to the expert, crouching behind a car. You can come out now, Hammer. Oh, and thanks for the help. I'm not wearing armor. Excuse me? She was sure to over-enunciate that last part. Why the hell were you down here without armor anyway? Rose's hair bow. The question mark on my face let her know that wasn't explanation enough. She sighed and continued. A gust of wind came off the water and blew her hair bow down here. Shaking a pink hunting camouflage hair bow at me, she continued. It would just be for a second. Besides, I didn't expect y'all out so soon. She continued to shake the pink hunter camel hair bow as proof. I only have one question. Crow wears fucking hair bows? Actually, I have more questions. They just didn't come to me until now. Why the hell did she lower the gangplank just for something like that? You know Crow would make my lazy white ass use the damn rope ladder for something so trivial. Why would the paranoid survivalist, that is the expert, without a thought concerning the enemy come on land without armor? Maybe love makes everybody do stupid things. Sarah's still with me. That should tell you how moronic the feeling of love is. Still a good distance from the Kora, I started walking in that direction. The African princess and the Indian special forces ninja were going through the vast swaths of injured undead, introducing them to true death. Aka stabbed the end of her black halberd into soft points of the infected craniums. Jindal moved through the dying infected, slicing throats and spilling precious lifeblood onto the pavement. Suddenly Kumar screamed. Hammer and I, shoulder to shoulder in stride, turned. A completely uninjured zombie was charging in our direction. Did it just pretend to be dead until no one was looking? The expert stepped in front of me, leveled her pistol and squeezed the trigger. It clicked. Jam! No shit! We backed up toward the Cora. I suppose I could have handed my bat lift to her and let her finish the job. She could have gotten behind me. But really, what would I have done? It would have just knocked me over to get to her. Why the hell didn't I just use one of my guns? 
The two of us continued moving backward. The expert nearly stood with her back against my chest. The animal coming at us was not much further from her front as she was from mine. It was about to bite her and nothing could be done. In the blink of an eye, some kind of shaft drove itself into the beast just behind the left collarbone. It continued driving down into the meat of the creature's abdomen until the animal collapsed. After a second, I realized what the shaft was. An arrow. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Looking back over my shoulder, I could only gape. There stood Crow, on the deck of the boat, holding my bow as if she had just fired it. Her stance immediately explained that she knew how to use it. Yes, that bow. Remember the one I carried at the beginning of my first journal? It had stayed leaning against the wall in my room since I had gotten back that first day with the expert, the old friend, and the tech as newly acquired crew members. Momentarily, I was offended that Sarah let her into my room to get the damn thing. Then it dawned on me. With the two of us backing up so fast, she had to be aiming where I was just standing when she launched the arrow. That means if I had paused for just a moment, it would have hit me. What the fuck? Since when can you do that? I think you should start being a candidate for Akka's bodyguards. I yelled up at her. Listen, white boy, I was just doing it for pet. Your motherfucking ass can get bit for all I care. I bowed theatrically to her. Well, thanks. I love you, too. Her reaction was to scoff and walk off while mumbling something about motherfucking white people. I spoke low to the expert. Did you know she could do that? She shrugged and shook her head. By this time, Storm and the clone trooper hit were approaching. I waved. Good to see y'all. Thanks for showing up. My sister-in-law looked like she was about to respond. Before she opened her mouth, she must have realized she was about to speak to a pervert not worthy of hearing her voice. I looked over to Kumar, who only shrugged. The screenwriter made sure everything worked out, so I suppose there wasn't really anything to say. I turned around again to face the Viva and Cora. Oh, well, let's go home. Seven. Wait and see. The target was not on the ground. Even though there was a pathway extending down from the floating construct, the female wasn't going to try it. There was thoughtless, and then there was just plain stupid. It wasn't either. Pale ones in their armored shells came out of a cave, slowly making their way to the construct. A multitude of fellow blue ones came bounding out the cave, obviously attacking the shelled creatures. Though they outnumbered the pale ones greatly, they were still being held back. The prey was fighting the blue tide and defeating the predator. One of the pale ones was not inside and protected by one of the armored shells they covered themselves in. It was not on the floating construct and stood alone on the ground. The PV formerly known as Warden Slice contemplated the possibilities. It was immediately decided attacking this pale one would be a waste. It didn't appear to have any type of defense but being so close to the floating construct it would only have to call out for assistance. Even if an attack was successfully completed, what came after would most likely not be pleasant. Hunger was insatiable, but it could be sated once Ezekiel Collins was within reach. Suddenly objects started flying from the construct and landing in the midst of the blue ones. Fire from those boomsticks also came in rapid succession. Violent explosions bloomed and destroyed the attackers. Screaming of fellows and gory scenes of death were everywhere. It is a good thing that the PV Slice decided to wait and see. The target would soon be vanquished. All your bones belong to us. Eight. The Queen. Hirotaro Sako survived the end of the world. Being prepared for disaster is what kept the former Marine and his family alive. To be honest, they weren't expecting the end to come as blue naked cannibals. The death toll of modern society sounded quickly, with nothing more than a sigh of relief and the proverbial whimper of acceptance. Some would have called his preparations crazy prepper paranoia. Those people were now yellow-eyed monsters shitting in the woods. 
His just-in-case preparations had kept his family comfortable as much as you can be while surviving solely on freeze-dried food and bottled water. Over a month of laying low had driven the inked-up staff sergeant nearly stir-crazy. After a quick recon of the area, he discovered no boarded-up windows. He had found only a smattering of evidence of a few gun battles, but very few holdouts. Certainly no holdouts that appeared to be friendly. It was as if no one had prepared, but simultaneously was overtaken before they realized they were under attack. Willful ignorance, sheer refusal to admit something was coming. It seems to have been a complete denial that disaster could strike. They had been dependent on luxuries believing them to be their salvation, when in fact it was their downfall. They were kept preoccupied and distracted so that there was never any time to prepare. It had made him angry before the shit hit the fan. He and his family had prepared and they had survived. The people that didn't prepare, well, most had succumbed to the apocalypse. Reaching out only a little further led to the discovery of an organized encampment of survivors. People that wanted to live and actually help others survive this new torturous existence. Hirotaro felt lucky to have found a group that had their act together. Comrades of the same mindset. Birds of a feather. When meeting with the leader of this enclave, Sako offered his services as a former detective and marine to the island. After being given a house for his family, he knew the only honorable thing would be to give his skills freely. These people would not only offer community and a sense of camaraderie, but the closest thing to normalcy he could hope for his family. This Mayor Collins seemed like a pretty down-to-earth guy. He smiled as their initial meeting drew to a close. Mayor Collins thumbed over his shoulder. Well, if you're helping us out, you'll need a uniform. I've got something that should work. Hirotaro nearly gasped when the mayor opened a small closet. A brown trench coat, matching fedora, gloves, and a folded white mask hung on the rack. Rorschach! Some might not recognize the underdog protagonist from The Watchmen, but Sako found the patriotic hero iconic. The mayor grinned. Fitting for a detective. Things were pretty easy for the Gunnersville Police Department. No violent crime. No massive PV assaults and no runaways meant protecting and serving were not difficult demands, asked of the newly relocated detective. That is, for the first few days, Staff Sergeant Sacco was on the job. It wasn't long, however, before the children began to disappear. It seemed his initial thoughts about this job of a do-nothing cop became something more when a girl was reported missing. She hadn't seemed unhappy and her parents had no clue as to why she might have run away. Sako was tasked with questioning the parents of Tommy Leah Jones first. He took a knee, examining the four-sided sandbox in the front yard of the Jones home. Toys and evidence of their recent use as well as the sandbox were immediately apparent. There were now countless sets of footprints all around the sandbox and backyard. With all of the people looking for the girl, these would be of no use. The detective glanced up at the house next door. It looked occupied, but there was no sign of children living there. She wouldn't have been running off with the neighbor kids. The girl's mother was a nervous wreck. I don't know why she would have just took off. Maybe her and her friends wanted to go back and explore more at the Baptist campground. The missing girl had tagged along with her parents and a group of church members that saw fit to search the area for anything initially left by the first scavenger teams. She continued speaking on any information she might have about her daughter's disappearance. The more she talked about their scavenging trip yesterday with Brother Brown, the more she was convinced that had to be where the girl was. I'm positive. There's nowhere else she could be. She's always liked exploring. I can't explain it, Detective. This time is something different. I just know she is in trouble. The staff sergeant instantly agreed. Though unsure of the girl's whereabouts, he knew a mother's instincts were usually right. But even when they weren't, you'd say that they were or you'd get a tongue lashing. The campgrounds were north of Buck Island. If the girl and her co-escapees went there, the guards on the causeway had to have seen them. The watchman obviously wouldn't have allowed unprotected children to leave the island completely alone. Wouldn't they have reported the sighting? Sako set up teams to search the area around the missing girl's house, and then he and the phantoms headed north toward the campground. The Enclave soldier leaned against the aluminum railing at the edge of the road. No, nope, nobody's been by here. 
Maybe they had a submarine. The medieval knight chuckled from the guard shack. Sako sighed. All right, I guess I'll keep looking. Walking away, he turned back and made an addition. Oh, and keep up the good work. It never hurt to boost morale. Outfitted as a clone trooper accented in black, Mahatma Doshi sat behind the steering wheel of the Humvee. His weapon of choice, the Booj, a recurved blade on a thick haft of solid steel, was clipped to his waist and rested against his armored thigh. Bumping down the dead-end road that led to the Marshall County Baptist campground, he could feel the breeze coming off the water beyond the trees along the right-hand side of the road. Having relaxed for days, the Phantom was ready for action. Had it been a week since the battle with the villain? The surviving U.S. Army soldiers surrendered and swore allegiance to Guntersville, supplying much welcomed firepower. The survivors in the safe haven were happy to see uniformed soldiers keeping them safe. The island was protected from all invaders. Paradise could not be lost under such protection. Two of the phantoms, Kumar Jindal and Sanjay Patel, accompanied Dr. Philip George and the rest of the main protagonists on their quest to locate the alleged cure for the zombie plague. Mahatma Doshi and Rajesh Matu were the remaining phantoms in Gunnersville, left to protect and serve the people. After the defeat of the insane former U.S. Army officer and his company, the most strenuous task of the remaining hits had been routine patrols down the streets of a paradise. When a child was reported missing, the NSG hits nearly jumped at the opportunity to be involved in a serious investigation. They were teamed with the Japanese-born former Marine Hirotaro Sako. Professionals, the three were sure to find clues of what happened to the little girl. Rajesh Matu stood ready behind the mounted 50 cal. His Trishla, a traditional Asian Indian melee weapon similar in appearance to a trident, was obligatorily strapped over his shoulder. A significant difference, though, between a trident and Rajesh's family heirloom was the three barbs were also double-sided blades, as opposed to simple barbed hooks or sharpened points. Death would be served at least three times over per strike landed by this beast of a weapon. With dark trees lining both sides of the road, attack could come at any moment. Matu, the clone trooper accented with green, was scanning the dark tree line, prepared for any would-be charging lunatics. Finally, they arrived at the entrance of the campgrounds with the gates standing wide open. The Marshall Baptist Campground was only a few miles north of Gunnersville Island, on the eastern side of U.S. Highway 431. It was at the end of a small peninsula and held cabins that could house several campers. Looking around, Hirotaro thought, This camp would be a prime location for resettlement. That is, as soon as PV migration permitted. Sako pointed, and Mahatma turned the wheel to the right. That's where the search would start. The dock in the large gymnasium probably wouldn't hold nests and won't take as much time. The search had to begin somewhere. Eventually, the cabins would need further investigation. There might be clues, peavies to kill, or even full-blown hives in those buildings. As expected, most of the larger buildings were empty of anything other than a coating of peavy manure. Even the campground director's house was empty of anything living or unliving. Hugging every corner and rolling through every door proved to be nothing but an exercise in futility and shit. The buildings surrounding the in-ground pool were obviously empty. The other buildings were built to hold groups of people for summer camps and retreats. These smaller one-story cabins were made to last. These were the perfect location for a hive. They had to contain some excitement in action. The audience demanded blood. There were footprints on the sidewalk leading to and from the front door, and even some leading around the building to other entryways. Some of the prints were bare, proving what Sako expected, but some of the footprints were human, obviously, shot in boots or sneakers. Various sizes indicating individuals of all ages had been through here recently. Though the shoe prints led to the door as if a scavenger attempted to scout the building by sticking their head in the doorway and perhaps calling out, it didn't seem as though humans had actually entered this building, at least not willingly. There was aged, crusted, and still reeking shit splattered around the entrance to the building. In his mind's eye, the staff sergeant could picture a PV walking to the door, opening it, and entering its lair, exposing a gut-wrenching odor trapped inside the sealed door along with the cloying darkness. Was it grasping something? Perhaps a meal? A small, still-living human? A little girl? 
Rorschach retrieved the black and white hood from within his coat and slid it over his head. This potential crime scene needed to be investigated. Holding his pistol with his free hand, he gently twisted the unlocked knob enough to unlatch the door. As he pulled his katana, ivory from its scabbard, he could feel the adrenaline pumping. The phantom stood behind him with submachine guns at the ready. Rorschach put a foot against the door and thumbed the light on the pistol. He kicked open the door so forcefully it bent the hinges back. Rolling into the room, he shined the light on every bed. From an aerial view, this circular room had bunk beds lining the wall and the double-layered stack of mattresses in the center. Doing a quick search around the entire room, Sako found nothing but piles of feces swarming with flies, but no peeves. There was a sense of longing for combat in the detective's voice. Clear. The hits also quickly completing their search of the adjacent bathroom came out and stood at attention. Nothing, sir. One of them reported. Feeling defeated, Sako's shoulders slumped. One more cabin to search. Preparing for action only to be faced with nothing was a huge letdown. There was always a chance for a brawl through the next door around the next corner. Holding out hope, Hirotaro shook off his negative demons and moved to the next building down the sidewalk. Pounds of caked-up dry diarrhea surrounded this door. Fresh, oozing, tar-like shit coated what looked to be over a month's worth of zombie sewage. Eureka! The three detectives were confident they hit the jackpot. Today wasn't going to be boring after all. Hirotaro stepped to the door and prepared just as he had done at the previous cabin. They could hear something that sounded like a frightened inhalation when he grabbed the door. When Rorschach pushed in, the heavy metal door only moved a few inches. Something was wedging it almost closed. What the fuck? The walls on the inside appeared like the rest, blackened with feces, even covering the window. Beyond the door, they could hear hissing and frantic squealing. The host of the party just realized guests had arrived. The hits backed away with submachine guns pointed to either corner of the building. As almost an afterthought, both of them turned and shot out the visible windows along the top of the building. Now, though, the revenants would be able to enjoy the new skylights, if anything lived long enough. While sunlight never burned them like classical vampires, UV rays at one time irritated Peavy's eyes. They had become tolerant of daylight a month from May Day. While the Blunatics may now be tolerant of the bright sunlight, they still weren't fans of it. Zombies, it would seem, preferred to be lethargic when exposed to sunlight, seeking cloudy days and shaded areas to do most things outside now. A piercing cry sounded through the windows as a multitude of peavies tried to cover their eyes and all hide from the evil, bright ball of fire in the sky. Every undead available for this battle, even the ones still hunkering in the enclosure, just got a taste of soul. The monsters that were willing to come out to play and face the bright daylight met with the phantom's automatic bursts of lead projectiles, rocketing to them at several hundred feet per second. Rorschach, now having given natural light to the nest, aimed his pistol through the partially open door. Multiple peavies were choked up in the only exit towards their prey, stark stricken scared of the supernova sunlight. Many of those still active were mowed down by small caliber rounds until they ceased twitching. A jittery peavy, running in a circle, caught a bullet in the side of the head above the left ear. Immediately after the skull was punctured, everything above the chin exploded. Brains and bone shards rocketed to the ceiling in the surrounding area. Taking one more step, the headless body collapsed into a bleeding pile. The next kill was a lucky strike for the protagonist, but quite unlucky for the unfortunate revenant. A tooth or other type of bone fragment shot from the erupting cranium and struck a nearby fellow PV directly in its yellow eye. The mouth opened to deliver a scream but would never release anything more than a final gasp of air. Fingers tensed, and a limp penis shriveled within itself as the blue nudist collapsed. Hirotaro would never know that somehow a molar, canine, or some other piece of the skull dropped this creature. Another PV sitting cross-legged on one of the top bunks took a bullet in the side. The abdominal wall wound would have been easily survivable, but before digging into the gut, it nicked the radial artery in the wrist. Crimson gushed as the animal flailed. In fright, it toppled off the bed. Weakness from blood loss would overtake it before it could do much more than kick and scream on the floor. 
While Staff Sergeant Sacco was busy with his friends in the cabin, the Phantom simultaneously met their first customers. Well, actually, their first customers met their high-velocity lead. Both clone troopers dispatched their initial targets with cold efficiency. A three-round burst punctured Mahatma's first mark above the sternum, otherwise known as the solar plexus. A small triangle was created by three dark holes. Life was shattered as the bullets ripped through arteries, the windpipe, and the esophagus. Any connection between the brain and the rest of the body were irrevocably severed. Vertebra exploded as the piercing bullets popped out the back above the shoulder blades. Lifeless, the reanimated corpse collapsed in a wet heap. The green-accented clone trooper on the other side of the sidewalk created even more of a disgusting mess. The zombie rounding the corner encountered a volley of stinging hot metal just below the belt. Typically, low shots were not killing blows. Unlucky for this revenant, the screenwriter is a twisted individual indeed. The initial round impacted the monster just above the left testicle and beside the flaccid penis. It exited somewhere out the right butt cheek, spewing blood and rancid shit behind it. Chunky motor oil with a hint of crimson covered the ground behind the demon. The second round actually impacted the testicle itself as it exploded out of the rear of the now shriveled and useless sack. Fluid ran from the now gaping wound gushing down the leg. The scene looked like a macabre attempt at creating a waterfall of blood. This cursed creature would never again experience pleasure even if it wasn't for the next hit. At the same instant, the final and what would ultimately be the deadliest round punctured the infected just inside the thigh. The femoral artery ruptured. Blood began pumping from the soon-to-be-deceased undead. If one thing could be said about the NSG commandos, it was that they didn't fuck around. Neither will that poor blue bastard. Suddenly dozens, possibly a hundred, screaming lunatics charged around either side of the building. Empty shell casings and spent magazines littered the ground at the hero's feet. No matter how many shit-covered bodies dropped to the blood-soaked ground, they were somehow gaining headway on the stoic adventurers. Melee combat would soon need to be initiated, and Staff Sergeant Sako would happily join in the festivities. Doshi lifted his booge and slammed it into the side of the neck of the first comer. The blade of the axe knife practically cleaved the head from the zombie's body. Arterial blood pumped from the wound. Briefly, the still-functioning brain made the mouth scream silently. Frantic yellow eyes went blank and diarrhea shot from its ass. Jerking, the body collapsed into a dying jumble. Rahesh Matu had a pair of PVs charging him. He reached out with his Trishla and put all three blades into the stomach of the one on the right. Twisting the bladed staff and pulling it, every part of the gastrointestinal tract spilled onto the ground a mass of steaming colors. Before he could draw his weapon back and attack the other monster that was now almost upon him, Rorschach came to the rescue. Ivory, the elephant bone-handled katana, which was a trademark of the former marine, sliced cleanly through its target. Steel impacted at the base of the neck and exited the body a few inches below the armpit. The surrounding infected eyes grew wide in realization when most of the body continued sprinting forward while the head and left arm didn't. The body now severed finally ended its trajectory as the fluid rocketed out from the now defunct inhuman beast. Appreciate the assist, sir. The hit called. The blotted mask turned to Rajesh. The void breathed hard on its heart, turning its illusions blue, shattering them. Violent fighting continued until it became nearly monotonous. The detective's routine became slicing an enemy on one side of the catwalk before throwing himself onto another foe on the opposite side. Still twitching body parts and oozing organs covered the ground around them. Soon the area would be ankle-deep in blood. Any insects and animals remaining in the vicinity would eat to their hearts content tonight. Working his way around the rear of the cabin, Hirotoro brutally dispatched the last few stragglers. He rounded the corner just in time to see the phantoms detonate their shaped C4 charge on the door. After a quick look inside, it was easy to determine the reason for the earlier jam at the front door. What looked like oil-soaked mounds of cotton seemed to be standing at least knee-deep throughout most of the room. The infected's lives Rorschach had taken before the front door was fully opened littered the floor of the cabin. Nothing moved in the dim, musky interior of the damp room. Stalactites of feces were scattered around the enclosure. 
For some reason, Hirotoro thought of the movie Alien. This made the hero smile uneasily. Moving to the bathroom door, he swore he could make out slow, heavy breathing. Chills ran up his arms, even under the sleeves of his trench coat. Something else was here. Sako and the green trooper hugged either side of the doorframe, prepared for mortal combat. Ivory's blade pushed open the door. Absolutely nothing could be made out in the pitch darkness. Mahatma broke a glow stick and tossed it through the entry. Now what could only be described as unbelievable horrors were literally brought to light. The sadistic evil of the demonic peavies was breathtaking. Each stall had a chain or a rope tied around the tank of the toilet. Thankfully, every stall appeared to be empty of anything living or unliving. Amazingly, while most of the other surfaces in the bathroom were dripping in feces, the bowl of every toilet was impeccably clean. It wasn't a simple lack of intelligence to not use a waste receptacle, Hirotaro thought, but sheer spite and refusal. Bones of every shape and size were piled in the corner by the wall urinals. While no living animals inhabited this room, the silent screams of the human skulls made clear the horrors of this slaughterhouse. Broken and sheared bones told the disgusting story of many a poor soul. Limbs had been hammered until they could be ripped away from the victim. Mud or some other type of insanely crude clotting agent must have been used to stem the flow of blood from the still-beating heart. The infected could then chow down on an arm or a leg without having to worry about infecting their cattle and tainting the meat. Every member of the pack could enjoy the taste of human by doing this. Why had it only recently become routine to harvest humans piece by piece? The Hive Males would grow sexually aroused when in such close proximity to food and the queen. Higher in status, the ruling female chose its mate. It didn't matter that there was already a blue bun in the oven. There was no remembrance of when the fetus had been conceived, only that there was, in fact, a fetus. Males and all non-reproducing females would go out to hunt and quite often returned with sustenance. Not every group resembled this one. In most packs, there were a multitude of pregnant females. As uncommon as it was, this assembly had formed around a single female that had maintained dominance through brute strength and force of will. One male attempted to take control but had been killed in a fight to the death with the queen. Food less now than before. Pale ones hard to find near here. Many pale ones living on the large ground surrounded by water. Use the water as protection. Very smart, these pale ones. Some pale ones travel into our lands, swept up and changed as we were. When we capture one without changing, we keep it alive for many light and dark cycles, chopping meat bags apart with sharp things while we savor every drop of delicious blood and bone. We must make it last until another pale one is captured. Flanked by the hits, Rorschach trudged through the large bathroom. No movement could be seen, but there was a thick, dark sludge under their feet, caked on the walls and hanging from the ceiling. It seemed to pulsate, as if it were a living, breathing organism. PV poop was so prevalent, so overpowering, it had almost taken on its own character role. To their left, in the far corner of the room, stood a walk-in shower. As they moved closer, a scuttling and shuffling came from somewhere within. The glow stick that was thrown had stuck in the thick feces-covered wall, casting an eerie green glow into the shower. At least eight by eight, the shower took up at least a quarter of the bathroom. Pivoting to get an angle on the door, the investigators were secretly delighted to discover more living infected inside. A female peavy, clearly pregnant, sat on an outcropping in the darkened cavern. Well-fed, this creature appeared dominant over the subservient creatures in the room. Facing the heroes with its arms rigid in a tight crouch, it let out a keening hiss. Turning, two slavish males saw that they wouldn't have to go outside to get a bite. Food had come to them. The phantoms came around either side of Rorschach, blocking the exit from the filthy carved-out wall. All three protagonists' razor-sharp steel reflected the soft green glow from the broken light stick behind them. The cannibal nudist ready themselves for combat. Only one side would be walking away from here. The peavies came at each of the clone troopers in pairs. A small monster that looked to have once been an overweight, middle-aged man 
and its limping companion rushed at Mahatma. These were certainly not the first raging blue heart on scene today, but one way or the other the erections wouldn't remain for long. The entire left side of the limping PV appeared to be paralyzed, utterly without strength. A stroke victim? Could this have happened recently? The heroes hadn't really paid enough attention to any of the lunatics before now to notice. It wasn't surprising to see that physical handicaps carried over after infection. The stormtrooper, accented with black, twisted the ornate elephant head from the end of his axe knife and threw his arm back. He swiped across the belly of the fat ex-human. The recurved tip of the blade started just below the right ribs and cleanly split the animal to the opposite side. Intestines, spleen, pancreas, colon, and everything vital in the digestive process spilled onto the floor. Black diarrhea rolled out of the eviscerated organs and mixed with blood pooling on the floor. The scourge then brought its hands up to the empty pit of its stomach as Doshi completed his swing. Bringing the stiletto blade on the end of the haft back around, he stabbed it into the side of the disemboweled Peavy's neck. The phantom pulled forward and the blade sliced violently outwards. Arterial blood, stomach bile still lodged in the esophagus, and mucus began pouring from the gaping throat. Mahatma kicked the animal in the chest, launching it onto its back and finally unstringing it from its intestines. He stepped forward over the bloody pile of guts to meet the slower but persistent animal still coming at him. While Mahatma battled his opponents, his doppelganger, Rajesh Matu, faced off against attackers himself. It was somewhat surprising to be assaulted by two females, however. One was extraordinarily tall and full-chested, while the other appeared to be too young to bear offspring. Why would Peavies use future caregivers as hunter-gatherers or protectors? Maybe those currently bearing children were more important to them. The exceptionally tall monster dove towards Rajesh at chest level. Triple blades of the Trishla slammed evenly into the upper torso of the now-diving female. Momentum drove the steel deeper into the body until it met the only thing in flesh and blood reanimated corpse that would stop the razor-sharp slice. Sternum and ribs cracked either from the pure sharpness of the honed blade or stress fractures from the pressure. Matu nearly grinned when the breasts burst like water balloons. Implants. It was strange to see a rail-thin zombie with giant breasts. Bloodied silicone oozed around the swords, halted only by bone. Though painful, the wound would have been survivable. Survivable, that is, if that were as far as it went. Rajesh continued the incision as the PV collapsed, pulling the staff to him. All three blades pushed into the body, forcing their way down as the gashes became more profound, until they had finally snagged on the collarbones. The head of the zombie faced the phantom while the feet lay on the floor. The face snarled in raw hatred as Rajesh drew back for a killing blow. There was no need to make the suffering of this creature last longer than necessary. The green-tinged clone trooper didn't realize the smaller revenant was simultaneously diving at his legs. When it collided with his shins, he tipped forward onto the adult beast impaled on his trishla. Bones crushed and soft body parts squished under his weight. The yellow-eyed cannibal attempted to choke out a bloody scream through its ragged throat. It succeeded in nothing but a raspy click and soft gurgling howl before life was snuffed out by the weight of the armored hero. Rolling onto his back, Rajesh didn't even look down at the disgusting mass on his chest plate. When he tried to sit up, the tiny, agile scourge launched itself onto him. Currently holding no weapon, the hit would be forced to employ Kalera Piatu, an Indian form of martial arts, hand-to-hand -hand self-defense skills, much like the Israeli Mossad using Krav Maga. Fighting with a monster ravenously craving human flesh was going to be a workout, even with such a minuscule opponent. As frail as these creatures could look, they always packed a punch. Matu was surprised by the ferocious strength of such a small creature. It threw his arms back, extremely brawny for what appeared to have been a malnourished child in the world before May Day. The beast was rolling him onto his front. Today wasn't looking to be his day. Mahatma Doshi brought his booge in from his left at 90 degrees to slice into the remaining peavy, still limping towards him. The axe knife slammed into the left bicep shattering bone and cleaving most of the arm entirely from the body. Blood gushed from the stump as the useless appendage now traveled to the ground. His blade continued driving between ribs, rupturing the cardiac muscle. 
The crippled reanimate expelled its last black cloud of meager rations out of its backside and then collapsed into a lifeless heap. Turning, the phantom saw his Indian brother-in-arms on the floor, under a tiny naked ape, which seemed to have unbelievable strength. The ravenous former human was turning Rajesh over in an attempt to get into his armor from his back. Mahatma rushed to come to his fellow's aid. The movement could be heard painfully close as the animal grunted, followed by a wet sucking sound that greeted Rajesh's ears. The blue foot on his shoulder started going limp, along with the fingers clawing at his back. The sucking sound was heard again as the reanimated corpse collapsed. He turned to see white armor, nearly identical to his own, taking a knee beside him. Thanks, Foxtrot Nina Mike. I thought I was a goner. Doshi looked down at his comrade. You could hear the smile in his voice. You would do it for me, Foxtrot Nina Romeo. As the clone troopers took part in their separate conflicts, Staff Sergeant Sacco faced off with the Queen. Ivory zinged through the air in fast, precise swings. Like taking candy from a baby, Hirotaro thought. Completely bare skin versus sharpened steel. One of Sako's favorite quotes from the character he now depicted hit him. All the whores and politicians will look up and scream at me to save them. And I'll look down and whisper, no. The katana sliced through empty air and drove into a ridiculous amount of shit. How did I miss the damn thing? The queen moved faster than Rorschach anticipated. It was now crouching to his right. As he attempted to recover into a somewhat defensive stance, something unexpected happened as his blade came up and over. The PV launched itself up into the air and brought its feet forward together, drop-kicking the protagonist. As his fedora flew from his masked head, Sako fell hard on his back. He was trying to catch his breath again when the impregnated monster landed squarely on top of him. Immediately, the beast began grappling at the sleeve of his right arm, trying to gain purchase on bare skin. The sturdy material of the trench coat he wore acted as a barrier for now. With his free hand, the hooded detective reached to his side inside the coat. Sako unsheathed Ebony, Ivory's little sister, which was half the length of a regular katana. The perfectly honed and razor-sharp tip of the wakazashi blade whipped up, melding into the flesh of the queen. At the apex of its swing, Ebony cleanly separated the elbow and tricep from the right arm. The reanimated corpse stopped what it was doing and its eyes grew wide, its head slowly turned to take in the gushing wound. As if understanding the pain, the queen, for lack of a better term, went apeshit. It raised both arms and began flailing wildly. The severing of one arm made no difference in its furious gesticulations. The arm simply dangled and shook before the other arm finally reached over in an attempt to put some kind of pressure on the fresh wound and staunch the blood flow. There was no stemming of the tide without a fully equipped medical team. After a few seconds of paralyzed shock, the PV seemed to realize this was its last few moments. Revenge was the only thing it had left. Reaching its left hand to Sako's neck, it attempted to raise his mask. This animal is going to try to infect me. Rorschach battled the grasping hand with his free hand and slammed his tanto onto the right side of the burgeoning belly. Like butter, the razor-sharp steel effortlessly sliced through skin, muscle, guts, and a developing fetus before exiting out the other side. Steaming entrails and amniotic fluid poured onto the hero's coat with a killing blow. The queen understood and its spawn was no more, its purpose to exist now lost. Hirotaro effortlessly flung the defeated demon aside. It landed on its lacerated and draining belly, weeping remains oozed onto the soft floor beneath it. The blackened filth under it turned to a sloppy paste as the hero rose. As Sako walked on filth-covered ground to his defeated enemy, something caught his eye. In a monstrous display of grotesque abomination, he could see the blue hand of a never-to-be-born baby peavy among the guts of its mother. He ran his blade deeply along the base of the queen's skull. We can't all be winners. Rorschach spoke to the now truly dead vile monster. The bloody pile was once the pride of this blue brood. Now the next generation will not see the light of day. The hive was defeated today. No members remained. This house is clear. Sako looked over to his armored and exhausted comrades. 
other than the fact both of their suits of armor sported fresh coatings of body fluid, they appeared no worse for wear. He approached as the phantom stood ramrod straight. They saluted and he tiredly reciprocated. Sir! The hit spoke in unison. The former marine wiped the blade of his tonto on a silk handkerchief that would never again be useful for anything. Did either of you see any evidence of our missing child here? They answered with what he expected. Sir, no sir. Hirotaro's shoulders fell and he exhaled regretfully. Well, I guess we have to report the mission was the opposite of success. Let's go home. It's not ours to question why, just to do or die. The hits responded. Sergeant Sako caught a hint of snark but let it pass. Nine. The Package. What you got there, preacher? Brother Brown's heart skipped a beat at his neighbor's excited and surprising question. The next-door neighbor appeared from seemingly nowhere and just started talking. On the preacher's barbecue grill sat a beautiful rack of ribs. You been hiding a pig in your basement? The neighbor could tell it wasn't beef. It was much too small. It certainly wasn't chicken. The meat had a marbled, pinkish look to it. Brother Brown smiled and tried to come off casually. No, it was freeze-dried, and I figured I'd top it off with some barbecue sauce. Never mind that a whole pig wouldn't be freeze-dried. Even if it were, it would have been cooked already. The supposed temporary replacement for the man of God grinned wickedly. It would appear in character to be neighborly. You want to share? What was this guy's name? Jones. The neighbor, Jones, vigorously shook his head. You bet, Brother Brown. Mind if I go get my wife? Brother Brown could barely contain the maniacal chuckle. Surely, brother, what's mine is yours. And what's yours is mine. Once this dumbass partakes of some of this barbecue, he's behind me forever. And if he does somehow find out what the mystery meat is, he'll be too disgusted with himself not to be loyal. Jones looked at his feet. She's been kind of down for the past couple of days, since, you know. The faux preacher saw an opportunity. I understand. I mean, I've never been in that situation, but it's completely understandable that she's having a hard time with your sweet little daughter missing. Some good food and Christian fellowship will cheer her right up. Joan smiled. You're right, Brother Brown. Jogging back toward his house. That barbecue will cheer me up enough for the both of us. Mike Brown smirked. I'll be sure to tell Lauren to get some extra plates ready. Interlude 1 My radio buzzed at the expected time. My old gray fox here, you read. 10-4, good buddy. I could tell my dad had a question on his lips. I had to bite the inside of my cheek to keep from laughing. It was almost as if a weight lifted every time he dropped into a casual tone. You remember I told you the other night that a child went missing? Well, she's still missing, for nearly a week now, and still no sign. Did she just wander off? How did she get off the island unnoticed? She didn't. He trusted his guards impeccably to keep a watch out. You know, since two of the really observant bastards got their throats slit by the betrayer in my third journal. All of this sounded perplexing. So somebody on the island has kidnapped a kid? That sounded okay when I said it, but now that it's on paper, it just looks weird. A kidnapper should nap kids. Kidnapper is kind of self-explanatory. He had an edge to his voice. I think so. There have been people searching with nothing found so far. We started an official investigation, but I'm concerned, Mo. The parents of the missing child aren't suspects, but they are pretty calm about their child being missing. White, do you think they did something to their own child? That would be some sick fuckers. No, I don't. There's something else happening. I think those of us that have survived the apocalypse have grown accustomed to loss and death. That's not good either. Too bad the Oracle and I are not there. Our Sherlock Holmes skills would have the mystery solved in just a few chapters. Wait, am I Sherlock or is he? Well, he does call me Watson sometimes. My father continued. And this preacher might be bad news. 
Martin Williamson is a lawyer, and he said he remembered hearing this guy's name concerning bad checks and other legal issues down in Birmingham. It's a common name, so maybe he heard about somebody else, but we should probably ask him for clarification. He could have been a bank robber, but that is the last crime that would matter nowadays. Well, he'd still be a criminal nonetheless, and I don't think I'd trust him with much. If he were a bank robber, he probably wouldn't have any money from his heists. What good would it be? I was jumping to conclusions. So this preacher is a thief and a child molester? He chuckled. That's a little hasty. As I said, he might not even be the guy Martin heard about, and there's no reason to suspect he had anything to do with the kidnapping. Why do you think that? Oh, because it just seems like something the fucked up bastard that is a screenwriter would put in the play. No reason. My brother came onto the deck to join in the conversation. So has Benji made any flyovers? My father answered. Yeah, he's actually picked up a few survivors. Unless they're hiding underground, they don't seem to be a lot of zombies left. Does that mean they're dying off? Maybe they're migrating north. It would be great if we could one day soon repopulate areas besides the islands. Maybe I could just move somewhere far away. The revenants are apparently only following me. How are things on that end? He added. Oh, just peachy. I've been almost killed more than once, and I've eaten nothing but fish since I left the island. God, I miss Tia Tawaki Restaurant. Easy cut in before I could start complaining. Everything's okay here. We've been running into fewer and fewer peavies the further we go. Says the man who doesn't have to go into nearly every fucking dam on the river. He made sure to tack on. Well, at least on the trips Mo doesn't go on. The other end of the radio signaled the conversation was drawing to a close. Well, your mama got Ruby Sparks on DVD. I guess we're about to go watch it. Thanks, Daddy. Just brush off your only children, the ones that you're almost guaranteed never to see again for a stupid romantic comedy. And Ruby Sparks, at least put on Tin Cup. Mr. Easy Clean spoke before I could. Tell Mama I love her. You know, I might have been about to say the same thing. Now if I say anything, I'll just look like I'm sucking up after my brother. Will do. Gray Fox over and out. 10. Sweet Home Zombies Amy Rice. Mayor Collins glanced up from his paperwork. You used to live on Gunnersville Island. Sitting in his office, she threw a thumb over her shoulder. Yes, sir. My house is back there, just behind Publix. Looking down at her lap, she softly said, I, like, don't really want to go. Oh, don't worry about it. There are plenty of other places you can stay. Randy mentally kicked himself for letting her think she would be forced to live in a place which would remind her of her lost loved ones. Attempting to lighten the mood, he cocked his head. Home sweet home, right? With a quick laugh, she smiled. Something like that. He clumsily set the folder of papers on the desk with his left hand. It was still a challenge to do an everyday task with his off hand when his right hand was now the off hand. Literally. The severed right hand had been initially cleaned up days ago by Lauren Brown. She was the replacement for the medicine man and wife of the voted-in temporary replacement for the man of God. She told the mayor over the following days that the wound was healing nicely. Still painfully sensitive to even sunlight, the nub needed to remain bandaged for a time. Randy kept it in his front pocket most of the time. The phantom pains would forever be a nagging reminder of the blind ferocity of dying men. Before May Day, civilized people wouldn't think of treating each other in such a manner. Over a month spent surviving amidst chaos has almost evolved most human societal structures back to nomadic tribesmen. Survival of the fittest. How about something with more gravitas, like eye for an eye? That law of nature had quickly become the given rule. Even if the eyes already turn in yellow, Mayor Collins could only laugh. Randy could have sworn he met this girl before. We've met before, haven't we? But where do I know you from? Nearly able to qualify for his AARP card, he was starting to become worse with putting faces to names and vice versa. At least that was his excuse now. 
Remembering things like that had never really been his strong suit. Governing a post-apocalyptic society had, however, been keeping his mind pretty busy. Amy smiled. Yes, sir. You're Moe's dad. Me and Sarah used to come over to your house, like, a totally long time ago. He clicked his tongue and nodded. That was it. So you've been here. The young woman was excited to rekindle any connection from before that didn't involve her family. So how is Mo? I know he's not here, but you've been talking to him over the radio. And Sarah? Her friend's betrayal would be overlooked, at least for the moment. As soon as I see her, well, I'll just cross that bridge when I get to it. Randy sighed. He's still Mo. Pausing, he thought about it for a second. Wait, how do you know so much anyway? How long have you been here? And for that matter, who were you staying with? Until she stood and waved in the general direction of the airport, he hadn't paid attention to her clothing. She was wearing a pair of shorts accented with a very familiar bomber jacket. I've been here for a few days. Like Benji saved me. I'd like to stay with him if that's okay. So Amy was the female Benji had told me he rescued from Kmart. Maybe the two are in some kind of romantic relationship already. Good for him. It was great that the second cousin, who had been like a nephew to him, was getting some joy after watching so many of his friends die. Coming home and not be able to find any of his immediate family was terrible. At least now the boy had reason to smile. Who knows? The baby boom could go on for years. Nothing else to do. Well then, it looks like we've got all the paperwork in order. He raised his eyebrows and smiled. And I guess you already know where you'll be staying. Backing to the door, she cheerfully returned, uh, Yes, sir, I think I got it. Thanks so much. I'm sure I'll see you around. Oh, and tell Mo I said hi when you talk to him again. She's such a polite girl, unlike some other people her age. It was still only a pipe dream that most young people, especially his eldest son, would be respectful. Maybe she could teach Hunter how to behave. Couldn't be any worse than Mo. Eleven. Natural Born Killers. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. The role is not definitely required to be filled, but the Alpha may be discovered to be the superior of the wolf. Just as sick and twisted as a subordinate, this character is somewhat better at deceiving any authorities and deflecting suspicion from themselves. The Alpha's downfall may often come at the hand of the subordinate or proxies. The non-denominational salvaging team. James Peters answered with pride in his voice when asked who he had been with at a local chicken feed mill earlier today. Brother Brown and his faithful group of church members have been performing secondary scavenging trips on locations previously scouted and searched by initial reclamation teams. So what happened? The nurse in blue scrubs asked. Her eyes darted between James and his screaming, crying daughter. James had to speak loudly over the wails of his child. Sabrina and her friends were playing with some of the equipment in the building. I told her that's what she gets for playing in the dark. Sabrina was holding an ice pack over her chin. No one knew how it happened, and it was impossible to get the story from the inconsolable, frantic little girl. Apparently she had fallen or banged her chin on something and tore it open. When she had briefly removed the ice pack, it was clear the chin was split, requiring stitches. Lauren Brown, the medicine man's temporary replacement, would sew her right up. The nurse came to the door and took Sabrina's hand to lead her to a patient room to wait for the nurse practitioner. As they turned, James spoke. Me and Allison are going down to the church to help Brother Brown unload the scavenged supplies. He shrugged. The Lord's work must be done. It will probably be a couple of hours. If she feels up to it, Sabrina ought to be able to walk to the house. He gestured in the direction of Highway 431. We live just across the four lane. All the instructions were given and accepted. Sabrina waved goodbye to her parents, who entirely believed in the ability of their daughter to leave on time. What they didn't know was she wouldn't be leaving this building by her own will. Lauren Brown looked over the curly-haired girl as she gave a final snip to the stitches. Well, he has always had a thing for blondes. I guess that's why he hooked up with me. 
This one's around the usual age. Plus, it's kind of chubby. The meat will be nice and marbled. There you go, all done. You were so brave. She pulled a piece of candy from her lab coat. Want a sucker? Sabrina was gleeful. Red is my favorite, you bet. The girl snatched a lollipop from her hand. Sabrina stood, not really sure what to do now. The alpha looked down at the girl and smiled. So where are your parents, sweet thing? Pointing childishly, the adolescent girl responded with, They went to the church to help Brother Brown unload savage supplements. Intriguing. Mike has its parents occupied. That means he must have sent it here for me to inspect. Well, I certainly approve. What do you plan to do until they get back? My chin is kind of sour, but I think I can make it up to the house. She again pointed, this time in the general direction of her home. I live right up there. Lauren's mouth was nearly salivating, almost shaking with excitement. Just wait here, and I'll be back with a shot so you won't have to worry about it being sore. After giving her the injection, the Alpha led Sabrina out through the rear exit. The easiest way to get home is right out back here. The walk to that back door was the last thing the little girl would remember. Me and James just unloaded the last drum. Jones is unreasonably excited, as usual. Putting up with these goddamn retards all day will be worth it, though. I'll be eating well tonight. It might be a good idea to go ahead and start casting blame with someone else. That way they'll never suspect me. As if a man of God could hurt anyone. Speaking so everyone in the parking lot could hear, the reverend planted a seed in the loose soil of the surrounding church members' minds. Don't you find it odd that the mayor hasn't been to any church gatherings since Tommy went missing? He was sure to arch an eyebrow when his gaze passed over her father. The seed was planted. The assembled sheep slowly nodded. The supposed man of cloth nearly fist-pumped. Someone else was now under the bus. There would be no reason for anyone to ever connect an upstanding, civic-minded leader such as himself to these disappearing children. Christ on a cracker. These fucking simpletons just swallowed that load and nearly asked for seconds. I'll let that shit set and bring it up again later. Man, I'm a good poker player. 12. Into the Crypt I want this to go into this. Randy was speaking loudly and firmly, over-enunciating every syllable. Using exaggerated motions, he showed Bob, the temporary replacement for the tech, exactly what he wanted, using the best language-helping tool since the dawn of time. Volume. Gene had replaced the hand cannon on the Samus suit with an armored gauntlet, just like on the opposite arm. It probably came with the suit when he bought it, but Randy wouldn't be surprised if he built it himself. Hammer had both hands, so the extra cannon was left in one of Gene's many workshops. After searching them all, Randy finally found it. Now, if Bob could make it work. Wearing his Storm Knight armor, he lifted the cannon and placed it against the wrist where his right hand used to be. The mayor asked Bob to try and attach the hand cannon onto his suit of armor. Every time he thought about it, Randy nearly chuckled. You's always at the place you is always supposed to be. Becoming an amputee had to happen, because he was supposed to wear this piece of armor. The screenwriter made everything fall into place at just the right time. Bob looked at the mayor, then at the cannon, then back and forth from what Randy was explaining to him. With confusion in his eyes, Bob only nodded in agreement. This was typical for their working relationship. If witnessing this interaction, it would appear that Roberto Bob Martinez never actually had a clue what Mayor Collins was telling him. Somehow, though, he always completed the task perfectly. The mechanic's response was the obligatory, See, si, jefe. Randy stood in an Excelsior Comics t-shirt and a pair of well-worn blue jeans, while his plump little friend could be heard working in the back room. Some of the classic comics on the shelves reminded him of his collection. The ones lost in... Well, let's not think about that. A popping, grinding, and whirring sounded through the door. The repairman was doing exactly as he was supposed to. The mayor was confident this suit of armor would look as if it were made that way when he put it on. There would be a story to tell next time he radioed the Cora, 
if he could remember to tell it, that is. Bob came out the door with a smirk under his bushy mustache. Randy could only smile in kind when he looked at him. Without speaking, Bob grunted and gestured for the mayor to follow. This looks perfect! Randy held his arm up, displaying the artistry. With his amateur electrical knowledge, he could reposition the wiring in the suit so the solar-powered charge would congregate at the end of the cannon. Without the expertise of the tech, there was no way to make the cannon shoot balls of energy as it did in Metroid Prime. The device wasn't expected to be supernatural, but the blunt gauntlet could be used as an explosive taser. So, this is a funeral home? The mayor grinned morbidly at Robert Coe's question. Almost. It's a nursing home. One step up, I guess. Barfield Nursing Home was a large complex. It was larger than Randy had previously thought. There was a gas station and a Methodist church nearby, but the simple one-story structure was in a nondescript area along U.S. Highway 431. Most locals had driven past Barfield on their commute to or from Huntsville. Sadly, very few knew of its existence unless they had a relative living there. Whether or not it had been a blip on most folks' radar, its sole purpose now would be to become scavenged by the living. The nursing home was a one-story building made up of three wings with short connecting halls. The complex looked like a Roman numeral three crossed in the middle. The wing in the center was no longer on either end and contained the cafeteria. The food storage area in this wing was the main lure for the initial reclamation team. South of Gunnersville, salvage territory extended much further than it did to the north. Nobody could speculate why Huntsville, the largest city in northern Alabama, would be overflowing with zombies. Birmingham was a much larger city, albeit less than a hundred miles to the south, yet it didn't seem to be continually spawning undead. Things are easy in some areas, so they can be impossibly difficult in others. Randy smiled. The screenwriter knew what the audience wanted. Barfield was as far north as the scavenging team had been able to reach so far. If expansion continued at this rate, they'd be in Hampton Cove, or even Huntsville by this time next month. Maybe our luck will hold out. Part of a four-man team, with Robert behind the wheel, Randy was riding shotgun, and Tarangelo and Putnam occupied the back seat. Though not main protagonists who were given power armor, the two in the back were armored as most locals as of late. Where wearing flannel, leather, denim, and any other type of thick clothing had become common, they sought to equip themselves with anything that was somewhat resistant to both tooth and nail. Rather than be one-upped by Randy's massive nexus blade, they also carried melee weapons. More than simple knives and clubs, however, Tarangelo carried a sharpened lawnmower blade over his shoulder. Putnam sported a double-sided hand axe. The blades weren't terrifying, but they would sufficiently put down enemies at close range if need be. Knowing the twisted will of the screenwriter, they would most likely be needed. Also not classed with the core characters, Robert had also not been outfitted by the tech, which was why other insignificants found him outfitted as Captain America perplexing. Eyebrows always rose when taking in the full uniform and accompanying shield. Apparently, the previous resident of the house Robert Coe and Mortimer Lester were settled in was a massive Marvel Comics fan, particularly Captain America. In the closet of one of the bedrooms hung the iconic suit. On a shelf above it, he found the ringed shield with the star in the center. Definitely not a show-off or a bragger, Robert chose to equip himself in the garb of every other civilian. Well, at least for the first few weeks. To be seen in such a tight-fitting suit would be embarrassing. After witnessing the usefulness of a leather outfit on more than one occasion, he finally decided to answer the call of the red, white, and blue uniform in his closet. Crystal, his island wife, was more than happy to have her man more protected than he would otherwise be. Robert stepped out of the truck and walked around to meet the mayor, who was standing at the front of the truck. Both of the men stayed strategically close behind each of the armored men. The quartet made their way through the main doors and stopped at the front desk. On the trip over, Putnam had told a story about his grandmother, who stayed here years ago. There were always birds in the common area, tweeting incessantly. It was a sound that would be very familiar to anyone who'd ever been into the rest home. Though the other three had never been here, the reminiscence of their companion had creeped them out even more. When they entered Barfield Nursing Home on the right side, there were no welcoming songbirds to greet them. 
and the eerie silence sent a chill up their collective spines. This place was deadly quiet. They passed the activity center which had apparently been a nesting area for the infected. It looked to have been inactive for at least a couple of weeks. Pallets of leaves and skid marks provided evidence of the former blue residents. Somehow the classic scent of a nursing home, industrial detergent, and urine were prevalent over all the smells frequently left by revenants. Running their rifle lights over the occasional sign on the wall, Randy was pleased to see that the crew was moving in the direction intended when starting the journey down the darkened halls. The map displayed beside the front desk showed the facility's cafeteria in the same wing, a few hundred yards to the rear. Trudging down these corridors, one could become disoriented, but they were still heading the right way. Imagine how confusing it must have been for the elderly residents navigating a maze like this. Captain America kicked an overturned walker out of a doorway as he passed. Not because it was necessary, nor had any impact on their walk. Just because he couldn't stand for a door to remain stuck. There's peavy poop everywhere. Why does this place still smell like a nursing home? Mayor Collins chuckled. Maybe they're keeping the floors mopped. He immediately frowned after saying this. Peavy stayed away from disinfectants, so that didn't make sense. It was obvious to all four of them as they seemed to slosh through the hallways that nothing had been mopped. Who knows? I guess it's just another one of those unexplainable mysteries. The cafeteria was large. Not cavernous like the typical school lunchroom, but it was big enough to seat at least a hundred people. Insects and rodents must have had a field day with this place. A cooler containing tiny milk cartons had been left open. If there had been any food in the large serving pans, no hint remained. Mayor Collins was confident nothing edible would be found in this area. At least nothing that was unsealed. Cautiously, the group crept in the direction of the food line leading to the kitchen. From the entrance, the classic queue line was to the left. This was basically the back of the room, since the exterior wall, complete with picture windows, was on the opposite side of the lunchroom, and the food was served to the right of the entrance. Besides the area immediately surrounding the windows, the cafeteria was gloomy but seemed free of any recent droppings. Peavies weren't likely to be in such a sprawling enclosure, but likely didn't really mean anything anymore. The zombies were known to adapt. As the group was about halfway across the large room, they began hearing shuffling, scuttling, occasional squishing, and then finally the doors closing behind them. Immediately, Randy could see no other exits from the room. Though the doors probably weren't locked, exiting from them would be next to impossible. Dozens of sets of biting teeth now stood between them and salvation. Flashes of yellow eyes could be seen in the musky enclosure. Trapped! The peavies were adapting, evolving, and becoming more than simple animals. A dangerous game was being played. Something that sounded like a laugh, not coming from a living human, echoed throughout the room. The monsters were eager for the battle to come. Randy unsheathed his glaive. Robert stood ready with his round shield, flexing his fingers in anticipation. Tarangelo stood ready with his lawnmower blade. Putnam clapped the shaft of his axe into his free hand. They knew there was no point in bothering with firearms. Combat would become tediously close in the span of just a few heartbeats. With these blue demons, every move made in combat was close. The entire group of ghouls seemed to take a collective breath and then draw back. As a single unit, they clashed with the grossly outnumbered survivors, throwing bare skin against razor-sharp steel, clearly driven insane by hunger. Slamming his makeshift sword into yellow-eyed nudist after shit-covered cannibal, Tarangelo was thankful for the bandana and safety goggles. Holding firmly to his blade, the ridiculous amount of blood nearly drenched him didn't noticeably affect his grip. As he stepped forward to wrench the steel from the nearly dismembered shoulder of a falling monster, his foot shot out from under him where he planted it in a pool of infected blood. Even before his back hit the floor, he screamed in terror. Putnam! Putnam had just cleaved another reanimated corpse nearly in two below the ribs. Sloppy organs and every type of body fluid imaginable had been spilled by his axe. The undead were meeting their true ends in droves due to his improvised tool. After taking an enemy to the cold tile, its cranium nearly exploded under the forceful swing of his heavy blade. He turned quickly, springing to help his downed comrade. I'm coming, buddy! 
He might not have been in such a hurry to come to his friend's aid if he could see the swimming pool worth of blood on the floor surrounding Tarangelo. Putnam came to his compatriot's side at full tilt. Planting his feet was impossible in gallons of slick crimson. The survivor continued forward, toppling onto his downed friend. In his panic, he held his axe in front of him, strangely at a ninety-degree angle, the blade facing outwards. Tripping over his brother in arms, the sharpened head of the wood-cutting tool came down squarely on Tarangelo's chin and neck, under Putnam's full weight. Tarangelo didn't even have time to scream. His trachea, larynx, carotid, jugular, though there was no naming them all, had been ruptured. The blade sliced from just below his nose down to where it impacted the sternum. Though still alive for the moment, the now-dying man could do nothing but flail and gurgle. Arterial blood jetted from his gashed throat. Putnam understood he had just slaughtered his friend involuntarily. Luckily, the other side of the tool's sharpened head impacted against Putnam's heavy car heart jacket, never breaking through. Well, the accidental murderer didn't see it as very lucky. Blinded with hatred for himself and the naked monsters all around him, he threw himself up with a crazed roar. It was still unbelievable. He just ended the life of another human by mistake. Filthy lunatics continued to rush at the crying, screaming man. Furiously, Putnam brought his weapon back and forth, destroying or at least dropping several of his enemies. When there were no more immediate in arm's reach, he dropped his blade and pulled a pistol from his hip. This is for Tarangelo! He screamed as he relentlessly squeezed the trigger. Two empty magazines clattered to the floor. For the next magazine, Putnam put nine bullets into just as many of the evil creatures. Then, turning back to the wet body of his dead friend, he said something unintelligible. Dropping to his knees, he put the muzzle in his mouth and pulled the trigger. As gray matter erupted from Putnam's skull, his brain and the harder calcium shell were also vaporized. His body fell twitching to the floor beside his dead friend. Robert was close enough to hear Putnam beg Tarangelo's God and his own mother's forgiveness before he blew the back of his skull off. It made the survivor feel completely helpless, close enough to witness another's end, but unable to make any kind of move to stop it. While the two humans met their collective demise, he was dealing with his own swath of blue crazed killers. Wearing a set of razored brass knuckles named the Devil's Pizza Cutters, he used his fists to pulverize his enemies. Peavies charged and received slices to their blue skin or cracked skulls and bones. Quite a few shattered teeth lay in the blood pooling around him. A stainless steel skull rested on the inside of the grip that was itself stylized as a spine. Wrapping one's hand around the brass and stainless steel structure added an immense weight. When combined with the other end, a collection of sharpened brass spikes used to punch through craniums and poke out yellow eyes. Leather, spandex, space-age polymer, whatever type of miracle fabric this suit was made from was absolutely impenetrable to the teeth of the former humans. Though he would still be battered and bruised considering they had bitten him dozens of times, true to its natural protection, none of the bites had broken through to the skin. The only thing the zombies were successful in doing was shattering their teeth or pulling them out. Trying to wrap his mind around what had been thus far a 50% loss for his own side, he was thankful their fellow living had taken out the numbers of infected they had. At least a third of the mass of undead now lay on the floor, dead or dying. Only a few thousand more to go and we could take home a few cans of beans. Damn apocalypse! Mayor Collins swept his nexus blade in a half circle to his front disemboweling more than one lunatic. Bile, blood, and shit must have been ankle-deep in the immediate area. The ghouls drew closer, no matter the amount he dropped into reeking piles. When an animal was able to reach him, the only satisfaction he got was from their chipped teeth and bent nails. Finally, combat became so close that his massive war machine steel became a hindrance. Slashing revenants with a combat knife, he used the uncharged cannon to beat back his enemies. Even when not charged, the arm-mounted cannon was an effective deterrent to those who wished not to taste his close-quarter blade. Thrusting his now solid steel nub into any part of a completely unclothed body delivered satisfying crunches and yelps. Bones broke, organs were ruptured, and splashes of diarrhea spurted from rectums with each forceful punch. These punches were basically stabs with a large demolition hammer being wielded as a close-combat weapon. 
Captain America slammed his free set of bladed knuckles up through the chin and into the soft palate of a peavy. It dropped when another cannibal nudist came at him from the side. Before it could even bother uselessly sinking its teeth into his suit, he brought his forearm up and slashed across its throat with the edge of the shield. Arterial blood geysered from the gaping wound. Tubes jetted from the throat, clearly severed. The animal reached for its throat, attempting to stem the enormous amount of blood loss. Only the screenwriter could know if a lack of oxygen or blood loss would be its final death knell. The shield didn't help much when it came back around on the counterswing and slammed into the solar plexus, dropping the PV immediately. The mayor of Gunnersville shoved his knife between the top ribs on the left side of one of the emaciated monsters. As it ripped inwards, blood pumped from the laceration and lungs sliced as the serrated steel impacted the sternum. He pulled away and stiff-armed the beast with a cannon at the center of the throat. There was a pop as the creature's Adam's apple flattened. Just as a going-away present, he slammed his metal boot into the genitals of the former human. Almost like being trapped in a vice, the scrotum and deflating penis exploded under pressure. Falling back, the animal would surely die a painful death while holding its crotch. The blue head count now would hardly take up both hands for each of the humans if they counted on their fingers. Randy could see that human would be the winning team today. He wanted to make the day worth remembering. Jamming his knife into the skull of a beast and kicking it away forcefully, he charged up the energy collector connected to the cannon. Somehow it was still possible for at least one peefy to sustain its obesity. Sagging testicles could be seen under the rolls of excessive blue fat, clarifying the creature was male. Swaying blue breasts jiggled with every step. This finale was going to be massive. The red, white, and blue superhero launched up onto the closest table. Robert began kicking cannibals as they attempted to come to his level. As he broke the cranial bones of so many undead, it was surprising he hadn't broken any of his own bones. One of the final demons lurched to the base of his mountain. A tall, rail-thin elderly thing was unbelievably still functioning. Captain America took a few steps back and ran forward to leap up and off the table for a slam dunk. Robert spread his feet apart just as he came down onto the shoulders of the lunatic. The zombie split in two, being ripped apart like a rotten banana full of blood. His feet clanked against pelvic bone before what was left of the monster fell, twitching. Standing alone in the reeking remains of the undead, Robert relaxed and watched the mayor take on his final opponent. The grotesque behemoth waddled toward Randy at full trot. It reached out appearing as a classic Romero-esque zombie before its keto diet. Mayor Collins waited for the animal to come within his reach. Thrusting his arm straight out, the cannon jammed into the massive, blubbery gut. The animal attempted doubling over. Epic jiggling rolls of blue, sweaty, fat flesh shook together. Raw meat and sewage shot violently from either end. Organs ruptured when the blunt steel penetrated the skin, drawing blood. At this moment, the mayor sent a flow of electricity to the end of his wrist. Yellow eyes grew wide when a volcanic eruption seemed to take place. What had to be tons of excess fat and meat rippled under the skin before ballooning outwards. The demon burst like it was a piñata, jam-packed with fireworks and rotten flesh-flavored candy. Clearly destroyed, it took longer than expected for body chunks to start raining down covered in bloody strands of what could be mistaken for cloudy, melted superglue. Randy was simultaneously sickened and awed. Covered in every type of fluid, all Randy could do was smile. He turned to face Captain America. Neither of them made a sound, only smirking at each other. Before either of them could start laughing maniacally, the mayor broke the silence. Well, at least it wasn't full. Now let's get what we came for. Thirteen. Sako's Journal One. Dogs picked clean bones in alley behind chicken feed mills on east side of island this morning. Looked fresh. Surprising there are any dogs left in the wastes to be hunted. These monsters should be afraid of me. I've seen their true faces. Blue skin, yellow eyes, completely naked. Unwashed, unclean, undead, infected, soulless, sick plague victims. Peavies. 
Any of their paths are extended latrines. Long and torturous roads paved with the refuse of the new Blue Age. These latrines are expectedly full of shit. When the storm drains cake over, and the black tar-like feces pool up around their waists, they'll look up and scream in impotent rage. I'll look down and simply smile. My accompanying investigators and I were tasked with finding another missing child, Sabrina Peters. It just so happened to be a young blonde girl, just like the last. The reason I became a detective was to solve mysteries. Giving parents no hope of seeing their children again was horribly depressing. Nothing was satisfying about a mystery. A trend seemed to be forming, but there was no need to suspect anything more than the most likely scenario. The girl accompanied her parents on their collecting mission with Brother Brown. That was her last known whereabouts, which was over 48 hours before she was reported missing, possibly abducted. Her baffled parents supposed their missing daughter had just returned, here, to the local Pilgrim's Pride feed mill to explore. Just like any child would want to do, there had yet to be any other children reported unaccounted for as part of this particular investigation. Mahatma pressed his foot on the brake behind the first row of cars in the parking lot. There was a small nagging in the back of my mind to order him to find a parking spot, but I knew that was just crazy. I don't understand why anyone would follow traffic laws after May Day. Ridiculous. As we walked to the main entrance, passing parked vehicles, it was apparent many of the employees had been Hispanic. Mexican flags hung on the inside of windows or flew from antennas. These people had been showing national pride on their Independence Day. If only they'd been carrying around guns to shoot into the air. Like classic TV would have you believe they celebrate. They might still be alive today. Before entering the large double doors, the green-accented clone trooper squirted a heavy dose of bleach all around the entrance. It wasn't a guarantee, but with at least some type of PV deterrent around the door, we were less likely to be ambushed from behind. The door might also mask our presence to any plague carriers already inside this complex. If we were spotted by any of the animals, though, an Olympic-sized swimming pool full of Clorox wouldn't slow them down. We entered a large office, complete with a shag rug, doused in the impeccable PV decorating style. Feces. Why the hell would anyone use thick carpet in a processing plant? Undoubtedly, this carpet was nearly as disgusting before the turned cannibal started using it as a waste receptacle. Had it originally been green, tan, gray, brown, or even a shade of black? Original color could never be determined. There was no descriptor for what looked like regurgitated charcoal chowder coating an extraordinarily huge burnt pizza topped with liquefied anchovies. Quicksand would be more pleasant to walk through, one of the phantoms grunted. Trudging through the goop, listening to the air scream in pain and terror as it was forced down by my boots into the putrid stew. I nodded in silent agreement. For some reason, walking in this made me think of that pilot, Benji, who wore the Indiana Jones hat, and I laughed. Yeah, as long as there aren't any snakes. I attempted an impersonation of Harrison Ford, even though Mahatma and Rajesh probably didn't get it anyway. Moving further into the complex, we traveled down darkened corridors, noticing occasional evidence of shooed children marked in the black tar-like PV shit which was covering the floor. Many times they had climbed onto the equipment. Clearly they had just been playing around in the near total darkness. The ingredients for chicken feed would have been mixed on this assembly line. First the yellow mush would start out with a consistency akin to PV crap. Then the paste would be steam dried into a large block. After that the giant block must be broken up. Continuing to be broken down by the end of its journey through the plant, the feed is eventually granulated and at its apex of quality. Workers became so attuned the entire process was completed in a seemingly shorter time than it took to write this paragraph. Aha! Evidence showed of several small feet congregating around one particular area located at the end of the line. There was a bar about the height of a child's chin. This must be where it happened. Obviously, the children left as a group. The pairs of footprints pretty much became one large scuff. Unsure why, but I pictured several children carrying the injured outside. At least some of them must have returned to Pilgrim's Pride female later on, possibly including the one that injured herself. Apparently defiant, she wasn't going to let a simple injury get in the way of her exploring. We must investigate further into the plant. 
At the end of the next shadowed hall, we waited at a sealed pair of doors leading into the exhaust tower. Before the apocalypse, the tall oval-shaped tower constantly released a giant pillar of steam. The thick plume appeared to be toxic, but it was only superheated steam from cooking the chicken feed. Since May Day, the tower had been nothing more than a giant, silent, unused monolith. Watching. Waiting. It was unused, at least, for the reason it was created by humans. Before going inside, I was confident it housed something malevolently unnatural. It just had the feeling of being off. Blackened footprints marked the floor, and smears of excretia coated the push bars on the doors. Concluding this area had been used frequently, as suspected, and not by living people. Another hive. Would it contain humans being used to feed one another clutch? Though it would be sickening to discover the children within, being slowly harvested, it would be a relief to be able to close this case. Whether or not the little girl was inside, there was definitely infected beyond these doors. Small bit of satisfaction could be met by sending the undead to their true graves. It took the three of us to push open the heavy pressure-sealed doors. As they swung open, we cautiously moved through the doorway one at a time. Some light streamed down from a gaping hole at the top, providing decent illumination. There was a metal staircase which leads up to a platform spiraling to the opening above. For some reason, there was an elevator shaft on the far wall, which started at the floor and disappeared into the hazy distance above. This enormous tower seems to have no other purpose than exhausting steam. Puzzling also was the metal ladder caged on the far wall. In the center of the tower floor lay what had to be literally a metric ton of shit. The enormous, gelatinous mound seemed to have a life of its own. Much like the shit-covered bathroom at the campground, it actually seemed to be breathing. Or were those ripples just seismic shifts from the earth? Expectedly, the reason this mass of feces existed exposed itself. And damn, there were a bunch of reasons. An uncountable number of starving monsters looked down at the food that had delivered itself and roared as one in delight. The echo of their combined howls inside this chamber of horrors was deafening. Peavies had started running with all their strength to get down the almost never-ending staircase. In such an excited hurry, more than one of the demons toppled over the railing, taking its final journey to the cold concrete layered in excrement. The horrified screams echoed through the tower, reverberating for an impossibly long time as beast after beast came crashing to the ground. It was raining Peavies in shit. Stampeding down such a narrow walkway quickly became a fight for space. Arms slinging, pushing and even suicidal tackling was prevalent. Tripping and stumbling down the stairs, the frenzied cannibals became enraged at being halted on their rush to food. Each crazy had to be in front of the next, just because it wanted to be the first one down. It was like rush hour traffic. The insane pushing only slowed the entire group rather than propel the individual. Numerous zombies shrieked in horrible terror as they tumbled to their painful final true deaths. Remember those stories of investment bankers jumping from skyscrapers in New York City circa 1929? Now envision hundreds of those guys jumping from different floors of the same building. This is what looking up would compare to, only they were blue, naked, and emptying everything in their digestive tract as they fell. All of them were screaming and shitting as they played chicken with gravity. It was disturbing to see what I'd come to think of as mindless reanimated corpses yelling in unimaginable fright as they plummeted to their end. As they toppled from every level, the inhuman howls sounded, as one after the other lost its fight with gravity. The plague-ridden enemy sounded like a chorus, splitting wide the gates of oblivion. Ear-splitting cries would be abruptly cut off with bone-crushing thuds. Some of the unfortunate creatures landed feet first, shattering everything below the ribs. Wailing tapered as the revenants slowly died, their organs spilling out from their exploded abdomens. Everything below their belly buttons basically disappeared when they meshed with the unforgiving floor. Just as chilling to witness were those that landed on their bellies or backs. Dermis would seemingly evaporate, allowing organs to be pushed up. Muscles and tendons added to the goopy remains drenching the base of the tower. Instantaneous infinity came to those that landed on their heads. Gray matter, bone, cartilage, and everything above the shoulders suddenly became a liquid with the consistency of semi-set jello. Upon the devastating impact, spinal columns often shot through the tailbone, landing several feet away. Though I didn't have a problem with the undead suffering, it was a relief that their screams of pain would no longer be sound pollution. 
Even the dozens of fresh bodies barely added a noticeable mass to the festering cesspool. These corpses would summarily be forgotten and caked over with black putty. This brings a question to mind. If a monkey falls out of the tree in the jungle and dies, do the rest of the monkeys in the group just leave their fucking dead, stinking brother where it fell? Will they even continue to live in the same tree? Scenes like this just make me hate the evil monsters more. They can't be anything close to human, or even of this world. Rushing, yipping zombies continued spiraling down. We waited and watched the undead get closer to the ground floor. Being within throwing distance only panicked the creatures to reach us quicker. A brave fraction chose to dive off the last two or three platforms, receiving nothing for their troubles but broken legs, shattered knees, or even destroyed hips. Mahatma Doshi, the clone trooper accented with black, scraped his axe knife along the railing of the last three steps. The green-tinted clone trooper, Rajesh Matu, flipped its three-headed trishla in acrobatic stretches, readying himself for the coming onslaught. I unsheathed ivory, my white-handled katana, and breathed in the blessings of my ancestors, watching in anticipation. We were primed for the approaching ghouls. When the horde drew within yards, I threw myself forward and up the staircase, slinging my blade like that of a lawnmower. Blue limbs flew like birds. Well, not really. They launched away from the bodies from which they'd been severed, but they immediately dropped like dead weight. Blood rocketed from the gaping stumps. It was almost comical to watch the terrified, undead amputees trip over the railing. They would begin to scream as if anticipating a more prolonged fall, but their screaming would end after the forefoot dropped to the cold floor. They seemed almost surprised at not meeting the Blue Grim Reaper as soon as they expected. Now the only thing to do was to die slowly and painfully in a bloody pool of gooey bodies. The phantoms were itching to get in on the action. Taking a step back, I held out a gloved hand to Rajesh. Lifting his chin, I could picture his eyes widening in surprised understanding. He reached out to hand me his trishla. I held the staff in both hands and ran straight at the oncoming monsters. A few of them looked at me confusedly when I got within a few steps of them. Angling the triple-bladed weapon down, I jabbed into a lifeless reanimated corpse. I pole-vaulted over the heads of the cannibals. Rajay stepped forward to reach the weapon of Shiva from the punctured corpse and held it at the ready. My Indian comrades would now be able to tear into their own peavies until there were none standing between the three of us. After the process had been repeated several times and we had traversed platform after platform on the staircase, Doshi threw himself behind enemy lines. He jumped directly into the wave of creatures behind me. Slamming his booge into the shoulder joint of a former human, he used it to propel himself deeper into blue territory. At the full extent of his arm, the axe knife came free, leaving the reanimated appendage dangling by only skin and a few tendons. A faucet of blood ran as the animal tried to hold in the crimson with its other hand. Mahatma had earlier removed the ornate elephant head, fixed onto the end of the metal shaft and was using both blades to drop peavies. He stabbed the small stiletto into a yellow eye and brought the larger blade straight into the next infected's cranium. Orbs popped from the ocular cavity as the recurved edge dug into its temple. The monster could surely feel gray matter being sliced into before it finally dropped to a twitching heap. The black clone trooper bled beast from one direction while the green trooper sliced into them from the other. Unsure which way to turn, it looked like some monsters were simply leaping from the platform committing suicide. Doubtfully this was intentional. They were simply moving away from the pain, and more than one tipped over the rail. As we moved upward, I noticed bones that had been gnawed clean, scattered along walkways. The horde had obviously been feasting on more than one dish. Most of the bones, thankfully, didn't appear to be human. With only a few more platforms to go until we reached the final level, my mind raced. Will the girl be found? Will there be any people found alive, half-eaten? The atrocities committed by these inhuman fiends were beyond nightmarish. I can only hope we don't find the same despicable horrors witnessed at the campground. Looking down at the base of the ventilation shaft, it was now covered in blue and red, quote, paint, unquote. Occasional hints of white bone made me snicker with morbidly patriotic pride. Metric tons of feces had been nearly completely covered up by a new form of waste. Hundreds of truly dead infected littered the floor, and every inch of the spiraling platform we had climbed so far. We were almost there. The phantom clone troopers watched our six o'clock. They made themselves ready with their destructive tools. I was the first to climb the last set of stairs. 
Before coming to the top, I could see the elevator at the top of the shaft from here. This small box had to hold what we sought, the end of our saga, or the treasures at the edge of the dungeon. Maybe Sabrina Peters would be found still alive, and there would be enough of her to save. As I seemingly rushed at top speed, both hands around the pommel of my katana and tanto on my hip, no PVs moved in the area. Closing in on a large service elevator, I started hearing shuffling, chittering, and even what sounded like the occasional whimper. The noise was too animalistic to have come from any human mouth. I remembered seeing a Discovery Channel special on infant chimpanzees and their near-sapient cries. The monsters compared to that exactly. Yards from the opened lift, my greeter emerged. It was a small, naked and filthy blue female, who in life had been a child, probably around the age of five or six. Not yet of age to bear offspring, the young, snaggletooth female turned to me and squealed. Its clutchmates would join their fellows shortly. Walking slowly, I approached the short creature now standing in place, waiting for its comrades. I was trying to determine if this was Sabrina Peters. There was no way to tell her natural hair color, having been soaked in every imaginable body fluid. The yellow-eyed monster was grotesquely thin. It was safe to say this wasn't the chubby little girl from the pictures. Perhaps Sabrina remained in the elevator, trapped and being slowly consumed. Lifting both weapons free from their scabbards, I watched in disgust as the rest of the miniature squad of zombies appeared. Some of the blue cannibals didn't even have a full set of teeth. They came to the side of their petite compatriot, growling and hissing threateningly. Not all of them could be considered blue, so bloodied and rolled in excrement as were they. Prior to turning, they ranged from crawling toddler to kindergarten age. Necessary but sickening was the fact that we were about to end the lives of things that had barely lived, even as humans. The hits were rushing up the last flight of stairs to back me up, but they wouldn't make it before the brawl began. The tiny beasts surged as a single unit, slinging themselves against me with the force of a rabid spider monkey's on basalts. Toothless baby peavies gummed the literal shit out of my jacket, while tiny undead dodged my blades. Agile little suckers. Shooting my left arm out at 90 degrees, the infantile cannibal on my elbow rocketed back at the approaching clone troopers. My ally with green accents on his armor extended his trishla, screaming in a high-pitched whine until all three blades caught it. The minuscule monster immediately met true death. One point stuck cleanly through the back of the hairless skull and protruded from just below the nostrils to the bottom of the chin. Number two jutted right through the not fully formed sternum its breastbone providing no resistance. Finally, the last speared cleanly through the pelvis, destroying a chance of ever being able to discover if this had been a male or a female. Black liquid ran down the shaft on this end, meaning the animal must have eaten within the past day or so. Making a disgusted noise, Rajesh took his catch from the end of the weapon. Deceased undead slid from the tip. A small sound of suction popping could be heard as the body fell. My katana stabbed cleanly through one of the young peavies, lodging at the halfway point on the blade. Rather than attempt to fight with a body on my blade, I simply released ivory, choosing to make ebony my primary weapon. The deviant imps came running around to my nine o'clock, forcing me to turn with my back now facing the railing. As a vicious little bastard's closed, I took steps back, making sure I still had some distance between me and the edge. As I swiped my tanto at one of the monsters, it expertly dodged, causing only air to be sliced. Before I could react, the other blue demon launched itself at me feet first, drop-kicking me in the chest. The wind was knocked out of me as I was forced backward. The middle of my lower back banged against the top of the rail, and I could see myself falling end over end. Enough carcasses covered the bottom level that my body might still be recognizable, albeit deceased. Falling from such a distance would surely kill me, but the detritus at the tower base would cushion the fall enough that I might not explode. My broken body could possibly be returned to my wife. Tipping over the rail, I tossed my sword straight up. Dropping both of my hands at my sides, I grabbed the railing as I flipped over it. When my feet were even with the floor, I forced my feet back through the opening below the bar that I had just toppled over. As I swung around, my momentum carried me at such speed there were several inches between my ass and the ground. I reached out, grabbing my short samurai sword from the air on its return fall and continued past the short zombies. All of this happened so fast they didn't have enough time to react, and I was able to cleave three of them in two pieces somewhere above the knee. Actually counting both legs, I suppose it was three pieces. 
The middle creature toppled into the one directly behind it, knocking it away from its severed legs. The first fell into the position of the second's upper body. For the briefest instant, they nearly appeared to have been matched with the other's lower appendages. Their flailing and flopping only increased the speed at which they would bleed out. Dark red blood ran from the freshly loosened appendages, toes still twitching. Those three were down for the count. Now all I had to deal with were the last three imps. Jumping up when my glide came to an end, I spun to face my final foes. I smiled because there now was a solid wall behind me. If they knew that a deadly drop waited behind them, they didn't show it. They grinned wickedly and came at me in half circle. Ebony whistled as I sliced through the air, readying for their assault, just before they got within range. What I immediately mistook for a pitchfork jammed into the cranium of the animal on the right. Rajesh had thrown his trishla at one of the little reanimated corpses. The center blade impacted above the ear and protruded from the other side. The other two points remained clean at the front and back of the skull. Being weighed down by the staff of the Death God's tool of destruction, the brain-dead beast collapsed and momentarily appearing propped up while gray matter leaked onto the floor. Mahatma threw himself at the middlemost former child. The sharpened steel tip of his booge penetrated just below the rib cage and continued digging into the small animal. The one-sided axe knife exited the other side as the digestive tract was destroyed. Bile and blood soaked the floor on either side of the tiny ghoul. With some quick thinking from the mindless remaining reanimate, it too would have suffered a painful death by my Indian comrade. It launched itself forward, seemingly not noticing my tanto coming in from the side. The sharp blade sliced cleanly through the neck, immediately ending the peavy. Now that I think about it, maybe it knew what it was doing, ending its miserable existence. Swift death by my blade were surely more acceptable than bleeding out like its fellows behind it. The bleeding body hit the ground with a wet thud as the severed head did a flip, landing squarely face first into its shit-covered ass cheeks. My coat flapped when I turned to make my way to the elevator. Looking inside, what I was hoping to find didn't seem present. A few mostly eaten and former furry animals set inside a shit-covered box. Some of the bones could have been human, but there were no abducted living children here. Even if this pack of zombies had taken Sabrina, she hadn't been brought here. I gripped the handle of ebony hard enough to turn my knuckles white. Another waste of time! Why? I looked up and screamed at the fates. The black trooper peeked around an imaginary corner. What's the point of this elevator anyway? Rajesh chuckled in response. I only shrugged. Sighing, I grasped my proffered katana from Mahatma, who had retrieved it from the now-dead Peavy. Another mystery solved. More paperwork. Joy. I made my way down the steps. Maybe there won't be a next time. Fourteen. Criminal. Shit, here comes that damn idiot neighbor again. Jones? Yeah, that's it. I've got to start remembering his name. As long as he can fellowship with me, a guiding light through this present darkness, he seems to be recovering well after the loss of his precious daughter. I must be a real fucking encouragement, the way these stupid bastards hang on every word I say. Motherfucker probably smelled what I'm grilling and wants to come share. God damn. Well, what would Jesus do, right? Sheeple like this fool would blindly follow me into hell. If they all break bread with me like he has, then they'll have to stay faithful because they won't be able to accept what they've done. Well, it's not really bread, but I guess. You got hamburgers? Something like that. We've got plenty if you want to come share. You bet, preacher. My wife said she dug up some potatoes this morning. I'll have her bring those. Great. Lauren can bake them. That will be perfect with these burgers. Both couples sat around the table, chowing down on the delectable burgers. Jones asked around a mouthful of meat. This tastes unbelievable. What kind of seasoning did you use? Oh, that is Lauren's secret. Brother Brown smiled and dipped his head at his wife. I didn't need much, Lauren smiled. The meat has a flavor by itself. Jones gave her puppy dog eyes but relented and agreed with her. Well, if you think you've enough of it, you should try using some of this free dried meat at the church. I don't mean all of it, but I'm sure all the members would go crazy for just a bite. 
The temporary replacement for the man of God looked over to his wife with raised eyebrows. He shook his head as he spoke to Jones. Actually, I was just thinking about that. Lauren and I need to discuss it, but I think it's God's will, and there's no reason not to share when the Lord has given me so much. The pastor paused, allowing his Christ-likeness to sink in. You think the congregation would be up for some chili? Interlude 2 It was almost time for my nightly radio chat with my father. Walking to the stairs from just taking a steaming shit, I met the tech walking below deck. I stopped with my arms at my sides as he met me in the hall. I was expecting him to slightly bow as he passed, or give me his usual Jedi greeting. He unexpectedly stopped and looked at me. Rex. I knew what he was doing. I had seen the YouTube videos of the comical greeting seen between the Krogan and human protagonists from Mass Effect on the Normandy. There are these videos where the two repeat their names as a greeting and a farewell over and over. Yes, I know I'm a geek. Don't rub it in. I tried not to smile as I returned with a pathetic attempt at an impersonation of a giant alien lizard. Shepard. It just happened. I just came out of the closet as a secret geek to the only other person on board that would have a clue what I had just referenced. We both realized at the same moment what had just occurred. A devilish grin broke across his face, and I could see he was about to point and laugh before running upstairs to tell the others I secretly wished my girlfriend was blue. Holy shit! I just now realized that both Mass Effect's Asari and PV share that skin color. Okay, it is a different tone, but still. And yeah, it kind of would be cool if she were blue and had those hair folds. My head swiveled to him as quickly as that of a geth. Our eyes locked. I knew he knew, and he knew that I knew he knew. My photoreceptors were pleading with him not to say anything to anyone, to keep my dark secret quiet. Our force auras must have been communicating. The broad smile faded, leaving only a hint of a smirk as he nodded in agreement to keep it on the down low. He then turned and continued walking on down the hall probably going to make sure his Warhammer figurines remained untouched. I swear I could hear a voice whisper through the invisible force. Your secret's safe with me, my fellow nerd. Slowly turning to make my way upstairs, I thought, well, now I know I never need to piss off this particular geek. I'm sure he's going to save threatening me with letting this secret out when he wants a Back to the Future skateboard. As I made my way across the deck, the setting sun was almost blinding as it reflected off the river. Stumbling due to the temporary inability to see, I approached the table to find most of the crew already involved in a family chat. Thanks for waiting on me, guys. Can you feel the love? I heard my dad over the radio as I drew closer. And Dr. George? Brother Brown's wife is a nurse practitioner. She started helping out at the clinic and people seemed pretty happy. I guess she could be the medicine man for now. He didn't sound pleased as he said this. The fact that the oracle remained stone-faced didn't make it sit well with me. The cardiologist smiled and said something I didn't catch when Jean emerged from below deck. He came to the table at an asthmatic sprint and huffed. How's Hunter? I knew he had been thinking of the boy he had adopted since the death of Georgia. My dad came back. He's doing really well. Debbie has him talking now, only tells jokes from Laffy Taffy rappers. He groaned. But at least it's something. I knew where Hunter got this trait. My mother has always loved Laffy Taffy jokes. She must be saving the Bazooka Joe lines for a rainy day. I'm sure that will get the boy to come out of his shell. Jokes that are not the slightest bit funny to anyone above the age of six, and she can barely tell them without breaking into uncontrollable fits of laughter. Seriously, she is doubled over and barely retaining consciousness when she tells you what kind of birds stick together. Velcros. I guess it really is an improvement. The boy didn't speak after the death of his father, Daniel. When Georgia, his mother, was murdered by the betrayer, the young boy completely closed himself off from any sort of interaction with anyone. He may only be quoting retarded lines from candy wrappers, but it's a big leap. The tech almost thanked my dad. That's great. Can he tell me one? 
My dad clicked his tongue. I'm sure he would. He's out with Mama feeding the chickens. My eyes grew wide. What? I said he's with Debbie. No, you didn't. I heard what you said. Daddy is only supposed to call my mother Mama when she's doing something with one of her children. She's my Mama, not Hunter's. He made a noncommittal noise and I just let it go. I knew I would never get him to admit what I knew he said. I changed subjects. So what about the girl that went missing? Anything yet? No. Nobody's in the water, no sign. Damn, Daddy, morbid much? And another girl went missing yesterday. No trace. Blonde, just like the other one. He grew disgusted. And Brother Brown has pretty much accused us of being at fault for it. I was confused. Us? Me and your mama. I cocked an eyebrow. But he thinks you're the kidnappers? He chuckled through his derision. I doubt he thinks it. Of course we're not, but he is indirectly pointing at us. I knew Mama wasn't around, so I could get by with a four-letter word. What the hell for? I think he's trying to get people on his side and off ours. He must be positioning himself to make a power play. You mean this guy's going to stage a coup? It was hard to believe people would turn on the guy that pretty much got the island up and running. Actually, never mind. I'm the guy that got that ball rolling. I know somebody would find it easy to assassinate me, but Randy Collins made Gunnersville better on top of everything I did. And I didn't do a lot, really. He exhaled. It won't be too hard, the way he has everybody wrapped around his finger. Smokes glanced back at the forever young to our rear, still visible in the fading daylight, and then looked at me. We got to get, dog. I put my hands on my hips, pissed at myself. I forgot to even mention the ship following us. Oh well, I'm sure he didn't have anything to tell us either. I took the radio from my brother and spoke. Well, Daddy, we're going to have to get out of this port. We'll talk later. The entire crew called their farewells. My father signed off. Roger. Gray Fox over and out. Fifteen. Memoirs of Benji 2. Part 1. Comic Relief. Gene said if we needed anything, we should take a look in here. Well, can't hurt. Hasn't so far. I was attempting to convince my girlfriend, Amy Rice, that what we sought would be inside Excelsior Comics. The girl hadn't seen things play out as of yet like the rest of us, as if our new existence is just some fucked up movie. I didn't blame her for her lack of faith. Eventually, she would see these miracles, divine acts or whatever you want to call them as part of the plan. You're always where you're always supposed to be, right? When she first made it known that she wanted to come with us on missions, I initially declined. Nobody wants to put a loved one in harm's way. After a couple of rounds of kicking this Asian dude's tail with her martial arts badassness, it seemed she could hold her own in a fight. We just needed to outfit her in something more protective than a tank top. Maybe Gene could be of some help to us, even though he was assuredly halfway down the Tennessee River at this point. It was a mystery if the tech knew what we would need or if he even put it there. Perhaps it spontaneously appeared, willed into that place and time when the writer of this screenplay saw fit. Unlocking the door with the key Randy gave me, we began moving to the back room. Did Devin know what we'd find? Maybe that's one reason he didn't offer to come along. One reason, anyway. Oh my god, I love it! I raised my eyebrows. Electra. I looked at the outfit, black vests, gloves, loincloth, and boots. This all accented the red leotard. Along with the get-up were the obligatory katana and accompanying pair of sai. Swiveling my head to Amy, I grinned. I think you need to try it on. She raised an eyebrow and gave a mischievous wink. Oh, that can be arranged. She grabbed the outfit from the rack and sprinted to the bathroom. Looking back, I don't know why the hell she didn't just change right there, or why she even bothered putting clothes on at all. Nobody could see in, and it's not like there were any cameras. Wait a minute, I forgot where we were. I took a quick look around at all of the posters and superhero characters staring at us from the store shelves. It wouldn't surprise me if Gene had his hidden security camera satellite linked to one of his iPads on the Cora, watching us right now. Amy appeared outside the bathroom door, 
wearing the outer parts of the costume she must have forgotten to put on the leotard. Lowering both hands to her hip-high boots to lift her weapons, she ordered me with a smirk. Put him up! Both three-pronged sigh were raised, threateningly. Reaching inside my coat to my hip, I joked. Don't make me get the whip out again. She dropped her weapons and ran at me with arms spread. Just as ready, I caught her in her leap. The face covering wasn't raised, so I had access. I locked with her in a deep, passionate kiss as I began shrugging my coat to the floor. Amy started pulling off the gloves that went almost all the way up her arms. No, leave those on. And the boots. She guffawed, unclipping her loincloth that barely covered anything anyway. Whatever turns your prop, flyboy. I don't think I need to tell you where this was going. If you haven't figured it out, ask your mama. And yes, I continued to wear the hat for the entire time. That one can be taken off my bucket list now. Afterward, we lay on the beanbags in front of one of the many TVs throughout the shop. Gesturing to her costume on the floor, I made a joking statement. You know Bradley is wearing the daredevil suit. She raised her eyebrows. And? And you're Electra. And? And? I raised up onto an elbow. You don't know anything about comics, do you? Well, no. It may have been childish, but that was a relief. Never mind, then. Whatever, stupid. She laughed. Hey, now, I don't want to teach you another lesson. Amy jumped up. Oh, yeah? Okay, I actually was in the mood to teach. She apparently was also in the mood to listen or learn. After a while, the two of us found ourselves collapsed in another pair of beanbag chairs. Watching her slip back into the skin-tight outfit nearly made me want to take it off her again. Somehow restraining myself, we rose and ready to exit the Excelsior. I was now satisfied with her uniform in more ways than one. Sixteen. Memoirs of Benji Two. Part Two. Alive Inside. Rounding the corner into the open airplane hangar bay with Amy at my four o'clock, I spoke loudly. Though I hadn't looked, I was sure Devin could hear. Yeah, you're gonna have to learn to fly. That way we won't even have to take him anymore. My girlfriend barely contained a laugh. Can't be too hard. After all, he is your co-pilot. The only other naval flight officer I knew to be alive gave a sarcastic fake laugh. Ha ha. As the two of us closed on him, he asked the question as if it had been rehearsed. So, where are we going today? What was the point in this charade of allowing me to think I had any control? Widening my eyes and lowering my voice, I looked at him. What do you think? Stay along Highway 431 again? Shrugging, he smacked his lips, giving the appearance of contemplation. Should work. I'm glad we came to this decision before coming to a crossroads. It didn't take much thinking. The Crossroads Mall in Albertville was one of the significant landmarks in Marshall County that every local would know. The mall part of the building seemed insanely small compared to most modern shopping malls. There were large department stores and even a grocery store attached. All of this made the main building pretty massive, which made it even more dumbfounding that the shopping mall area was so minuscule. The now-closed Mall Garden Theater, two big screens and a building to the rear, finished up the layout. The entire complex sat on a small hill with the parking lot falling away down toward the highway. For my entire life, the place had been dead, even though the movie theater functioned until I was a teenager. According to my parents, the place was hopping decades ago, you know, with their rock and roll music, bowler hats, and their crazy talkies. I grinned at him, getting him to affirm my realization. Think we could catch a movie at the crossroads? Writing this just gave me chills. Crossroads is also the name of the mall in the 2004 adaptation of Dawn of the Dead. Nodding vigorously, he smiled from ear to ear. I think we can find a couple. I guess that settled it. That wasn't there the last time we came through here. I had gasped out. No, but it's there now. Devin didn't say it, but Amy and I knew he was thinking about it, and we are duty-bound to investigate. My girlfriend was quiet, just looking over our shoulders. She was surprised to see signs of more survivors. Could they be some of the fellows from her original group? Or maybe survivors similar to another group she had run into? Was it as much fear as surprise? 
There was no ignoring the plea for assistance. It was apparent that regardless of any hidden intent, non-infected people were living in the Crossroads Mall. I made a low buzz over the mall to let the survivors know that we saw the message painted on the roof. Help. Alive inside. I didn't think there would be, but there was more than enough room to land our small Cherokee on the highway in front of the mall. It initially didn't look like we'd have room between the sets of red lights stretching over the four-lane. I know we could have landed in the mall parking lot. It was certainly empty as it always was. Regardless, I didn't want to land the plane on a 60-degree slope. Our tiny single engine came to rest directly between the ABC liquor store and the entrance to the Albertville Cemetery on the opposite side of the highway. Don't even think about it. Nothing could have made me go to the damn graveyard. I know there wouldn't be undead climbing out of the mausoleums, but cemeteries after any apocalypse are just fucking creepy. There wasn't any reason to enter a field full of dead people anyway. The reclaimers had already completely emptied the liquor store at the entrance to the parking lot. Are you surprised? I wasn't able to tell if they had been through Save-A-Lot, Dollar General, or any of the other smaller department stores in the mall from down here. We began our slow trudge up the exaggerated incline between the liquor store and an old blockbuster video building. Walking up the parking lot, which seemed more near to a sheer cliff, there were no more than three damn cars to take cover behind. Any survivors slash sadists slash murdering clowns remaining had seen our approach. Theatrically, I kept my hands visible, not wanting to get shot before I got to the door. Wind whistling was a strange sound in what had been a reasonably active city until recently. These people didn't seem to be very active. No movement could be seen anywhere in the immediate area of the Crossroads Mall. 17. Beanie Weenie Coming into contact with a band of survivors less than a mile from the small apartment complex he was living in was the last thing Neil had expected. He had never checked for humans at the Crossroads Mall. Being a castaway in what was once a densely populated area of North Alabama wasn't comfortable, but sure as hell he'd been making do, still alive in his tiny apartment. Though it never meant anything to Neil, the landlady, Mrs. Jackson, had been at the complex doing a random check-in on May 5th. She'd been pushing around the maintenance supply cart that held cleaning solutions such as bleach when the peavies arrived. She let go of the rolling cart so that she could run away faster. It just so happened to end up in front of Neil's apartment door. Unknown to him, a jug of disinfectant turned over and spilled onto the carpeted hallway floor. Beanie weenies and stale saltine crackers weren't great, but he grew accustomed to the taste. All Neil could do was snicker at the thought of all those people like Mrs. Jackson and his parents that said he was stupid for stocking up on those staples. There's better food you could buy, they said. Yeah, there was, but look who's not blue naked and not hungry. One day while enjoying the peace of quiet of his solitude, Neil was sitting in a chair on the second story landing with his arms hanging over the railing. When something caught his eye, he froze. What came into his view was a happily surprising yet terrifyingly horrible sight. It was a human, with clothes and everything. Propping his scoped rifle in front of him, he yelled, trying to sound as badass as he could. Stop! Jim Glenn was the traveler with a gun pointed at him. The newcomer convinced Neil, after some seemingly endless negotiation, that his intentions weren't hostile. Jim eventually persuaded the lone apartment dweller of his peaceful nature, allowing him to approach so he could tell him the truth. When he explained that he was part of a large group of survivors living in the Crossroads Mall, Neil was shocked. He was more than a little angry at himself for not realizing other non-infected people were living so close by. It didn't take much convincing and Neil was down the stairs and headed to the mall with Jim. After only a few days of living with his group of humans, he felt at home. But after being alone for so long, Neil was still somewhat awkward. Being around people, especially girls, was something he'd have to get used to again. This was surprising to the man who sat in his apartment for what felt like a lifetime, thinking he was the sole survivor. The others didn't even question him about food. He would have been happy to share the beanie weenies and crackers, but there was a grocery store attached to the mall. Anything Save-A-Lot had to offer would be on the menu for a considerable time. Despite the cornucopia, the survivors scavenged food if the opportunity presented itself. 
Walking past the inner door to the small Papa John's pizza parlor attached to the Crossroads Mall, Neil had a hankering for pizza. Or at least, he told himself, some pizza sauce on a stale cracker. Let's see what we can find in here. He gestured to Jim to follow him inside. Rifling through the storage area, Neil finally saw what he was looking for in a dark cabinet. Aha! Standing on a chair to reach the back of one of the high shelves, he grabbed an enormous sealed number 10 can of pizza sauce. Both hands wrapped around what he sought, he pulled it close to him. In his haste and the low light, he hadn't noticed a glass jar just as enormous. His elbow hit it, causing it to tip over and began rolling off the shelf. It went off the edge along with any sneakiness Neil was hoping for. A full jar of pickled jalapenos crashed onto the hard tile. It exploded, sending pickled pepper rings and juice everywhere. The glass shattered, but nobody called for assistance. Neil probably just knocked over some cups or something. That was Jim's first thought. Then the aroma hit him. He sniffed. Something tangy. Something vinegar. Oh, shit! Jim burst into the back room. Dude, what the fuck? Neil shrugged and hefted his giant can of pizza sauce. It's all right, man. It was just a jar of peppers. But hey, look what I got. Having been alone in his apartment, Neil had never seen the PV's crazed attraction to vinegar. Also, he never had a reason to suspect any other solutions would repel them, not knowing that he may have just doomed every living person in the mall. Nothing could prepare them for what was coming. Having stayed alive this long in this new world, Jim wasn't ignorant. Do you know what you just done? There was no need for a cry of alarm, call for others to help clean up the mess, or even lecturing the offender. Positioning themselves to fight off the horde of coming revenants was the next logical move. Eighteen. Memoirs of Benji Two. Part Three. Crossroads. We were halfway across the parking lot when Devin paused and glanced up at the portico over the entrance to the mall. Keeping stride beside him, I similarly stopped. Looking over at my co-pilot as this happened, my eyes followed his, tensing. I prepared for something terrible. Holding my hand, Amy stopped when I squeezed it. Something was unfolding. When our feet came to rest, we immediately heard just what I didn't want to. Animalistic barks, howls, and yipping coming from almost every direction. Why? I spoke to Ghost Rider. Did we do that? He was slightly shaking his head to the negative. It was almost imperceptible, but I caught it. As I looked back and forth from him to the box-like structure up the hill, several figures appeared in the small space between the roof and the rest of the entrance cover. Suddenly a voice from above us commanded, Move it! Just before a half dozen rifles fired. Obviously they weren't shooting at us or the three of us would be dead several times over. Rounds were intended for the incoming lunatic horde behind us. For some reason we automatically kept our heads down and raced toward the glass doors of the main entrance. A middle-aged woman opened the door and allowed us to enter, locking it again when we got inside. I sat down on a bench, out of breath and began contemplating. The woman just stood there, seemingly completely unguarded. We could have come here to rape and murder her entire group. So how do you know? She interrupted. How do I know you're friendlies? Well, you did touch down in an airplane. I raised my eyebrows, about to protest, but she cut me off. And I know that don't mean shit, but you flew over to let us know you were coming. What kind of bad guy's gonna do that? I shrugged, opening my mouth, but she again continued. Plus, she smiled, pointing at my hat. You're Indiana Jones. It didn't seem she recognized Devin dressed as Ghost Rider, and for all she knew, Amy wearing the red leotard and black accessories of Electra could have been just a freaky chick taking the end of the world a little too far. Slowly nodding my head, I understood that much. Okay, what about the peavies? What's got them riled? My question ended as the door from Papa John's Pizza burst open. A chubby guy walked out, wavering under the imposing gaze of another guy walking out behind them. They both glanced in our direction before moving back deeper into the mall. At the time, I didn't know these two or why one of them looked knowingly guilty. They went to the stairs leading to the roof. I would find that out shortly. Priscilla Peters was the name of the lady that ushered us in. 
It didn't seem Amy knew this group or that they knew her. Strange how so many different bands of survivors could live in such close proximity but be entirely ignorant of others. Was this just a local phenomenon or did things happen like this everywhere? According to Priscilla, this group was huge compared to any I had come across thus far. A solid thirty-six people. Thirty-seven. Priscilla raised a finger. When Julie Wilcox has her son, thirty-one of us can defend. She gestured to the rifle over her shoulder as she smiled. Regardless of what Tim thinks, there's only thirty-one. As she continued, she started moving to the stairwell. Then there's the three of you. Willing to lend a helping hand had instantly made us upstanding Samaritans. The three of us arose to follow. Lining the Sears store on the left were beds, bunk beds, and even the occasional pallet. They had turned the abandoned retail space into military-style barracks. Well, at least as close to military style as post-Armageddon civilians could get. Housing for the young and infirm must have been in a store somewhere deeper inside the mall. Unexpectedly, the stairs didn't lead all the way to the roof. The mall was only one floor, but with high ceilings throughout, it was technically more than one story. We climbed the stairs to the second floor landing and were faced with a metal ladder going up. What I would compare to an opened manhole lay between us and the top of the building. The four of us dropped into a single file line and climbed up the rungs. Standing in the natural light, I shielded my eyes for a moment and did a quick 360, which allowed me to take in my surroundings. There were probably portals similar to this from at least the large department stores throughout the mall, but I wasn't going to check. Twenty-four souls peeked out over the edge of the roof, rifles at the ready. Those six rifles in the portico made up for the others. Priscilla finished off the thirty-first. Then there were the three of us adding our numbers to it. One would think a small army protecting a castle on a hill opposing an enemy made solely of naked blue lunatics with absolutely no weapons would have no problem winning the battle. In theory, anyway. The flesh-eating crazies were coming to the front and the back of the building. Even so, it should have been a piece of cake wiping the floor with them. But then again, this movie has to be entertaining, right? Now imagine countless attackers, high on cocaine, running full tilt from every direction. Even with the twenty-five defenders breaking up to protect the front and back entrances to the mall, the blue tide could not have been stopped. Spectacular as some of the defenses might have been, this group of survivors was protecting more than themselves on the roof. Looking over the heads of the crouching defenders, I watched as the rabid monsters came closer and closer. Suddenly a single rifle fired from the portico. That's when I noticed a glass Dr. Pepper bottle on top of one of the three cars in the giant parking lot explode. The container, unknown to me at the time, had obviously been full of vinegar. A section of the zombie horde angled as one to the treat that had been set out in front of them. This group of survivors was apparently similar to Moe's crew. That was clear when the car erupted into a giant ball of fire and fragmented Detroit steel. There must have been some technical genius in the group near the front of the building flipping a switch, pressing a button, or pushing a plunger. Boom! What had to be hundreds of the evil creatures were simultaneously obliterated. For several yards around the automobile, PV simply disintegrated. As they instantly turned into a fine mist, it was only wishful thinking they could have felt the pain longer. Do you think those nearest the explosion were even able to hear it? Regardless, there was definitely no time to react before they were destroyed. And still somehow shit was everywhere. Even after all this time without proper nutrients, they were able to drench almost every inch of the parking lot they touched with black tar. I would imagine being at the bottom of that hill would have been like drowning in a pool of black silly putty. I cringed at the thought. It was insane to see the amount of death initiated by just a few ounces of vinegar. The catastrophic play was acted out twice more with the other cars in the parking lot. Morbid delight was my failing when PV started coming from around the building to join their brethren in fiery, horrific ends. I'm sure the Blue Grim Reaper had his hands full today. Ignorantly, the monsters continued to charge at the tasty morsels now exploded and laying on top of the automobiles. They could see their fellows consumed by debris in the massive fireball. It was beyond understanding why they would walk into the next obvious booby trap. Obviously, their mind-numbing hunger for the fermented solution came above everything else. Uncountable creatures had violently met the end of their unlives in only a few minutes. Just a few million more to go. 
The building containing the mall garden theaters stood directly behind the mall, attached by a short breezeway. There were exits to the rear parking area of the mall on either side of this breezeway before you entered the theater building. As the lunatics poured out of the woods and overgrowth beyond the rear parking lots, the defenders knocked glass bottles off the ledge near either back door. I assumed correctly. These bottles were full of alcohol, bleach, or one of the other disinfectants that would cause the lunatics to steer clear. Both groups of ghouls visibly slowed when affronted with the hated aroma. The broken bottles only gave the survivors inside a little bit of time. There were other ways into the theater, when the only thing standing between them and delicious victory would be a few panes of glass the peavies weren't going to be stopped. More than once the monsters had been seen using tools to break through obstacles. Those being guarded inside, the sick, young or the elderly would soon be in the thick of battle. Every single rifle on the roof not on the portico was now at the back of the building. We were exploding infected knees, sending reanimated gray matter in all directions, and spilling diseased organs onto the asphalt. But the walkers continued gaining ground. We may have been losing it, but we were making them pay for every fucking inch in blood and guts. Priscilla mumbled under her breath. Shit, there it goes. She saw the same thing I did. A PV carrying what looked to be a metal fence post was running full bore toward the glass entrance of the mall garden theaters. One of the defenders was able to hit it in the stomach, assuring its real death. But it was too late. The blue battering ram ran headlong into the glass door, shattering it with a loud crash. The runner would never see its completed work, but all of the other PVs in the parking lot heard and saw the glass break. Instantly, there were hundreds of cannibal nudists charging into the broken doorway, flooding the upper area of the mall. We weren't the only two that gazed upon impending doom. A woman wearing a blood-red shirt screamed at the top of her lungs, My babies! She threw her rifle over her shoulder, arose, and madly dashed for the ladder that led down to the ground level. The woman struggled free from the others holding her back, not bothering to halt her climb down the ladder as her fellows yelled at her to stop. Crying out her children's names was all she could do as several others followed her down the rungs. Taking a step back, I tried to watch this scene as a casual moviegoer would, with no connection to any of these expendable characters. Hadn't I seen this film before? I want a refund. I glanced at Amy, who was nodding in agreement. We knew what must be done. I swiveled my head around to Landers and raised an eyebrow. Extras? I soundlessly mouthed. If I hadn't been looking directly at him, I would have missed his nearly imperceptible nod. Turning back to my girlfriend in the crimson leotard accented with black, I directed her forward with my eyes. Come on, we all know what happens to red shirts. Walking forward, she looked at me questioningly. As if it had been scripted, every single defender not on the portico dove headfirst into impending doom. Standing at the manhole, my co-pilot gestured for me to be the first of the three visitors down the ladder. Because he approved, I hurried down, standing with the others. Why the hell do I always think that his approval means I'll be okay? Maybe I'm supposed to meet my end this time. Would he allow that? Well, the fact that I'm writing this and you're reading it means I must have made it. As our small forest made it to the ground floor and rounded the corner, there were more crazed lunatics flowing in from the theater entrance. There were multiple undead climbing, pulling, and attempting to lift the roll gate down over the entrance to one of the very last stores in the mall near the theaters. Children were crying and wailing from within, mixed with the frustrated screams and rabid barking from outside the cage. Less than an inch of fortification stood between the peavies and their food. They would do anything to satiate their unquenchable thirst for flesh and blood. It's hard to call anything pure luck anymore. I guess you could say it was advantageous that the store housing the children was located where it was. The Crossroads Mall was on a hill, from front to back. At the rear of the main hall, at the top of the hill were the theaters, which stood higher than the entrance. Just past halfway in was a series of three long ramps, paralleling stairs which patrons would have used to move smoothly up or down the concourse, one level at a time. We came around the corner of what would be the center of the mall with the ramps and stairs to our left. The peavies were on the upper levels, flooding toward the store where the innocents were housed. The children behind the cage had moved into the rear of the store. Not having to worry about accidentally shooting anyone in the store, our group was free to fire at will on the enemy. Taking position behind benches or against planters, the defenders opened up. 
Fate looked to be on our side, at least for the moment. Peavies were dropping with each round sent in their direction. Having no real cover, they didn't realize where the fire was coming from at first. Their only option was to withdraw tactically. Not being able to retreat to any of the other stores which were all locked down, some ran into nearby hallway leading to the bathrooms. Most attempted to escape back into the theater. Untold numbers of bodies lined the floor. Burned in my mind is the part of the battle that happened when we rounded the first corner before the zombies were aware that we were firing high-velocity lead at them. As the monsters clamored to reach the children, protected by the metal security gate, they were climbing one on top of the other. One of the attackers was directly above another when one of the first bullets from our group grazed the upper zombie in the front of its thigh, an undoubtedly painful but not a mortal wound. After clipping the closest leg, the round sliced through its scrotum. With the peavies being so malnourished and wasted, genitals were usually at least even with this monster's thigh muscles. It wasn't important now what happened to the bullet. I was too morbidly interested with those shriveled blue balls. Infected testicles popped like shrunken blue kiwis. Bloody cloudy slime dropped out, plopping onto the matted hair of the creature nearest the floor. It looked up as the gelatinous mass sloughed to the ground behind it. Just as it raised its head like a turkey in the rain, the tiny balls spilled out of the sack of the above revenant. One of them merely bounced off its forehead and rolled away. Guess where the other one went? It dropped straight into the mouth and must have continued down the throat. But some bitch swallowed a nut. Even if I had been firing already, I would have had to stop and just blink. I wasn't sure if I should be grabbing my own nuts, sickened or just plain weirded out. How long would you have to go to counseling if that was you? It could have been that it didn't realize, but it probably didn't care what just happened. The scourge acted like it was just another day in the neighborhood, continuing to climb around and shake the mesh violently. The creature should have fucking thanked me for the 556 five, round I sent through its rotten brain. Asriel 2 the AC-130 gunship I capped into Gunnersville had chain-fed guns on it, so I was used to automatic fire. But so many different calibers of rifles going off continually and simultaneously felt strangely surreal. Countless and now truly dead reanimated corpses were extinguished in just the first few volleys. Even more of them met their blue maker as they attempted to flee. It appeared we were winning, driving the animals back. Of course, this entry would be much shorter if everything went smoothly. Suddenly, one of the older children on the other side of the security cage took the opportunity to send a shotgun blast at the enemy along with our rifle rounds. At about waist level, the blast ripped into a peavy still hanging onto the fencing. The animal received a stomach full of pellets and crashed in a bloodied heap. The scattergun wielder did what he set out to do. He also damaged a small part of the security gate. The ghouls realized this before we did. Being in the line of sight with a roll-down mesh, pieces of the thin barrier began to break and were being pulled back by the undead, widening the hole. Though the insane number of rounds spent pretty much deafened the majority of the defenders, several people cried out alarms. Stop the ones opening the mesh was the summarization of most of the shouts. Concentrating our fire on that small area wasn't enough. No longer having to worry about being shot in the back retreating, zombies were turning around from their theater retreat and racing back to the mall proper. They were basically standing in line, just waiting to get shot. One or two bodies would fall to be immediately replaced by a couple more. Slowly but surely, the opening in the gate was widening. Blue cadavers were even being used as cover by the nudist pillagers still functioning. They were piled so high that truly dead reanimated cannibals prolonged their still-living fellows' lives. So much lead passed through the cooling corpses that some of them no longer appeared even to be former humans. Bones shattered, blood and every other type of inhuman juice flooded the area. Dead bodies became nearly a blue paste to mix with the discolored fluid on the ground. Though I wanted to be sick, I had no time. Everything I had was required to keep the demons from the people inside. I don't guess time was on my side. The floor was now three feet deep with the massacred bodies of peavies. Somehow they were still pulling the cage open, one strand at a time, but the panicked shooter in the store pounded more buckshot into the beasts. Though it dropped the targeted enemy, this action was helping the other team as a whole. More and more of the insignificant fortification was steadily being eliminated, 
and with bare hands. As far as we knew, the zombies were aware that dinner was about to be served. Virginia Morrison, the woman in the crimson shirt, screamed something unintelligible to our overloaded ears and unexpectedly charged forward, the same direction the bullets were traveling. It was breathtakingly stupid. A few feet was as far as she got when she started taking rounds in the back. A bullet cut Virginia in the left elbow as her forearm was parallel with the floor. The round traveled through the bone, exploding her arm like a balloon for a brief second before the bullet reached the wrist, exploding her hand into hundreds of bone and muscle fragments. That was followed by a torrent of blood spraying out in front of her like a garden hose. The force of the impact spun her, peppering her right side with hot lead. It happened so fast most offenders weren't able to stop shooting before she'd already taken several fatal rounds. Thankfully, she was far enough to the right that none of my crew's shots hit her. Without a sound, she dropped, dead before she hit the floor. Firing immediately ceased as the others ran to their comrade, as if there was anything they could do to assist a bleeding-out corpse. Blue cannibals instantly and acutely picked up on the scent of uninfected, accessible, and fresh human blood. Nearly through the cage, their undead minds completely forgot about the living humans on the other side and instead focused on the free food only a few yards away. They also ignored the other humans had boomsticks. As the peavies were coming down the slope, they were charging with their usual lunatic ferocity and speed. They seemed to be running and fast forward. Here they come! I shouted to the idiots standing around the body. Did they choose this moment to prepare to fucking defend themselves? I could stop writing now because you can guess where this is going but I feel compelled to chronicle another horrific battle scene, if for no other reason than to learn from others' past mistakes. I learned the names of the fallen after the fact. Neil luckily survived to tell me some of the stories. Assuredly, he saw nothing good in this fortune. Perhaps, after decades of safety in Guntersville, he wouldn't feel guilty for being the only member of the Crossroads Mall residence to have made it. Maybe he would one day tell his grandchildren of how he was where he was supposed to be. What happened next in Neil's own words? Kevin Wright was trying to resuscitate Virginia. Of course he had no success. There was no telling why he was trying to do CPR on a woman that had more bullet holes in her than she had years in age. Every one of us looked up when you hollered out that the peavies were coming. All we could see was a tide of blue flesh and gnashing yellow teeth. As soon as I saw them, I started running backward. I began firing along with the others, sending off a couple of rounds. Then I decided it was best to save the ammo I had left for when things got too close for comfort. Crouching behind a planter, I was about to stand to look at the battle when it felt like a hand brushed across my shoulder. Looking back to see nobody, I questioned, What the hell? An explosion from more than one rifle made me stop. It turned out the fire wasn't from in front of me, it came from a different direction. Andrew Williams and the rest of the guys from within the portico had come inside to join the party. They came around the corner to the right and opened up on the damn zombies. A single trigger being pulled by one of the six caused a knee-jerk reaction, and multiple rounds flew at the enemy. The only problem was everybody else was caught in the crossfire. Undoubtedly more than one shot hit the charging monsters. Quite a few hit them only after passing through a friendly. A bullet from David Hall's rifle slammed into Chris Carter's back just above his left shoulder blade. The round punctured his heart before breaking through his chest cavity and spewing arterial blood on the floor in front of him. He dropped without another sound. If the bullet continued traveling very far, it wasn't noticeable. Standing at Chris's side, Shane Evans had turned just as the deadly round was fired from David's gun. He shouted in rage, David, what the fuck, man? David called back over the gunfire and screaming. I didn't mean to, it was an accident. I didn't know Shane or David very well, so if they were friends or there was bad blood between them, I couldn't say. Obviously, they had been close enough for Shane to ask for forgiveness of the thoughtless reaction. Shane snarled, angry at the death of the man beside him. He made a decision in the heat of the moment that was as quick and unthinking as David's. Oh yeah? Apologize to Chris when you see him. He then launched three rounds in David's direction. Two rounds sank into David on either side of his jugular. Arteries began pumping into the open air as the vital connection between the brain and the rest of the body was lost. Breathing or screaming would no longer be possible. 
David flailed in a panic at the wound in his neck before collapsing and growing still. He might get the chance to apologize to Chris. The third and final bullet missed David. Instead, it slammed into the side of the man closest to him. The piece of lead that ripped into Joseph Antosh's abdomen traveled cleanly, destroying several things necessary to prolong life. Joseph was stunned in the silence for a moment. He glanced down at the injury, then up at the man who made it and soundlessly moved his mouth. Finally, Joseph was able to speak. He seemed too shocked to be rash. Why? Shane was sincerely sorry. Shit, man, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. Again, Joseph seemed too surprised to be angry. Reading people was never my strong suit. Well, I guess you can apologize to David after he tells Chris how sorry he is. Joseph started firing his rifle, but after four shots I lost count. This whole series of events was becoming unbelievable. A round caught Shane in the top of the right hip. Before he could double over, the next round impacted him just below his sternum. His entire upper body seemed to fold in as he toppled onto his back. Before Shane even hit the floor, Joseph collapsed in a bloody heap and took his last breath. Blood began pooling around both human bodies. The peavies were elated. Four new courses had been laid out in front of them for their dining pleasure. As Neil had described, it was a bloodbath. There was no way to get a good count of the humans still standing. So many swarming zombies came rushing into chow down on the dead and bloodied bodies. It made getting a clear shot impossible. Living people screamed for help as they were grabbed and carried away. They knew that they would be slowly slaughtered. Even over the gunfire crying and the ever-present roaring of the undead, the slurping up of eviscerated organs, gulping down of scrambled gray matter, and the chewing of still warm body parts was somehow sickeningly noticeable. Looking over to my co-pilot, I fearfully shouted, The children! Before the sentence left my mouth, he was already up and moving. Just fucking kill me! Priscilla yelled from her vertical perch, being carried away by several lunatics. Trying to stay close with Devon, I could see her carriers were too far within the horde to be shot by the other residents. Just a few more steps up, she would be out of my sight. It pained me to do it, but I sent a three-round burst of 556 five, from my M4 at her head. She would no longer have to worry about watching her body parts being slowly carved up and masticated. More than one of the damn monsters couldn't resist a free lunch. Priscilla's carriers dropped her corpse and began ripping meat apart like starving orphans from Oliver Twist. Thank God I wasn't able to see what I could distinctly hear. Somehow I was able to make out the sound of ripping meat over the cacophony of the catastrophic chorus cluster fucking my ears. Had I just committed murder? Though it was the only merciful thing to do, I have to keep reminding myself that she's now at peace and would be thanking me. Were Dr. Kevorkian's patients thrilled getting what they sought? Was he able to sleep at night without their faces haunting him? One day maybe I'll have told myself that it was the right thing to do. Enough times to believe it. In the thick of battle, I couldn't focus on the loss or the guilt. I begrudgingly continued scanning the mass of undead, looking for any poor souls I could assist. Thankfully, I didn't find any. Glancing back, I noticed my girlfriend, Amy, right on my six. We hung close enough to the wall to be safely clear of incoming fire from behind us. Well, unless one of the friendly shooters inopportunely takes this moment to start having some kind of a seizure. There was one more level and an empty store before we reached the kids behind the security cage. Peavies had pulled back the thin fencing nearly to the point one could squeeze through. Maybe none of them were willing to slice themselves to ribbons on the severed steel. They were just ignoring the food trapped in the box when prepared meals presented themselves out in the open. Those inside were safe, at least as long as there were tastier dishes set out like a July 4th picnic. Damn the fates! Two of the children. Arya and Yobi, whose names we learned later clung to the inside of the damaged security gate. Arya, the younger girl in the farthest corner from us, was able to glimpse our approach. She looked back to the others. Someone's coming! She screamed. She immediately began worming her way out of the ragged opening. Help us! Help us! She was yelling at us, but before she made it halfway through, a sharp piece of metal gashed her leg. She wasn't the only one to immediately notice the cut. The kid squealed and launched herself back into the store. She was now protected by the security gate with a gaping hole in it. 
The injury was on her lower thigh just above her left knee. It ran like a faucet. Even before being pulled to the back of the store, I could see her socks starting to become soaked in blood. Peavies hooted and howled in delight. A fresh plate of veal had been served. When they turned as one to face the store, the three of us started unloading on the ones leading the charge. Our backup thankfully and wisely decided to stop shooting and move up. Either that or they just ran out of ammo. Our rate of fire decreased to that of only three rifles. The ebb in the number of rounds being sent at the enemy would decide the battle. Emptying mag after mag, we weren't able to stem the tide. Zombies continued rushing at the improvised entrance. Finally, the three of us simultaneously dropped our rifles on slings, closing on the horde. Time for a brawl. Two of us were both able to keep some distance from the lunatics. Devin was equipped with his logging chain and I had my bullwhip. Amy, though, had to get up close and personal to stab and slice with her katana and sigh. For some reason, there was a sense of calm watching my girlfriend move into a massive undead herd. Unsure why, but I knew she would come out of it alive. As she came beside me, ready to charge forward, I smacked her leotard-covered ass. You ready for this? Smirking, she pulled both sigh from their holsters. Totally. Before she could start slinging blood, my co-pilot was slamming his heavy metal whip into the PVs nearest the ripped-open security door. He wasn't lassoing beasts, but merely slamming links into them. Several were knocked unconscious and surely received brain hemorrhages, while others received broken legs or hips. His chain was sent flying at one of the monsters moving to the hole. Solid steel impacted the side of the skull which broke open behind the ear, sending blood and gray matter trailing. The airborne animal came to a crashing heap against the cage, angled far from its intended destination. My weapon must have been magically augmented by the tech. The whip didn't simply lash targets, they just exploded upon impact. The unexplainable genius of Gene Stanley turned a tool used to corral livestock into a device of deviant death. The whip snapped in my hand, slamming into a former human that was running on all fours. When it was struck just below the ribs, meat and blood plumbed from the wound. For the briefest of seconds, I was certain I could see inside the gash before Crimson began squirting for several feet. The yellow-eyed creature collapsed in screaming agony. For all the unbelievable horrors of living infected, the fact that they are susceptible to pain is the one good thing when comparing them to classical reanimated shamblers. Why do they have to be so damn fast, though? With Lander standing at my left and both the weapons only being projected straight in front of us, Amy had a pretty wide field to lose gallons of infected blood. She jumped forward, extending her folded knees in front of her. She landed a blow into the crotch of a peavy. It had just stopped and turned to see the blonde girl in a red suit flying at it. An instant after rotating, Electra's knee came in contact with pelvic bones. Two sickening crunches could be heard before she drove the beast down. Lifting a three-pronged sigh with her right hand, she slammed it into the bridge of the nose. The body of the creep went rigid as both eyes and nose were all simultaneously pierced. Amy launched up, ready for more. Until this point, I had not realized our backup had moved forward, fighting the monsters hand to hand. They were slashing enemies with their machetes, stabbing at them with hunting knives, or simply beating them to mushy detritus with the butts of their rifles. Brittle, malnourished bones of the starving cannibals splintered and shattered under each brutal slam from their defenders. Regardless of the heavy amount of protective denim, flannel, and leather, every single guardian became infected, one after another. It grew obvious when zombies suddenly and visibly ignored each defender. Speaking volumes of each man's character, they continued fighting. One of the fighters fought valiantly until the end. I later found out from Neil that he was John Carter, the brother of Chris Carter who had just died in the crossfire incident. As he fought, the open mouth of a nudist caught just inside John's glove as he struck it with a billy club. Filthy teeth pierced his skin and tore open the radial artery so cleanly he barely noticed any pain. When the glove began filling with blood, he cleared the crimson enough to make out what happened. John was a doomed man who knew the score and that there was little time. Charging into the horde of monsters, he slammed his club into every beast he could reach. He used his gushing hand to stab and slice into the backs of the revenants, completely overlooking him 
and kicked in blue knees or smashed infected toes into oblivion. It was easy to see that John was growing weaker by the second with the fountain of blood shooting from his glove. He made it just to the right of the line of my bullwhip. He got a glimpse of the innocent still protected in the store and smiled like his death would now mean something. I also learned later that his nieces and nephew were behind the cage. He could now die in peace thinking he'd saved his brother's children. Turning back into the swarm, he let out a final war cry and launched his weakening body at the coming blue wave, disappearing in the horde. Though John did nothing to save anyone that day, I was glad he was satisfied in his final moments. I watched as my girlfriend in the Electra outfit moved through the horde. Her fluid and precise motions were almost hypnotizing. Severed blue limbs pouring gallons of stinking, infected blood lay all around her. Her sigh flew impossibly fast, leaving several sets of three small punctures and multiple reanimated corpses. She wasn't in direct line with the opening of the store, and the amount of lunatics between her and the cage meant that she was in no immediate danger. I wasn't sure if she couldn't hear over the hungry howling of zombies rushing the security door. It could have been the wailing of humans already infected, or the death rattles of the eviscerated infected she left in her wake but she seemed completely ignorant of the double-aught buckshot booming from within the store. Unless the shooter had some sort of chain-fed automatic shotgun, I wish he would have stuck the barrel through the damn hole. Sending rounds through the mesh was only giving the PVs more possible entries. With the thin fencing being obliterated, it was easy to see the fight was surely being lost. It was sickening to even think the blue team was going to be victorious yet again. Even with their ever-dwindling numbers, there was nothing we could do. Glancing over to my downtrodden co-pilot, my body temperature immediately rose. I could see only defeat in his mournful stare. Why the fuck? There's nothing we can do? Devin didn't answer. He only clenched his jaw and continued hammering zombies with his logging chain. Maybe it was supposed to be. Perhaps the one survivor from the catastrophic losses would eventually make it all worth it. During our trip back to Gunnersville, over the roar of the plane engine, Neil told me a little more of his story. The group from the portico was being decimated. I moved back until I was against the wall you and Landers were standing against. The crazies were interested in all the idiots standing around, at least until they bit them. So I decided to move up to you guys before the peavies bit everyone and started looking elsewhere. Of all the survivors, over half of them continued fighting. Everyone else stood around crying and otherwise being worthless. How would most people react upon being given just a few hours to live? More bitten defenders than I could count shortened their eight hours, either with pistols or hunting knives. Tom Marvin and Dan Telfer put a revolver in their mouths and pulled the trigger. Wrapping their lips around the barrels, their heads simply evaporated from above the lower jaw. It must have had something to do with the pressure. There wasn't even a gory explosion. Bone, blood, brains, and every other fluid in the cranium simply turned into pink mist. Sadly, I had to watch my first acquaintance of the Crossroads Mall, Jim Glenn, place a sawed-off shotgun under his chin and pull both triggers. Sheer horror of the scene will haunt me forever. Paul Carnegie, Kirby Richard, along with several others, made their suicides a more spectacular event. Placing revolvers or semi-automatics to their temples, they mumbled out a few final words before squeezing their triggers. Instantly upon entering the brain casing, the bullet liquefied gray matter upon contact. A large chunk of skull surrounding the entry violently separated from the rest of the head and crashed to the hard floor several feet away. Watery remains leaked out of the entry and gaping exit wounds created less than a heartbeat later. These explosions gruesomely destroyed half of the upper head. A half moon of destroyed cranium flew in all directions. Hearts continued pumping blood to brains that no longer rested inside skulls. A growing pool of crimson on the floor only added to the macabre scene in the Crossroads Mall. I've always heard women don't like to kill themselves with firearms, but instead choose to slit their wrists or to swallow pills. You know something dramatic and poetic? Alina Lanskew, Annie Poloni, Melody Barnhart, and a bunch of other women in the group sank to their knees in tears and sliced deep vertically. Holy shit, these bitches were hardcore. I don't know if any of them were experienced, but you could literally see the fucking bone and tendons in the wrist of a couple of them. They sat up with their backs against the wall. Rested hands on knees, palms up, and simply grew weaker, 
until finally the gushing faucet of their wrists became slow trickles. Almost all the ladies smiled, glad it was finally over as they faded away. After watching multiple individuals kill themselves in rapid succession, I attempted to shake it off and keep my sanity. Moving up to your backs, I could plainly see that any of the defenders left alive were infected, or at least on their way out. Most of the fighters made sure it would be with a bang. Without speaking to you or Landers, I stepped up on your right and lifted the pistol from my hip. My only melee weapon was a simple hunting knife. It seemed wiser to keep my distance while I could. Leveling my aim, I started emptying the mag into the blue cannibals. My girlfriend interrupted his story. Like, you could have shot me. Smiling, he turned. No, I made sure to keep the muzzle well away from you. I might be stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Neil grinned. She huffed. For reals. He only chuckled before getting back into his story. As I fired, a round sank into a peavy's malnourished gut, exited out the lower back, and entered another sunken belly. The first bastard collapsed. Apparently the spinal cord had been damaged. Its fellow, though, received the hot lead at a lower velocity. The bullet broke the abdominal wall and must have bounced around to destroy most of the digestive system. An excruciating pain would be its final memory. Looking over to my right, I watched in awe as Amy jumped into the air, spinning like a tornado of steel and blonde hair. Her katana cleanly beheaded some of the taller monsters and simply sliced open the craniums of shorter infected. Bodies continued moving forward while the tops of skulls popped like, like cans of spoiled sardines. The mushy, rotten hamburger meat that came away with the lid spilled onto the floor. Brain casings held a majority of contents for a few more steps before the zombies realized something was missing. They looked up as if to be able to see the tops of their heads before falling over, dumping the rest of the cracked and scrambled rotten egg onto the floor. I could see that the herd was thinning, but were somehow managing to keep pushing closer to the protected ones behind the fencing. From my angle, the mesh appeared to have been weakened so much by the friendly shotgun blasts, it would pose no real obstacle to any PV. They had the numbers. All they needed was one uninterrupted rush to break through the security mesh and have a box full of defenseless prey. With Landers and Neil at either side, we started moving up. We had seen so much death that day, all we could think about was getting to the children. They knew we were coming, but couldn't yet see us from within the cage. So the frantic wailing of the helpless little kids drowned out all other sounds. It was nearly painful to listen to the cries of children who had barely begun to live, scream with certainty that they would soon be dead. Calling to them would only bring more panic and we were almost within sight. Just before we could see the individuals in the store, Neil went flying forward, the wind knocked out of him. The pistol in his hand went flying behind him. Instantly I noticed a blue figure, full body tackling the survivor. I spun on my heel and pulled the K-bar from my belt. Noticeably out of the corner of my eye, Devin kept his feet planted, with his body facing forward. The demonic nudist had come from seemingly nowhere and was trying to rip the thick jacket from our new friend's back. Strange thing was that it was acting so unthinkingly. Lately they had seemed more collected, planned, and prepared. To now see one now acting as if it were any other stupid animal nearly gave me pause. Nearly. In a flash, I slammed my blade into the base of the neck and drug it downwards. The animal momentarily flailed before going slack and letting loose a final blackish foam from its weeping anus, leaking onto Neil's pants in the floor. Good thing his camouflage jacket was waterproof, as thick infected blood gushed over it and onto the floor. Brushing off the fresh cadaver, he rose, shaken after just being attacked. Thankfully not bitten, he would certainly be changing pants before getting in my airplane. Looking up, I could see the chain from Ghost Rider impacting an infected's cranium. Deprived for so long of sufficient nutrients, the skull burst like a rotten cantaloupe. Pulpy, stringy juices rolled out, making a stomach-turning plop on the floor even before the body collapsed into a shitting pile. The thick, gelatinous liquid formed a pool under the leaking body. Before I could again bring my wits to bear, or Neil could reach down for his lost handgun, the monsters began sleuthing through the broken security door. Landers was able to kill or immobilize some, but a few were able to get past his chain. Even if Amy noticed, or if I had called out to her, she wouldn't have been able to make it the several feet and prevent the breach. Could Devin not have stopped this? 
I seriously wanted to fucking kill him. After the battle, I understood there could be many possibilities why he allowed this to happen. His eyes were downcast and his jaw was clenched. He knew what he had done. I will explain why my co-pilot allowed children to be murdered. Don't hate him yet, but you can bet your ass I did at the time. Three cannibals made it through the fencing in the blink of an eye. Our trio started running forward as I spat out my distaste. Motherfucker! Though I wasn't looking at him, Devin surely knew my remark was directed his way. At least I hope so. Panic seemed to silence the crying. That's perplexing if you think about it. The group of humans inside quieted as death drew nearer. Unexpectedly, a shotgun started exploding and the screams of terror rang out. It seemed like the shooter inside the store had a few more shells. Once everything grew quiet and we finished off the last few lunatics still outside the gate, we headed for the opening. Rounding the corner, my co-pilot stepped in and then relaxed. Over to one side, a young boy holding a shotgun came into view. Not knowing why, the kid was screaming at a dazed geriatric across the room. Devin clicked his tongue at the exact moment the boy began rotating in our direction. Before he could turn to face us, a PV filled his vision and his pump shotgun boomed. Muzzle already extended, the shot looked pretty tight. Everything above the lower jaw disappeared into a thick, reddish vapor. The body continued charging for a few more heartbeats before finally collapsing into a bleeding pile. Along with the body, the fragments of cranium were pushed forward with explosive momentum. Losing connection to the brain, muscles continued to fire at random. A cloud of infected juice had no limitations as it pushed forward, hitting the boy in the face just as he inhaled. There was nothing he could do. He knew. Blood was the taste in his mouth, and he smacked disgustedly. We also knew it. His face was covered in what had once been an infected brain. Wiping his face with the tail of his shirt, he sat down. Looking at us, he placed the shotgun wisely over his knees. There would be no more friendly fire from him. The third and final insane cannibal came around a chair, rushing at Neil. At this short distance and angle, neither myself nor Ghost Rider were able to use ranged weapons. Neil lifted the bowie knife from his hip, preparing to go hand to hand. The beast leaped into the air and spear-tackled the survivor before he could bring his blade to bear. The knife went flying when he impacted the floor. Fighting with nothing but his gloved hands, holding the emaciated revenant off was more difficult than he assumed. In such close proximity of quenching its thirst for blood, the PV's strength was magnified. Getting both of Neil's hands in its own, the monster began pushing his arms apart. Smiling with insane glee, it knew what was happening. Pulling my combat knife, I turned to step over to save Neil. Devin turned casually to watch, hands in his pockets. I was still a few feet away when the animal rose up with its gaping maw. Before it could bring its fangs down on the man, three stakes stuck through the roof of its mouth. Blinking, I looked over to see Amy walking in our direction. One sigh remained in her left hand, while the other was in the zombie's head. The PV collapsed, and Neil again received a fresh slathering of sludge on his pants. He couldn't even wear them near my plane now. He pushed the truly dead reanimate to the side and looked up at my girlfriend. Thanks. She smirked. Like, totally my pleasure. Landers again proved everything's always as it's supposed to be. This brought innumerable existential questions to mind. I needed a few moments to contemplate all that had happened here so far today. Neil explained later what happened while I was off pondering the answer to life, the universe, and everything. With another dead zombie having just loosened its bowels on me, I attempted to brush myself off as I stood. Amy made her way over and yanked the sigh from the thing's bleeding mouth. Mumble profanities were all she offered to the recently departed as she sauntered over to where you and Devin were standing. Walking over to the closest survivor, Old Man Hughes, I put my hands on his shoulders and spoke loudly. As usual, it seemed he wasn't all there. Are you okay, sir? What do you need? Tim the teenager sat a little further away and spoke calmly. He's infected. Looking up at the kid, I was about to ask a question when old man Hughes frantically reached up and somehow grabbed the pistol from my holster. Placing the muzzle at his chin, he squeezed the trigger. In a single instant, his face caved in and seemed to invert itself, with the chin as a base. 
After that horrific image, the musk that made up the geriatric cranium rocketed in every direction. The wall, ceiling, chair, and of course myself were all drenched in bloody goop. Even though his heart was still probably beaten, there was no way we could do anything for him. He was clearly brain dead. A question mark appeared on my face as I stared at the body. Why? Tim answered for him. I guess old man Hughes was just making sure there was no way he would see tomorrow. He licked up some infected blood a few minutes ago, and he must have been making sure he was dead when he saw your pistol. That was kind of sad. Old man Hughes seriously wanted to die, I suppose. Never having spent much time around him, this was news to me. Had he been suicidal before? Infecting himself must have been plan A. Taking my pistol must have just been a spur-of-the-moment idea. A plan B. I guess I'd rather shoot myself than wait to become a cannibal. But shit, I wouldn't make such a fucking mess. I guess even if I did, who cares? It's not like I'd be cleaning it. Out of nowhere, the boy moaned loudly. I'm infected, too. Though we'd been around each other since I came to the mall, we'd never grown close. However, I was still empathetic. How could you not feel a pang for someone that knew they only had a few hours left on this earth? There was no comforting him. Telling him it might be okay would just be a lie. Hanging my head, I walked to the boy. No clue how to handle it, I knelt down to face the doomed teenager. So what do you want to do? Thank God he didn't shout, watch this, and put the barrel of the pump action in his own mouth. That would have sent me over the edge. Tim sighed and fell back in his chair. I don't know. Closing his eyes, he took a long breath and let it out slowly. Tears welled up in his eyes as he seemed to make some kind of decision. Well, at least let me tell you what happened here. That's when I got the story from the infected survivor in the store. This is the final story of a brave 15-year-old boy that refused to return with to Guntersville. As I was reloading the shotgun, three of the blue monsters jumped through the hole in the gate. They all started hopping around like maniacs. I started shooting, focusing hard at whichever one was there at the closest, trying not to miss. Before I knew it, I had fired five shells and I hadn't even scratched a damn one of them. That's when I realized what I had scratched. My sisters, Niobe and Arya, and even my little brother, my motherfucking brother, all had giant holes through them. Niobe's head looked like a half moon. She was plastered against the wall for a few seconds, arms spread like some kind of twisted angel of death. My shell blew a gaping hole through Mitchell, sending him flat on his back. The wound wasn't even noticeable until I moved to stand over him. Blood ran from his heart so fast the coat he was laying on was sopping wet. My little brother screamed out my name. Tim! Happy that he was in his bed, I turned to face him. From his bottom rib to just above his hip and nearly to the center of his belly button, there was nothing. He was leaning, and his insides were falling out of the missing half circle of his stomach. It was horrible. I lifted him up. Mitchell, can you hear me? My name was the last thing he said. He blinked back at me with the question of why on his face. Mitchell fell over to his left, eyes still open. Turning to look away, I saw Arya sitting slumped against the far wall. The bottom half of her face was gone, leaving only her blank, dead blue eyes staring out at me. Hearing her screeching about Dora the Explorer from outside my room would never happen again. There was no way I'll ever forget the accusatory stares of murdered loved ones gazing at me from forever. I was so fucking mad. I spun to face one of the blue beasts that I blamed for all this. It was now coming right at me, and I squeezed my trigger before I could put my sights on it. From the middle of the pelvic bone, a big circle made up the spot where its dick used to be. Blood poured from the body, meaning this monster would suffer before it died. I had two more rounds, and there were two more blues. One of them lunged at old man Hughes. He was the only elderly person willing to stay protected with the children. He was really fucking old. Probably should have been dead a long time ago. It was doubtful he knew what was going on, and I'd be surprised if he would even react if bitten. When the monster went airborne, I hit it in the shoulder with a spray of pellets. A few tiny pieces of lead ripped into the side of its neck, ripping out the veins that went to the brain. It fell dead onto the floor near old man Hughes. I was ready to congratulate myself for saving the old man. 
Just as I opened my mouth to speak, he looked down and noticed where the infected's blood had splashed onto the back of his hand. For some reason, he brought his liver-spotted hand up to his mouth and began licking the back of it. I yelled, what the fuck's wrong with you, you crazy old coot? Like every time before when someone had spoken to him, he ignored me and continued staring off into space. Maybe he was just tired of living and was making sure he would never see another sunrise. Amy dressed as Electra, Devin looking like Ghost Rider and I in the Indiana Jones getup, walked over to where Neil was with the other mall resident. The teenager Tim was just finishing telling Neil his story of what happened before we pushed our way through the security gate. He was aware he had been infected. He also refused to go back to Gunnersville with us and decided he would never be blue. Such a young life. I admired his courage. He added, There's not much worth taking in the mall, but you should send some people to raid the grocery store. Could I really be so calm and forward-thinking if I was either going to blow my own head off in a few hours or turn into a fucking peavy? This kid had some balls. We said our farewells and made a quick search through the Carnival of Carnage. We were assured that the mall was now empty of any other living people. The only thing left for this heroic trio to do was return to the island with one fucking survivor out of over thirty souls. No amount of money you could pay me would ever make me return to the Crossroads Mall. On our trek across the parking lot, Neil attempted to see the silver lining. You know, if you ignore the losses, that was a pretty good haul. Guns with ammo, a grocery store full of food, and a bunch of dead peavies. I tried to smile, to see anything good from the shit we just went through. Then back up on the hill there was a single hollow thud echoing through the halls of the now truly dead mall. We all knew it to be Tim's shotgun. Maybe Neil would prove to be worth what it cost. I tipped my wide-brimmed fedora back on my head and squinted my eyes. Doing my best to soldier on, I put my mind elsewhere. Sniffing, I turned to our new friend. I don't say this to too many guys, so you should feel privileged. You're taking your pants off before you get near the plane. Amy chortled and all Neil could do was shrug. As the three of us made stupid jokes to try and keep from crying, I glanced over at Devin. He walked silently and stone-faced, a thousand-yard stare in his eyes. My co-pilot carried himself as if he journeyed alone. How far into the future could he see? Was he preparing himself mentally for what was coming? What else would be lost? Nineteen. House of Cards. These people, the Hamricks, had become nearly as blindly faithful as what Jones dude and his stupid bitch of a wife. What's best they haven't even eaten supper with me and Lauren? They're just sheep, looking for a respectable shepherd. As long as they want to keep coming to the church after every salvaging mission to be my slaves, let them keep thinking on their connection to Jesus fucking Christ. Plus that succulent little blonde thing they let run around the damn church all night looks pretty appetizing. I need to give some sort of subtle signal to Lauren, making sure she knows this is the one. The two of us are on the same wavelength. I'm sure it won't be hard to make her understand. She always knows exactly what I want. So, you got anything good to eat, preacher? God damn, Jones is always right behind me. Brother Brown was rudely jerked out of his thoughts but tried to speak calmly. I was just thinking about making up some tacos. I'm pretty sure it won't be hard to find all the ingredients, especially with all the gardens all over the island. Hamrick turned around upon hearing the conversation. Did somebody say tacos? Motherfucker fuck. Well, it can't hurt to have another test subject. You bet. Lauren's going to mix up some more meat. Freeze-dried meat. Want to join us? Hamrick didn't even have to think about it. Dang straight. We'll be there. Just tell me what time and where at. This might turn out to be a good thing. Another one of these stupid shit for brains consuming his own flesh and blood. Tonight, my place. Both men's mouths watered. Hamrick turned and started walking away. Let me tell Angela. The wolf masquerading as the man of God smiled. He had to go find Lauren. Some of the rooms off the sides of the fellowship hall had been converted into storerooms for the shelves of scavenged food. The church had become well stocked as of late and Mike's plans would extend the goods even longer. These people will like some of my homemade cooking. 
I just need to get a hold of some fresh meat. Lauren Brown was broken away from her thoughts when Angela Hamrick started speaking. I sure do miss citrus. Sure, there's preserved stuff, but nothing compares to a fresh orange or lime. We've got some lime seasoning at home. Who's up for some tacos? Mike abruptly walked around the corner, jarring both women. He pointed at Angela. Sonny already volunteered your family. He looked over at Lauren. The Joneses and the Hamricks will be coming over for supper tonight. Give me some fucking time, you bastard. We have to catch it and I have to prepare it. Lauren put up a hand and glared at her husband before turning to smile at her friend. Let's hold off till tomorrow night, shall we? I need to spruce up before we have company. Her eyes bored holes through Brother Brown. We don't have any meat, dumbass. Just before he could open his mouth to speak, a few children came dashing around the corner playing hide-and-go-seek. Or maybe it was Tag, or some other time wasting children's game. The preacher put his hand on a young, paunchy blonde girl's head, pretending to twist her scalp. I got you. Stopping, she looked up and giggled. He continued talking sweetly to the child. I could just eat you up. Your parents are coming over for tacos tomorrow. Want to be a dinner guest? The little blonde girl nodded vigorously before again bounding off with her friends. He didn't even have to point at her and basically say, Here, cook this one up so we can eat it. Mike and I have a near psychic connection. Plus I knew he'd go for another blonde. And he's picked out the best of the litter. This one would have just the right amount of fat trimmings around some delectable pinkish meat. It was perfect. Lauren gave a slight wink at her husband. I think I can have something ready for everybody by tomorrow night. The wolf smiled. Sounds great. I'm starving. I guess we'll see all of you tomorrow night. Angela Hamrick gave Lauren a warm hug, thanked the pastor, and finally nodded her consent. As Brother Brown started moving to the door, he might be the butcher that portioned each quarter, tenderloin, backstrap, and chop, but Lauren would be the huntress. Mike wouldn't be slaughtering anything if it wasn't for her. He wouldn't be able to bite into a still-pumping liver if she didn't bring it to him. The Alpha was just as much a predator as the wolf. Though he was fully capable of capturing his own game, she often chose to take part in that which was most dangerous. Sure, it's fun to be waited on like a queen, but occasionally even monarchs enjoy getting their hands dirty. Lauren looked down at her wristwatch that only recently died, becoming nothing more than a paperweight. There would no longer be watch batteries made, and she didn't want to appear frivolous, spending time looking for batteries just for her watch. Turning her head 180 degrees, she spoke to the Hamrick's daughter, holding on to her other hand. Your mom and dad told me you could spend the night with me. All we have to do is wait in here for Brother Brown and we'll be ready to go. The still innocent young girl bobbed her curls up and down, anticipating the fun they would have. Lauren fished in her pocket. Want a piece of candy? 20. In the Valley of Ela. This is the best taco I've ever had, preacher. You sure know how to bring out the flavor. Sonny Hamrick said around a juicy mouthful of food. You could have told me this was fresh. What's your secret? Your brat was pretty much like cornfed beef. Thanks go to you, dumbass. Brother Brown laid his taco on the plate and goofily shrugged. Oh, just the mix of spices. The faux temporary replacement for the man of God grew somber and spoke low as if he was afraid his house was bugged. And what do y'all think about what I said the other night about the mayor? He's getting shadier and shadier. With every one of these kids going missing, he conveniently isn't part of our congregation. The assembled sheeple could only nod and agree with whatever their leader had told them. The shepherd was beaming. His prideful smile was barely hidden as he again lifted his taco, taking a juicy bite. When the small gathering finished agreeing with the gospel of Mike Brown, Hamrick spoke on another subject. You know, Brother Mike, you should really share some of this bounty with the membership of the church. That is, if you can spare it. Of course you want more, you greedy motherfucker. The pastor smiled beatifically. Feed a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Hamrick foresaw being let down and Jones was briefly confused. Sonny readied to speak, but the preacher raised his other hand. 
That's why I was thinking about bringing chili to church for everybody on Sunday. The faithful hooted and clapped. They were becoming good disciples. Without much more pushing, these idiots will be completely behind me. His rise to power would be unstoppable. Things had changed since people started going blue, and he knew he would be able to settle down. Some of these people need to start having babies, or there'll be a shortage of meat soon. I need to preach that sermon I memorized off the internet a few years back about having your quiver full. When God says it, they'll have to obey. 21. Savage Islands Lauren Brown held out Rajesh Matu's elbow, examining the wound. Half of his clone trooper armor had been removed, as he now sat on the table while she examined the wound. I think it will need some stitches, but you'll be good to go after that. So what happened? The Phantom's thick Indian accent was understandable by the nurse practitioner. She had seen all types of patients and worked with people from all over the world. I just tripped going up from the express loop back to the Humvee. Couldn't see my feet or the rock on the ground, but I definitely saw the sky from my back. The hit chuckled as she brought out the suture kit. She couldn't help but snicker in kind. Wow, you made it through a nest completely unscathed and wound up tripping on your way out of the door? The nurse practitioner turned to the man now leaning against the wall in a trench coat, a blotted cloth mask hanging halfway out of his pocket. You've got to at least give me some of the story, Detective Sacco. What in God's name has happened to those little ones that are missing? The investigator smiled condescendingly. He didn't catch her mentioning of those, as if all the recently missing girls had met the same fate. You see, Lauren, God didn't kill those little girls. Fate didn't butcher them and destiny sure didn't feed them to those animals. The way I see it is if God sees how the world is, he doesn't seem to mind. You know just as well as I do, God doesn't make the world this way. We do. After all, humans created the zombie virus and subsequent peeves. Not one of the other three in the room understood his watchman reference, but they were chilled to their cores nonetheless. A few quick snaps, twists, and a bandage later, Rajesh was ready for another outing. Lauren stood and began walking in Sako's direction. You have to tell me everything that happened. 22. Sako's Journal 2 our Humvee came to a stop in front of Ed's Fast Lou, a little mechanic shop just off downtown Albertville. Comically, someone had spray-painted a Z in front of the name. I doubt there's any way that the smell of grease, motor oil, transmission fluid, antifreeze, and just the overall smell of car repair could ever be removed from this location. A nuclear bomb could detonate in one of the oil pits, and one would still be able to catch the lasting scent of dirty, sweaty men topped with the inner workings of automobiles. Amazingly, zombie shit wasn't even able to cover it. Compare it to some cheap air freshener that smells immeasurably worse than the odor it's intended to cover. Not directly affronted by body odor and burnt grease, you now have the pleasure of adding the aroma of a dead dog found on the side of the road, with an exploded stomach to the array of olfactory cells permeating the surrounding air. Now take into account the deceased canine only recently consumed a soiled adult diaper, which had been sitting in the sun for at least a week. Now breathe deep. The three of us opened our doors and stepped out simultaneously. I sniffed disgustedly and let out a long sigh. You guys ready for this? Sir, yes, sir. The clone trooper hits answered in unison. Brandy Hamrick was only reported officially missing yesterday. Days prior, she accompanied her parents with the rest of the secondary salvaging team made up of church members. Their goal was to reclaim anything of use in the garage. As with every absent youngster as of late, all islanders assumed she had attempted to return to her most recent outing, surely offering adventure and discovery. Just like last time, no other children had disappeared. Additionally, none had reported any of their friends being taken by peeves. It was altogether a strange situation. Most might not initially realize automobile repair equipment would be a prized commodity after an apocalypse. However, drivers understood they wouldn't be going long at all if they didn't keep the juices in their motors flowing. Alternative fuels to gasoline would eventually be required, but it goes without saying that engines would still need maintenance long before petroleum became unstable. The first group of reclaimers had taken nearly everything, whether or not it had been nailed down. 
Brother Brown and his second-string scouts frequently returned home without much to show for their troubles. Salvaging teams would have been considered bands of thieves before May Day. Imagine these groups of criminals had to worry about no one fighting back, at least during the daytime and no law enforcement. They could steal to their collective hearts content with no worries or repercussions. Now picture the second group of bandits entering the same establishment with the exact same lack of constraints. If this other crew expected to find much of anything worth taking, they were usually disappointed. Commonly, 99% of valuables were taken during that first raid, leaving little more than bare bones for anyone else. Adults may have found the trips unsatisfactory, but any young children tagging along surely found what appeared to them to be huge empty buildings, fascinating enclosures, ripe for excitement. My ears of parenting told me these inclinations were accurate. If she and her friends had gone to revisit the location unaccompanied by an adult, it was peculiar none of the other kids came forward with the fact that she'd been taken. Even the most mischievous rascal typically puts the safety of a fellow above simply getting scolded. Did she make this journey alone? If so, did she reach her intended destination? I suppose we were at the express lube to find out just that. On the hunt for clues, we moved into Zed's. The fact that this area had been scavenged multiple times over, including once just recently, indicated it wasn't a lair. Sometimes the first notions are wrong, or should I say undead wrong. You'd think the initial reclamation team would have at least opened one of the giant roll-up doors. It would have made searching the interior much less treacherous. As luck or fate would have it, every entrance was sealed. Our first steps into the deep structure would be through the most easily accessible, regular-sized door at the front of the building. Pulling the blotted mask over my face and replacing my fedora, I grabbed the doorknob with the other hand. Both phantoms lifted glow sticks from their bags, intending to brighten any blue monster's day. In hindsight, this entire trip would have taken much less time if we'd just used C4 on one of the damn garage doors. Holding open the door and gesturing with my arm, I smiled as they bounced their green lights off the inside of the opening, deeper into the structure. Angling to see inside the door without entering the shadows, I witnessed something akin to a science fiction horror movie. A dark steaming cavern lay inside this garage. What had to be metric tons of caked black feces made up stalactites, stalagmites, and eerily beautiful formations that could be confused with rock. Puzzlement would immediately disappear when one took a breath. Images from Alien came to mind. Of course, if James Cameron had an over-the-top shit fetish. But there were people here yesterday. How? My question trailed. The green trooper swiveled his head in the direction of the black-tinged armor. Doshi shrugged, just as confused. What is it, sir? He moved forward to peek into the enclosure, pulling back in surprise. Well, looks like it's time to make some new friends. He chuckled. Was this even possible? Did we come to the wrong mechanic shop? None of the church scavenging team hinted at Zed's being an active hive. Sighing, I knew we had a job in front of us. Whether or not we discovered the evidence we sought, we had a duty to the people of Gundersville. These animals would not get to our island. Always defend. Let's do it. I rasped as I grasped the pummel of ivory and stepped in the door. Behind me came the phantoms, their tactical lasers already bouncing off the walls. Rajay shut the door behind us and flipped the lock on the knob. Since becoming tolerant of sunlight, peavies have been known to enter a hive if the call for aid sounded. I would make sure that they would be requesting help. Though it would only enrich the target environment, it would be best not to deal with undead coming at us from front and back. A quartet of naked, malnourished former humans appeared in front of me, staring with hungry yellow eyes. Touching the back of my katana to my forehead, I spoke to my enemies. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. One of the zombies made the first move as I lowered my blade. It took a step back and leaped at me, arms spread. Ivory cut straight through the airborne ghoul with no resistance. My bone-handled blade remained entirely spotless after cleaving the revenant in half. Realizing everything below the sternum had just become separated, the infected new true death was on its way. It widened its eyes and opened its mouth to let out a keening noise from lungs that would never again draw anything more than flies. 
My sword came back around to push the upper body at an angle where it would collapse into a dying heap on the cold floor at my side. The first and fourth contestants in line came at me simultaneously, one high and one low. Charging at me with a downturned head, my steel sliced evenly through the skull of one of the monsters. Blood gray matter and a surprising amount of mucus gushed out from the blooming blue cranium. All of this would have been a sight to behold, if not for the other incoming attacker. What would have been considered a dwarf or midget in life came bounding from the opposite angle. It wrapped its arms around me at about waist level, sending me hurling back. Dealing with a crazed blue Oompa Loompa trying to tear through my pants and trench coat wasn't my greatest challenge. The last standout of the original four took this inopportune time also to launch itself in my direction. The rapid monster threw itself forward, arms back. Ivory was busy attempting to cleave the leg humper so my secondary weapon would be required. My tanto was yearning for blood of its own. With my right hand, I fluidly slid Ebony from her scabbard and shot the short blade at the creature. It impacted in the center of the jugular notch, coming to a stop when the end met vertebra. The baby seemed confused. Then it understood a giant pointy blade just ended any chance of a future on life it might have had. Whimpering was the only thing it could do, sinking to the floor within the next few steps. The stunted beast clawing at my pant leg was taking a much slower road to Blue Infinity. One would guess it would have stopped any kind of attack when I sliced down its back. I was filleting this thing alive. Screaming, with blood shouting out of the massive wound from the shoulders to the lower lumbar, it futilely kept up the insignificant assault. Instead of tinkling my sword down its spine once more, I chose to pull away and slam Ivory into the animal's left side, just below the armpit. With the cardiac muscle nearly completely cleaved from life-sustaining arteries, it almost went utterly still. Only a dark, short gurgling from between ass cheeks was heard. Rising, I turned to see my companions watching, slack-jawed like moviegoers. Are you not entertained? Neither of them could understand the amazement on my face. Yes, Staff Sergeant! Mahatma let out a chuckle. The green trim trooper smacked his armored hands together with a laugh. Bravo! That was a twisted comedy! Everything's a joke, I guess. I said with a sigh and a shrug. It was disturbing, yet simultaneously comforting that anyone could enjoy watching such horrific violence. Silently passing countless picked clean bones, I shuddered as we came across the remains of a person. Without being ordered, one of the clone troopers shined his light on a nearly intact adult skeleton. One arm was hammered away to the shoulder, the other to the elbow. This human must have bled out while the creatures chiseled away at the second arm. At least it was apparent this poor soul was not Brandy Hamrick. I was sick and these demons were ever part of my species. Two red LED beams were like knives cutting through the darkness. Only the musky aroma of the untold tons of wet waste kept my mind on the objective. If not for that, it would have been easy to lose oneself in the all-consuming black and total silence. We had to find this girl before it was too late. Every oil pit was full to the brim with what looked like steaming tar. It was relieving not to find human beings trapped inside these pits, or some other unimaginably sinister atrocity. As we crossed the expanse of the building and began approaching the main office on the far side, a howl sounded. Our host just realized that the guests had arrived. One of my guiding lights disappeared from the floor in front of me, soon followed by the other. A burst of automatic fire came as I spun. After a second, I understood what was happening. One of the hits had been spear-tackled from his side. His Indian brother was lending cover in the form of lead flying downrange. The peavies, jumping from car lifts, snarled and hissed as they closed. Rapid fire from a single H&K was putting a dent in the numbers, but at least dozens of shit-covered monsters hesitantly closed in on the three of us. Ivory sang as she sliced through the air in front of me. I was ready. Rajesh readied his Trishla, daring the beast to get within reaching distance. His burst would be replaced with three blades. His submachine gun dangled on its sling, unsuitable for close-quarters combat. Mahatma rose after being forced to the ground. He cracked a flare and rolled it on the floor to the middle of the three of us. Lifting his boots from its sheath, he unscrewed the elephant head to give the weapon a blade on both ends. A dozen peavies were visible within line of sight of our tri-defense. 
A pair of former humans threw themselves at me, unexpectedly meeting cold justice from the slash of my katana. Ivory started singing a tune as rainbow of organs colored the gray floor. Intestines, which looked to be full of burned sloppy cornmeal, rolled out of the burst bellies. I continued slicing and dicing enemies as the hits took part in their close quarter battles. Doshi stabbed the recurved tip of his axe knife into a sunken blue cheek, driving the blade horizontally into the monster's mouth. The animal froze in place as if it mattered. When the end of the phantom steel stuck through the other cheek, he forcefully pushed back, painfully beheading the thing while alive. Uvula, tonsils, sinuses, and ultimately all connection to the brain severed as the razor-sharp blade tore out of the back of the skull. The head was now only attached to the rest of the body by two thin strips of what remained of the cheeks. As the body collapsed, the skull fell over forward. It was disturbing yet interesting to see the inside of a truly dead former human head. Of course, the insignificant membrane which kept it attached to the body broke free as it collapsed. Gray matter toppling to the floor as the skull emptied with a sick plop. Rushing at his center, the next unfortunate undead in line received the stiletto just below its left jaw. In less than a heartbeat, the black trim trooper pulled his weapon to him, blunt side of his axe blade first. The small stiletto carved into muscle and tendon before ripping through arteries on its exit. Dark infected blood gushed from the torn neck. With only minutes to live, the scourge could perform no actions through the pain other than dropping to the floor. Matu was dealing with his group of what had to be a dozen zombies. Shiva's death dealers slammed into the gut of one creature as all three blades began forcing their way through vital organs. The hit jerked violently to the side, blade slicing from the center of the body out. Spine severed, the PV's lower body began dropping before the upper half was ready. Blue dermis ripped, the only thing keeping the pieces of the reanimated corpse attached. In the brief moments before meeting the blue grim reaper, it knew true pain. Pulling the trio of knives back, the green trooper violently forced his weapon out and up. The blades caught two demons in their genitals simultaneously. The center sword sliced through the outside of both eyes intermingling, the infected blood pouring down their legs. Pushing the trishla to the left, it drove deeper into the inner thighs of both creatures, sending arterial blood pouring. This move not only popped the heads of the minuscule Pez dispensers and cracked all four bloody snot-filled robin's eggs to emit a sulfuric tang, but it also jammed the middle blade deeper into the thigh of the leftmost animal. There was no way it could survive all the other injuries. On top of that, its hip was surely dislocated. Chunky blood, what looked like egg whites and, of course, feces poured on the floor, before the monsters could fall, touching yet clearly remaining separate substances. Rajesh retracted the staff and plunged it forward again. Destroying another undead husk followed by yet another rabid scourge, he was slicing the contingent of enemies into pieces. The three of us dropped more than enough PVs to level a playing field, at least for the moment. More enemies would undoubtedly respawn as soon as we entered the next room. Gallons of crimson coated the floor, causing the already slick cement to become as slippery as a sheet of stinking red ice. A zombie charged me, screaming, arms down and back. It was unclear if the demon was attempting to gain better speed through an aerodynamic pose. Maybe it used to be an Olympic athlete. No matter. This was how it started its strange run. One foot contacted a pool of blood. Planting its feet could not stop the forward momentum. Comically, the monster tipped over forward, straight onto its face. Rotten, brittle teeth scattered and a blue nose exploded on impact. The PV face planting on that unforgiven floor was one of the most painful things I had ever watched. I couldn't help but laugh. After watching this horrible spectacle with morbid fascination, the beast continued sliding directly toward me. I took a knee and held my katana in front of me and near the floor, horizontally, so the blade was even with the top of the skull. It couldn't have been more than a few heartbeats later the revenant came into contact with my katana. Ivory sliced into a brain casing like it was an overripe cantaloupe. Wet stringy strands of bloody gray matter erupted from the cracked cranium like disgusting confetti. I rose realizing this was the last attacker in the immediate vicinity. One of the phantoms laughed from my rear. You know, sir, that thing was probably already unconscious, if not dead. His brother hit chuckled. Yeah, but you got to admit, that show was entirely worth it. My only response was to sigh as I began a hop-skipping voyage through the minefield of blood and bodily detritus. 
Damn, these Indians are hardcore. The office was in a structure that was a building within the large garage. Squat and only thrown together, the walls were nothing more than cheap fiberboard surrounded by paneling. The manager's office was in the corner of this flimsy structure. A plexiglass window sat inside the wall, allowing the boss to see the grease monkeys working. Senselessly, the door into the office was a hallway around the corner. As expected, the window had become a solid piece of the wall from within. Caked, like most surfaces, inside of a zombie nest with multiple layers of feces and dried Jackson Pollock-style detritus. We only saw an inky black morris through what should have been an otherwise clear rectangle. It's frightening to think that these things were able to produce that much waste. Instead of walking around the corner as I had planned, the green-tinged trooper decided to send a submachine gun burst through the plexiglass. It didn't shatter as I had expected it would from a previous experience. The feces-soaked windows seemed to only sink into itself upon impact and merely consume the bullets. Was Peavy Poop the new Kevlar? You would doubtfully find a willing test subject to wear a vest of bulletproof shit, especially with that kind of odor. Perplexed as to our next move, I swivel my head to the clone trooper on my right. So, what should we do now? He glanced at his fellow hit, nodded slightly, and raised a finger. Watch this, sir! Mahatma took a side step to the left, aiming his HK down the short hall containing the door to the office. Rajesh was surely smiling as he theatrically tiptoed to stand at the window. The whole time my mind is playing the theme from the Pink Panther. Reaching into his grenade pouch, he lifts a cylindrical item from within, pulls a pin and shoves this grenade through the plexiglass, where it had been weakened by the lead storm before. Removing his arm from the cavity as carefully and quickly as he could, his hand was now noticeably empty. Jogging backward to take a knee in front of his brother, they both aimed with their carbines in the same direction. Those were the longest three seconds I have ever endured. A bright light shone through the hollow that Matu's arm just created in the wall of shit. The sound of a muffled explosion could definitely be picked up through the legendary organic insulation. Immediately following both of these events came an insane screaming that sounded like crazed mental patients being skinned alive. This beautiful and psychotic symphony was playing the perfect tune. However, it was of course not the only joy we were about to receive. Within seconds, our olfactory nerves were also assaulted by the scent of what had to be five lifetimes worth of burning excrement, turned into a satanic new flavor of potpourri. I'm delighted Yankee Candle never let something like this out of their test kitchen. The constant wailing of the undead was nearly as disturbing as watching a football field of flaming chocolate pudding crammed into a standard office cubicle. I think it was the universe's way of denying the fact we created a real holy shit. The accursed peavies had only one exit for which to escape their fiery torment. Every one of them with the ability to still move raced for that exit. Zombies with holes being rapidly eaten through them by flying Willy P. Magma piled out of the door, only to be met with high-velocity bullets, immediately followed by their final death. Former humans missing ears, noses, or completely severed appendages were relentlessly mowed down by the phantoms. A spectator would say this was like shooting fish in a barrel. Entirely unfair. Honestly, I guess it was pretty close. But I don't have much sympathy for cannibals that would eat us, bones and all if given the opportunity. Stretching down the nearly packed full hallway was the horde of bleeding, burned skeletal revenants, victims of the incendiary. Obviously, the room had been crammed with zombies, because the dying and melting reanimated corpses were nearly knee-deep. Cringing, I realized we were going to have to wade through the mass of wet, stinking blue tissue to reach the room beyond. The walls now resembled black Swiss cheese, but closer inspection was required. Mahatma and Rajesh both took a position at my side, facing the door. At the same instant, we all realized that if Brandy Hamrick had been alive in that room, that white phosphorus grenade just damned her soul, just as it had the peavies. Rajesh began a question. For the first time, he sounded frightened. Sir, what if... I threw up my hand. Don't even think about it. On this investigation, I was actually hoping we wouldn't find the missing child, at least not where she was expected to be. Our boots squished through the heap of truly dead. We finally came to a door barely hanging on to the frame by one hinge. 
This inner hive contained everything any survivor had seen and smelled before. Bones picked clean, maggot-infested remains of more than one half-eaten furry animal, and what looked like a nursing home full of diarrhea after chilly day covered every single inch of the floor. The usual suspects accented by any PV's fortunate enough to have died soon after the initial explosion. Blue limbs lay burned off by a willy peat, and a single ghoul sat paralyzed from the waist down by the grenade. Apparently the phosphorus had eaten away a large portion of its face, rendering it blind. Bloodied trenches had been dug through the holes in the skull. Several gouges were ripped in the skin, where the animal tried to dig the unstoppable fire out with its fingers. It was difficult not to feel sorry for the creature. I just tried to remember how it would uncaringly slice off a little girl's arm, or leg, and eat it in front of her. It was going to suffer, just as it was until we finished investigating this business. After that, I would burn the building to the fucking ground. What was the point on this hive? There was no litter of young peavies to be seen. Had the smaller ones simply been covered up by their guardians? Zed's wasn't even a nest just days ago when the church team was here. I couldn't see much point in its existence at all, or, to be truthful, how it existed. It almost seemed like something that had been placed only as an obstacle to our investigation, or a tool to invoke intense action. Twisted entertainment for some deranged audience. Well, I don't think she's here. The green trooper sighed in relief. As I turned to exit the room, my shoulders slumped. It's okay, sir. We'll find her. One of the phantoms attempted to console me. Will we? What about the next one? Or the one after that? How can more children disappear? Where are they going? Does it seem the rate at which they're disappearing is speeding up? Will this mystery ever be solved? Will I ever be able to answer any of these questions? Do people even care anymore? There's so much bad shit happened, people get numb to it. Sometimes those of us that have survived the apocalypse grow accustomed to loss and death. Disgusted that I again failed another set of parents, the people of Gunnersville and ultimately myself, I huffed in the direction of the door. Noticing a plastic fuel can in a corner, I leaned over to pick it up. Sniffing, it must have been diesel fuel or some other type of accelerant besides gasoline. How had the initial scavengers plus the second string missed something so visible? Turning the can on its side so the liquid could drain out the nozzle in a trail behind me, I could only smile. Maybe it was supposed to be. I spoke wistfully to no one. Tossing the empty can as I walked out the door with both hits at my sides, I pulled a book of matches from my pocket. Striking one, I dropped it in the trail of fuel and continued walking to the Humvee. We can only hope for better luck next time. Let's move. Whatever was in that can must have been some pretty strong stuff. The blaze devoured the building in mere seconds. We hadn't even made it into our vehicle and the shell of the building was entirely consumed. Maybe that's something to do with the fact that most surfaces inside had been soaked in layers of oil. That is, underneath all the layers of rancid feces. The green trim trooper turned back to face the burning building before taking a final back step to open the rear driver's side door. Think we should have brought moss mallows? His countrymen guffawed as he made his way around the Humvee. Nah, what's burning might give it an extra flavor. Rajesh chuckled, reaching behind him for the door. As he planted his feet, they both shot out from under him. Ah, oh, what the... Twenty-three. Weapon of Choice Hours had passed since the glorious battle on the trash barge with the most recent incarnation of the dictator. All of the scrapes and dents in Jean's Brotherhood of Steel power armor had been hammered out, and the suit looked perfect again. Easy's Iron Man suit also appeared impeccably clean and fresh off the rack after his fight with the villain. Before trekking into the next hydroelectric dam, the tech felt honored to present Akambia Nagana Collins with a gift. She would now be able to carry the Ikelwa, a Zulu short-thrusting spear, a traditional weapon from the African continent. Wearing his armor, as usual, Jean walked reverently to stand in front of where Akka sat on the deck. Taking a knee, he dropped his gaze and lifted the bladed spear with both hands. Milady. Surprised, she stood knowing precisely what it was. The ordinarily quiet African beauty was uncharacteristically excited. Hanikawa! 
Pausing, she waited for him to look up. For me? Jean held back a smile and nodded. As it should be. Aka almost squealed as she took the archaic weapon from him. Thank you! At the time, the tech was unaware. Even her husband, the protector, didn't know. It had never been pertinent before and no one asked. She had been trained by a master to use this specific weapon. A regionally customary killing device in her home country of Zambia, the Zulu thrusting spear, the Yikalwa, was a favorite of one of the elders in her village growing up. She trained with an expert to use this tool of death for hunting, self-defense, and of course offense. This deadly spear would replace her halberd and become her new melee weapon. Akamiya's first chance to try her new weapon out would be later today at the next dam the Korra was fast approaching. 24. Just getting started. One of the more tech-savvy survivors, Thad Russell, sat behind the control board in the sound booth at Gunnersville First Methodist. After adjusting some dials, fine-tuning the lapel mic and speaker system, he gave a thumbs-up sign to the man standing behind the pulpit. Brother Mike Brown gave a beatific grin, subtly nodding. Spreading the word a special service would be called tonight, he made sure to speak gravely, letting every islander know it was important to the flock. He was about to give his opinion, which most of the sheeple took as unquestionable gospel to the congregation. An opinion I know to be false, but they don't, so I'm going to give it anyway. Brothers and sisters, the wolf began, I have called you here today to consider and pray as I have on the problems our community is facing. Some among us see what happened to the world on May 1st as judgment, a punishment from God. I myself do not speak for him and dare not place his ultimate design on events, at least not on a scale so large. However, I can rightfully say that we, the followers of the Lord, have been truly blessed to have received the safety that God bestowed upon us by granting us this island. The preacher waited for the applause and standing ovation to die down. Gazing over the entire assemblage without blinking, he continued. But, he raised a single finger, there are always wolves pawing at the door, and sometimes, sometimes our Holy Father sees fit to remind us that we must always remain vigilant and protect the rest of the fold. All the faithful grew more and more tense with each powerful word. Holy shit, this is really working. These stupid fucking yokels are eating this shit up. Only a little bit more of a push and they'll be ready to crucify Jesus fucking Christ if I tell them to. The supposed temporary replacement for the man of God could barely contain a maniacal giggle. And sometimes those wolves are right in our midst, wearing sheep's clothing. We are not to tolerate traitors in the temple. Nearly every member of the group glanced to their neighbor at each side. What the fuck? This shit doesn't even make sense. I'm just saying things with intensity and they take it like it's fucking gospel. The children that have gone missing recently. Something tells me it wasn't the blue monsters that snatched them. I'm inclined to believe they've been abducted by an agent of Satan on this island. If any of you dumb fucks had a brain, you'd figure out that I'm that agent. Has anyone noticed Mayor Collins has been acting particularly shady as of late? Brother Brown raised an eyebrow, running his preposterous look over each churchgoer. Fists clenched and jaws were noticeably set. A tumultuous, fiery, and seemingly unanimous roar came from the congregation. They were all swept up in agreement with their shepherd. Though not positive, he was fairly sure he heard a few shouts of hell yeah. Maybe even a couple people scream kill him. The wolf was in awe, stupefied by his charismatic persuasive abilities. He'd just put a bullseye on the back of the man that was his only competition for the hearts and minds of these people. And the meat of their children. I don't think I've ever experienced mob mentality on this scale. Are all Jesus freaks this gullible? Or is it just the retards in Alabama? It's a good thing the mayor didn't attend this special service. These cycles would carry him up to the stage and crucify him. 
Honestly, it wouldn't have bothered him if one of the deranged fuckers was to leave service early and assassinate the damn mayor. However, he was confident their communal fury would simmer and eventually boil over in time. Raging anger would only become lasting hate for a man they were completely positive was a baby killer. They didn't even have this notion until I merely used the right combination of words to make them all suddenly realize an evil kidnapper was ruling them. Holding up both hands, he attempted to calm the flock. Brothers, sisters, let's not allow our anger to get the best of us. We don't want to do anything hasty. Let things lay for the time being, and we will see God at work. He will let us know when it is time to act. Events happen in his time, not ours. Taking comfort in Brother Brown's divinely inspired message, the faithful grew quiet. Moving through a few items of business, less conscientious subjects were discussed. Until May Day, his first inclination would have been to take as much money from these Bible thumpers as possible. Now, though money wasn't the prized commodity it once was, his focus now lay on other precious things. Precious and tasty. Before stepping down from the podium to take a seat on the first pew beside his wife, he made a final note. Oh, and the children's choir is going to come up to lead us in some music. Gesturing for the children to come forward, he simultaneously stepped from the stage. Sitting with his Bible in hand, he watched the children walk by with a fatherly eye. God damn! Praise Jesus! I almost forgot about those two. The Olsen twins, eight or nine-year-old blonde girls with fluffy, bouncing pigtails, stood in line with the other children, hand in hand. God, I can only imagine how that shit will taste. He opened his Bible somewhere near the middle and turned it face down in his lap. Well, I did promise Chili on Sunday. I'll just have to talk to their idiot parents to make sure they'll be coming along for the scouting mission tomorrow. Glancing over to Lauren, she smiled knowingly. She's on board. Now to make sure they're where they are supposed to be. Everything always works out perfectly. 25. Mo, Journal Entry 2 the Cora came to another dam. My name still had not been taken out of the hat. Surprise! An unfit, unhealthy, and unshaven scallywag like me, the hero, would be protecting our sole dam technician through another hydroelectric lock. Somehow I was partnered with one of the physically fit crew members, the always resolute jarhead wearing the Samus suit, Captain Petunia Hammer's Sledge. It was rare that the screenwriter gave me a reprieve. I was willing to take advantage of the delusional former Marine that saw the Peavies as her old Cold War enemies. One of the Phantoms, Sanjay Patel, had already pretty much told me he would never be going into another dam with me. My brother had definitely rigged the random drawing so our names would never show up for the same dam. Luckily, Hammer enjoyed eliminating the enemies of capitalism. In my opinion, people like the Indian ninjas, the bodybuilders, and maybe the super soldier that was the expert should have been her full-time bodyguards. At least with Hammer backing me up, Akka, who filled out the skin-tight X-Men Storm outfit, would only have half as much chance of getting killed. Amazingly, the name of this lock and dam was on a large green sign in our line of sight. The C.A. Hoax Dam was locking a man-made lake and looking pretty free of infected. Is it surprising to learn that only the locations where I go, there are countless reanimated corpses causing so much trouble? I'm still not sure of the date or how many decades we've been on the river, or even where the hell in Alabama we are. I could just ask, but you know that's not going to happen. Before me and Hammer followed our principal, Akka, into the nest of lunatic cannibals, I wanted to get a haircut. If I was about to be turned into a fucking zombie, I wanted a fresh flat top before I died horribly, damn it. Before going below deck to put on my Cylon suit, I spoke to the assembled crew. Anyone here cut hair? I was, but I shouldn't have been surprised when the oracle raised a meaty hand. I got this, motherfucker. You cut hair? I asked, hesitatingly. Hells yeah, cuz. I can clip your mop. Raising an eyebrow. You gonna tell me you went to school for that? 
I almost finished the sentence with two. Smokes probably would have sat on me and killed me. Listen, wiener dumpster. I worked at my pawpaw's barber shop when I was a kid. I looked at him, confused as to why he wouldn't think of a better lie. But your pawpaw's a preacher. Nah, shit, cracker. I got two pawpaws. He held up two fingers. Oh, I called both of my grandfathers the same thing as well. It's a consequence of having all older first cousins. It can be confusing when speaking to a stranger, so I dipped my head and let it slide. I paused again. Wait, can you cut white people's hair? That really didn't sound as bad in my head. What? Seriously? Black people have different textured hair than white people. I'm not even going to try to explain the reason I asked that question to you. Just read how I was exposed for being a closet KKK member. Smokes drew back in shock. The fuck, cracker? I tried to say something to backtrack, but he continued. You saying I ain't worthy to cut your hair because I'm just a gawky? It was too late to try and save myself now. I only braced myself to be beaten to a bloody pulp with a race card. He threw his voice. Oh, please, master. Give me permission to cut your hair, master. I do it for free. He raised one eyebrow and fell back into his usual verbal stance of being the offended black guy. I might not even scalp your white-ass head, motherfucker. I just dropped my shoulders, realizing I had done it to myself. If I refused the trim now, I would never hear the end of it. But then again, if I let my husky friend put sharp objects against my head, I could possibly die. Oh, and I would still never hear the end of it. There was no recourse. Let's do this, Big Papa. I swallowed the lump in my throat and moved to a chair. Giddy like a kid, he rushed below deck to retrieve his equipment. He hustled back up the stairs with an electric razor and a selection of several blades in hand. I had never been so nervous about getting my hair cut. I sat down in one of the chairs Crow fishes from every day. He threw one of those capes over me. I had no clue where the hell it came from. The buzzer and the razors probably didn't exist either until Smokes had a conversation with God or the screenwriter. They were miracled down to him on a rainbow of fatty snacks. I tensed as he clicked the buzzer. If you fuck this up, you know I'm going to kill you. He chuckled and pointed over to my bald brother. Cause, trust me, he likes my styling. Wait, Easy let Smokes shave his head? That means he lets someone that doesn't have a master's degree from cosmetology school put their hands on the perfect sculpture, which is his outward appearance? I shrugged. If my brother felt safe with the oracle putting a razor against his scalp, it had to be okay. I relented, glad to be rid of the hair. Get it over with, dude from barbershop. That's ice cube cracker. Was the only reply before Smokes turned on the clippers and started humming. Today's a good day by Ice Cube. I ran my hand up from my neck to the top of my head and whistled. Oh my god, I didn't even know you could make it that skin tight. I didn't feel blood or bone. This was the best damn haircut I ever got. With no mirror, I was only judging by feel, but this was perfect. He chuckled with pride. Told you, cuz. First one free. I thought about that and then realized what he would be bartering for. Food. I pulled the cape off as I stood and turned around. You're cutting my hair for the rest of my life. Frowning, I foresaw him dying from blocked arteries or diabetic ketoacidosis in the next couple of years. Well, at least for the rest of your life. He shot a meaty finger pistol at me before going below to return the equipment. I followed him down the stairs to go in the bathroom and gear myself up in the Cylon suit. My bodybuilding sibling passed me in the hall and stopped me with a hand on my shoulder. He ran his knuckles against the side of my head. Holy shit. Skin tight, huh? Same thing I said. I smiled as I continued to the deck. I forgot to thank him for wishing me luck, bastard. He did touch me, so maybe that's why I'm alive now. One of the countless multitudes leaped in my direction. It wouldn't have been able to bite through metal even if it was able to get its teeth against my armor, but it landed on my blade. The monster put me onto my back and its entire weight was now pressing against my bat lift. The razor-sharp edge caught up between two sets of ribs poking out over the malnourished belly. The pressure caused steel to dig into blue skin. 
When the PV realized something hurt, it tried moving, and that only slid the blade deeper. It was screaming in agony when I heard something like balloons pop underwater. I knew what happened. The scream was immediately cut off, and it reached for its throat. I screamed at the inhuman monster. What the fuck is wrong with you? Wanting to kill it and be done with the thing. I didn't want to fucking torture it. It stood up and backed away. I was going to have to chase the motherfucker and make it quicker. The thing ran straight past Akka down the empty corridor lined with blue dismembered bodies. It started bouncing from wall to wall, trying to figure out why it couldn't breathe. I don't know why the hell I even followed it. It was going to die anyway. Maybe I just felt responsible for putting it in such torment and had to put it out of its misery. Eventually, it slipped in some of the infected blood that coated the floor, sending it into a prostrate position. How long can one fucking survive without oxygen? There's no way I could sprint a quarter mile down a hallway while I was suffocating to death. Running at full tilt, I stepped in my own pool of slippery crimson. I planted a foot to forestall the hydroplaning. Bringing my other foot down, I stopped myself just as I came to the reanimate, spread eagle before me. Intending to plant my foot on the ground, it just so happened to land on the privates of the infected. My metal boot tore into blue testicles and smashed the tiny twig. I nearly threw up when I heard two distinct pops. The toe of my boot was sure to mash into the taint and asshole of the beast. Shit, I'm sorry. This was horrible. I wanted to make it quicker and just made it fucking worse. Damn, I felt even worse than if I had left the animal just to suffocate. Quickly, I pushed the tip of my weapon down onto the back of the skull. Ruptured gray matter and stinking blood ran from the wound. I turned, satisfied I had finally put it at peace, eventually. I raised the genitalia-destroying foot and brought it down on the clean floor. Whatever kind of bile or juice that had been in the sagging ball still coated my boot. Planting that foot, I began to take a step to the other. It shot out from under me, and I started going backward in slow motion. Damn it! When I finally hit the ground, my helmet popped off and shot behind me. No, Beggy, I thought. Well, it turns out it was a fucking Beggy. My Klingon weapon lay on the ground to my side, and I was reeling. I'm surprised I remained conscious with my head bouncing off the metal helmet. The neck of the suit nearly cut my fucking head off when I first impacted the ground, almost giving me a concussion. I was in no shape to do anything besides lay there and mumble vulgarisms. I wasn't prepared for an attack. Fuck the screenwriter and the horse he rode in on. You can guess what I got. The expert shouted from across the expanse. Mo, pull your arms up. The instant I did as she commanded, naked flesh smacked against metal. I felt the weight. Still dazed, I realized there was a revenant on top of me trying to grab my arms. It was able to push them down, but not get through them. My fingers were touching my chin. It couldn't bite me, but it brought its hands up to grapple at my neck. Just as it did, Hammer dove to slide, mere inches from the bottoms of my feet. She drove Anderil, the broadsword of Aragorn, into the thing's asshole. It nearly instantly died as the steel ripped through organs and poked out the top of the chest. In the final conscious movement, it brought its hand down to scratch my bare neck. Hammer used her massive blade to swing the truly dead corpse off of me where it lay twitching on the floor. Stunned, I sat up and reached to feel my neck, not realizing I wouldn't have been able to feel anything anyway. Hammer moved closer to me to rest on her knees in between my legs. If I had been able to think about it, this would have weirded the hell out of me. She wrapped her armored arms around my neck. It didn't get you. It didn't get you. You're okay. You're okay. She was rocking me back and forth like a mother consoling a frightened child. You know, this probably looks strange as hell to the audience. Sam is holding and cooing a Cylon. It didn't bite me, it just scratched me. What if it had saliva, blood, shit, or some other kind of infected body fluid under its nails? It could have killed me with just a scratch. My senses were rapidly returning as I stood, shaking my gauntlets off. I reached up and put my bare hand around my neck again. No blood. It didn't feel wet. But that really didn't mean anything. I pointed at the blue body on the floor. Where the fuck did that come from? And how the fuck did it get there? I spun, pointing a finger at my sister-in-law. 
My voice was growing louder with each syllable. And why the fuck didn't you stop the damn thing? Akka shrugged, her ikkawa lifting from the ground. I didn't see it. And you expect me to believe it didn't see you? I was incredulous. She again gestured with her shoulders. It really didn't seem like it did. There were more raving lunatics headed our way. We could hear them howling and screaming from all the way down here. I guess I can be thankful to the screenwriter for at least giving us a short lull while I had a come apart on Akka. I jogged back to retrieve my head cover as the expert charged straight into the blue oblivion. Standing with my batleth on its end in front of me, my hands against one end, I leaned onto my weapon. I pointed forward without lifting my arms. See? She loves this shit. Make sure I'm partnered with her from now on. Here I was standing beside my sister-in-law, dumbfounded that she was able to bear being in such proximity to a peep in town. We were watching the experts slay every enemy within reach. It was breathtaking to watch Samus's roundhouse behead nearly a handful of revenants in one swing of her blade. In fact, the bodies would fall and blood would rocket. I'm still sure most people don't even know the body can fucking shoot blood like a geyser. It was like we were watching a scene from Kill Bill. There were more dismembered limbs around her than there were on any given day of my playing with Legos as a child. Without even thinking about it, Akka basically admitted the rest of the crew had some sort of control over the random drawings. I'll be sure to let the others know about that. Aha! There was only the smallest amount of anal seepage from the starving demons when she sliced clean through them or stabbed into vital organs. Her suit of armor was nearly utterly crimson. Hammer's kill ratio was ridiculous, and I would have paid money for whatever kind of hack she was using. Not just a mere console code, this had to be a separate program running in the background. Aim bot in god mode. I was still not sure if I had become infected or not. The easiest way to know for sure was to see if the undead noticed me. But that meant I would have to get in between Hammer and some of her glorious victory. Did I really want to put forth the effort like walking to see if the enemy came at me? Maybe I should just let our communist killing patriot destroy all the tangos. After the captain slashed through at least a hundred blue filthy bodies and we were nearing the exit, I saw a perfect opportunity. One of the slower stragglers, what had to have been an elderly man, a Vietnam vet or something, approached the expert. The beast moved at a geriatric trot. Stepping up beside her, I watched as she eviscerated another enemy. I held up my alien blade. I got this, Cap. I walked over to the figure, realizing why it was so slow and short. I don't mean like a short dude, five foot six or something. I'm talking dwarf short. It didn't have shins. There were feet, just no legs below the knee. And I know you're thinking that maybe it was just a short dude in life and I'm a horrible person for making fun of one after death. Nope. It wasn't some optical illusion. It was like Cotton Hill. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Hank Hill's dad from King of the Hill. No shins. Ankles appeared attached to the knees. Known for the line, those damn toehoes shot my shins off. Does that type of procedure actually exist? I was more worried about figuring out why this would have been done than killing the damn thing, backpedaling to give myself time to think. This obviously had been done on purpose, but the reason was beyond me. I stepped forward again, and the animal reached in my direction. That still wasn't proof, but I was satisfied for the moment. I could still be infected and invisible. It could have been reaching for a hammer. Forcefully, I brought my blade up and into its side. Skin ripped, and organs ruptured as the animal fell over its short legs. I slammed the heel of my foot onto the skull, gray matter oozing from every orifice in the cranium, ensuring the destroyed revenant was truly dead. Turning, I could see the expert staring at me. It was obvious her mouth was hanging open inside the helmet. I felt that I had been adequately violent and did a mental fist pump. Hell yes. That's right, lady. I'm a badass. I just basically murdered a defenseless old cripple. Wait. I felt cool until I just wrote that down. Shit, now I feel bad about doing it. After the almost daily routine of heaving myself up the rope ladder, I stood facing my brother. My explanation of the journey through the damn interior was a pretty short synopsis. Then it scratched me. Are you infected? 
Thanks for the kind words and brotherly love, Dick. Well, I don't reckon. The very last peavy in there raced for me. I bowed my chest, and then I killed it. I imitated my swinging motion and stomped to show off some of my badassery. My sister-in-law was kind enough to clarify. It was a handicapped senior. My bald-headed sibling sucked in through his teeth and looked at me with disapproval. Thanks, Aka. I really made it easy to have another reason to be disappointed I was related to him. I cut my eyes at her. Really? You really couldn't just let me have that? A simple shrug said it all. That's what you get for walking in on me while I'm naked. I knew this wouldn't be her final form of vengeance. Throwing my hands up, I turned back to my bodybuilding sibling. I know, chill. I'll chain myself to the mast tonight. There was no chance I would infect Sarah. I almost wanted to punch her after our first kiss when we were both convinced I had been bitten. That would have been her fault. There's no way in hell I'm going to let it be mine. I'd have never heard the end of it. Good God, could you imagine that? I already get bitched at just for bringing her on this damn cruise when she barely has to lift a fucking finger. Even as a stupid zombie, I would rather kill myself than listen to her tell me how much of a mistake I am for eight hours until she turns. But then she would actually be naked in front of me. That might be okay. I take back what I said. The old friend broke into my inner thoughts about seeing my girlfriend blue, with no clothes on. It's okay, man. If I hear you raving, I'll be sure to come out here and put you down quick. Much appreciated, Bradley. He would be a good friend and blow my fucking brains out. I now sit here in the dark, about to close this notebook up into one of the waterproof bags I habitually carry with me everywhere. Living on a boat, I learned quickly that if you want to use shit more than once, you keep it in the waterproof bag. I'll throw the bag as far out of my reach as I can. If I do turn, at least my last words won't be covered in shit. 26. Worth it. The PV formerly known as the Warden Slice was uncharacteristically late. There had been a newly born whitetail fawn recently dropped by its mother only a short distance back. Just born, it wasn't yet able to walk. The mother certainly was, and it wasn't waiting around with a blue one close. When faced with life or death, even a new parent will sometimes choose flight over protecting a young one. That was probably the most prudent choice the animal could have made when faced with a starving monster. Doe could have been added to the menu tonight but chasing it was out of the question with a ball of tender, succulent meat lying immobile on the ground. Though the female would enjoy devouring every piece of this buffet, it was a shame that the mother deer bolted. The meal could have been made that much larger. At least the steaming placenta remained on the ground. Breaking into the soft bones and sucking down the indescribably delicious marrow was entirely worth it. There was something about the taste and texture of the lifeblood from an animal so new to this world. Getting a mouthful of the still-beating heart was beyond exciting. Listening to the weak screams of the newborn mammal only made the treat more invigorating. Imagining this to be the target on the floating construct made the meal almost rapturous. After the tantalizing snack time was short, the peavy reached the edge of the clearing just in time to watch two of the pale ones in their metallic coverings climbing up the web on the side of the construct. It was no loss to the female. These pale ones remained shelled before and after entering the cave. Like always, their ritual was as customary as this one. One day, though, Ezekiel Collins would be accessible. Interlude 3 Mole Gray Fox here, you read? Every night at the same exact time. He worked like a clock. Well, I have no clue about last night. I was too busy clearing a dam and almost getting turned into a zombie. I responded with a smirk. No. I waited for several seconds. Nothing. A few more seconds went by and still no reply. Thousands of horrible scenarios ran through my mind. Fearfully, I asked a question. Daddy? Mo Gray Fox here. Do you read now? Apparently, he was going to be an asshole and not even allow me to be sarcastic. I can't be anything else. Really, I shouldn't have been expecting him to have a sense of humor, especially over the radio. Yeah, I got you. My father came out of his saving private Ryan lingo. 
Wow, you're alive. How about those nightly debriefs? I knew what he was doing. I had said the same thing to him way back when he didn't get with me the night we left Gunnersville. The rest of the crew must have been too busy doing absolutely fucking nothing to get on the radio last night. So I guess that means he knows not a damn thing about Festus or that debacle with the pirates. I'll probably have to fill him in on the ship that went down last night, too. That'll be fun. Smirking in spite of myself, I echoed his response from when we departed. Yeah, sorry about that. We were clearing a dam last night, and I almost got infected. His eyebrows arching was nearly audible. What? Regretting I had said anything, I tried to give the simplest answer. I'm okay, it didn't bite me. Just a scratch. No signs? He almost sounded like he wished there were. My smile sounded through the radio. Nope. Always the optimist, Daddy continued. Well, you could still be turning. Maybe you're just a slow burn. He then spoke to my brother through the radio. Easy, keep an eye on Mo. There's always a chance. My brother only grunted in acknowledgement. Easy was willing to end my life if I broke out into a sweat or let a nasty fart. Have I ever told you how much I love my family? My dad is convinced that I'm about to become a zombie, given that he knows next to nothing of what happened. On top of that, not only did my father tell him to, but my bald-headed sibling is more than ready to murder me if my skin tone changes in the slightest. The rest of the crew spoke to the radio in turn. Of course, their lazy asses weren't to blame because they broke protocol and didn't radio dad the night before. That subject was entirely skipped over. When it came around to the tech, he looked longingly into the speaker. Is Hunter around? My dad snapped. Oh, yeah. Hang on, I'll get them in here. I could imagine my dad walking to the door and screaming until someone came to see what he wanted. My mom entered with the boy and encouraged him to tell a joke. Hey, Gene, why didn't the leopard go on vacation? Gene barely held back a tear when the boy spoke his name. Hey, buddy. I don't know. Tell me. Hunter could barely get the answer out. Because he couldn't find the right spot. He exploded into fits of laughter and was probably rolling on the floor. Gene was also laughing like it was the most hilarious line ever told. He was wiping his eyes, and I don't bet the joke was what made him weep. That's a good one. I love you, Hunter. No response came from the boy. My dad sounded apologetic. Sorry, you can't get much more out of him than that. It's a start. The tech seemed satisfied. That's all right. I like the joke. Okay, I'll admit it. It made me smirk, too. Mama gave greetings and I love yous to all of us before running out of the room to keep an eye on Hunter. Daddy sighed once they were out of earshot, confident he could talk about the happenings on the island, especially happenings revolving around the supposed temporary replacement for the man of God. He finally did it. Who did what? I questioned like a spectator that had no clue what was going on. He was enraged. The some bitch Brother Brown came out and said he's suspicious of your mama and me. He said it after another girl went missing yesterday. I was surprised I hadn't been curious earlier. Brother Brown? What's his first name? Mike. My jaw dropped, though he couldn't see it. Mike. Mike Brown. Michael Brown? My dad hesitated. Uh, I figure... I paused even longer, hoping he would figure it out himself. I don't guess he got it. Come on, Michael Brown! Hands up, don't shoot! My dad seemed completely ignorant. Okay. It's like the sense of humor for the entire island fucking leaves with me. This is as bad as Bobbit and Dick. I tossed the radio to the protector, disgusted. I was completely unable to carry on a conversation with someone that had missed an entire decade worth of current events. Gray Fox, Iron Man, how do you read? My dad gave just a one-word grading. Easy. My brother continued asking about the situation with the preacher. So he said he thinks it's you. Does he have any proof? My dad scoffed. No, but he says he's going to start an investigation. And what did everybody else think when he accused you? I was taken aback at his uncharacteristic use of profanity. 
Of course the dumb shits believe every damn word he says. It's sickening. He calmed down. But Benji and his crew know we're not kidnappers. They're all on our side. So are the Phantoms and the police department. Oh, and the army guys. I almost forgot about the soldiers that surrendered on the day the Peavies became daywalkers. I'm glad he has the guys with guns backing him up. I broke back into the conversation with my usual ass hattery. You sure about that? That kind of language is something only a child murderer would use. He sighed. What makes you think they are murdered? Damn. I just figured they'd be dead. Especially the first one after being gone for so long. Dad knew I was more of a pessimist than he. I just figured... My brother thankfully decided to discuss what was coming and end my embarrassing speculations before they could begin. You know, we're getting closer to Mississippi. I think there are a few more locks on the ten time before the last stretch to Columbus. That's a good fucking estimate. In Easy's world, 7,000 is a few. That's why I didn't want to come down this damn river. We'd waste decades going through all the locks and dams. The protector continued. We're going to stop in Columbus and get off there. Me, Bradley, and the Phantoms will get off the boat to head to Tusk. The mention of the city brought something to my dad's Alzheimer's-ridden mind. Columbus. Benji told me a story about the Air Force Base there. I'll have him over one night, and he can tell you about it. I think you are going to need to go there. We just might need to, but I've always had trouble believing most of what my dad says he heard from someone else. It's like going into the Alzheimer's unit of a nursing home and hearing World War II stories from a man born in 1930. Yeah, he could have been in the Pacific Theater in 1945. He might actually even believe with every fiber of his being that he is telling the truth. But without some other type of evidence, you have no proof. And he could just be a crazy old man babbling about shit he's not sure of. If what he's telling you is not true, it's not a lie because he would swear to God that it really happened. But you could take it with a grain of salt. Talking to my dad about offhand third-person knowledge is kind of like that. I looked up in the dark, utterly cloudless sky. Well, it looks like it's about to start raining. We're going to have to let you go, Daddy. My brother spoke to me incredulously. No, it's... I threw up my hand. Roger, I'll be sure to get Benji. Gray Fox over and out. 27. Mo, Journal Entry 3 I was nearly gleeful when my partner was chosen for this mission. We weren't going into one of the millions of fucking dams that magically sprang up before we started our trip down the Tennessee River. Some of the damn dams didn't even seem to have a purpose other than just being in the fucking way. Providing electricity? Of course not. The goal of the Tennessee Valley Authority in building these non-hydroelectric locks decades ago was to be a pain in the ass for some loser whose parents weren't even born yet. Easy told me not to go on any mission with you. The old friend looked back over his shoulder while Mary sat on the other smiling her toothless grin and shaking her head. Then he threw a thumb at the expert. But she's going, so I'm cool with it. They could have partnered me with Jane again. We were going into another pawn shop to scavenge ammo and guns. It was hard to understand at first. Apparently ammunition isn't automatically added at the beginning of each mission. Plus there's physical wear on firearms. Every video game I've ever played has lied to me. I demand a refund. Hammer went on each quest to scavenge armaments. I don't know why the screenwriters saw fit to send me with her almost every time. At least I'd been partnered with a seven-pound monkey. Oh, don't forget about Joe from Family Guy. Not that I'm prejudiced against disabled people or anything. I'm just hoping everything is paved and the doors are wide enough. Think the bathroom is ADA compliant? From the parking lot, there was a cement ramp leading up to the sidewalk for Bradley to use. It was pretty steep, and I don't know if I could have pulled it off, but he unsurprisingly launched up it without a thought. That doesn't say anything about my worth as a man because I'm fairly certain Mary wouldn't have been able to do what Bradley did. This place was basically on the waterfront of wherever the hell we were, but it wasn't called Lakeview Pond or some retarded shit like that. If you can believe it, this place was called Larry's Pistol and Pond. I thought Larry's was in Huntsville. Is this some kind of franchise thing? Samus swiveled her helmeted head to face me. Even through the faceplate, I could see she was rolling her eye. 
The one in Huntsville doesn't have some kind of trademark on the name. I really enjoyed being talked to like I'm a retarded child. Whenever she goes into her tirades, am I the only one that pictures a female version of Gunnery Sergeant Hartman? Well, minus the profanity and choking, she can bring a person to tears by using polite language. There was no laughter, but I almost cried under the weight of the demeaning metallic glare of the Metroid Prime protagonist. Of course, I don't feel like a fucking human being. Like a movie, the door was unlocked. It seems everyone, everywhere, was similar to the citizens of Gunnersville and had refused to prepare for the coming tidal wave of blue. Even pawn shop owners, the people you would most expect to be prepared for riots or some type of economic crash, didn't even go into lockdown mode. Maybe they left their doors unlocked because they were expecting the zombies to be forced to ask for entry. Shit, I've been watching too much True Blood with Jane. You probably knew it. Bradley was the first one in the building. There was no threat of immediate peeves through the door. He was confident of this given the early detection alarm on his shoulder. Hammer waltzed in directly behind them. Can you guess who was dragassing? I pushed my way through the door, a bit insulted that neither the guy in the wheelchair nor the elderly woman held the door open for me. Yeah, I said it. I feel like I've been here before. I looked to the expert with a raised eyebrow. Are you sure Larry's is in the chain store? Her only response was to hold up a scary finger. Inside I could see this was Larry's pistol and pawn to a T. Or would that be an L? There was a line of glass gun cases to the left going to the opposite side of the large room. Just like the Larry's I had been in, there was the same type of display cases starting immediately to the right and stretching nearly halfway down the main room. Also, there was one on the opposite wall. This place was jam-packed with firearms. Hopefully there would also be ammunition. The cases were overflowing with pistols and the walls were lined with every kind of long gun imaginable. How about we jack a fucking pickup, Cap? No way in hell I'm carrying these all the way back to the boat. The owner of Bottom Dollar Pawn was in awe. We had just hit the jackpot. I don't think we could use all these guns even if we wanted to. We will find a way to get what we need back. Don't try to tell me I'm the only one that pictured one of those Asian guys pulling a cart. Too bad Benji's not here. We could always use Bradley like an ox cart. There's got to be some kind of wagon at a close-by hardware store. Damn, I've realized that I'm not only racist, I'm also bigoted against disabled people. Mobilist? Pedalist? The last one sounds too much like pederast. Ding, ding! The old friend and I both froze and looked at Hammer incredulously. Ding, ding! Are you fucking serious? I face-palmed, succeeding in nothing but clanking my armored glove against my Cylon helmet. The expert slowly turned from ringing the chime on the counter. What? Why the hell are you doing that? She threw her chin up. Calling for service. I had to grab the gun rack beside me to keep from falling over. You're shitting me. Breathing deep to prevent an aneurysm, I tried to speak calmly. The only thing you're calling is the fucking peeves. What the fuck? She's not stupid. At least I didn't think she was before that moment. Neither is she in total denial. It was beyond understanding how or why the expert would choose to act as if this were any other day before my day. Wearing fantasy armor and carrying a fucking sword, she's well aware we aren't in a city populated by humans going about their business. It's like she is coherent all the time, but chooses the most inopportune times possible to be delusional. Before I could curl up into a ball and start crying, distant howls and barking sounded. Fuck me! I glared at Hammer, completely unaffected by my blank metal stare. Damn it! Looking over to the paraplegic daredevil, I simply nodded. He pulled out Lucille, his Louisville slugger wrapped in barbed wire, a replica from The Walking Dead, over his shoulder. He took a few practice swings as Mary cracked her knuckles brushing her hand over the Romulan throwing dagger on her hip. I unslung my Klingon batlith and prepared for the horde. Hammer unsheathed the flame of the West, and Dural, her Lord of the Ring broadsword from its scabbard. We were ready for a brawl. As if it were a fucking needed reminder, Hammer called out an order. Melee first, firearms only if needed. 
The mentally disabled children in the room were aware we were desperately low on ammo. Thanks, Cap. Shit, even Mary knew we had to be conservative with our lead. Apparently at random we took positions. From the door, the old friend and his daredevil spandex waited at the twelve o'clock. The expert stood ready at two o'clock and I loitered at something close to three. I know you're going to ask, why the hell didn't one of the idiots surrounded by a million dollars worth of firearms even look for more bullets before the damn zombies showed up? Well, this entry wouldn't be near as fun to read if we had done something to save ourselves some damn time. The first of the half-starved lunatics burst through the door. It froze and looked at each of us in turn. Did this one just get the short straw to be the first in? Whimpering, the PV looked back over its shoulder before turning again to face us. Was its mother on the other side of the glass door giving this one a stern look and pointing for it to move forward? However reluctant the cannibal was initially, it started a slow trot in our direction. Unsurprisingly, the animal chose to charge the most unfit member of our trio. No way it could see through the armor. Maybe I just put off the vibe of being a pussy. Or perhaps I just smell like a coward who eats pickled eggs. Either way, it snarled and crept at me tentatively. It was like watching a slow-motion video of a malnourished smurf struggling against mind control. The beast didn't want to attack, having to force itself to take steps. Getting to inspect what we're now dealing with closely was so exciting and simultaneously insanely fear-inducing. There was almost an urge to scream and look away, but wanting to see this creature up close was intriguing. The rapid evolution of the Pavey's optics had taken just over a month. That could be seen by looking at the visible pupil of the sickly yellow orbs. Rapid evolution was apparent, but the changes in muscle structure were breathtaking. Somehow the muscles in its back seemed to have shifted down. The way its arms jutted out gave it the appearance of something more primal. What had once been a young man was now similar to Beast from the X-Men, sans the blue fur. First generation X-Men. Really? Now? I can't wait to tell Jane. The blue skin and subhuman yellow eyes were scary as fuck, but even the facial structure apparently morphed into something like a demonic alien animal. No, I don't mean it looked like a cat. Of course, the cheeks were gaunt and hollow. Really, it didn't look like it was only from the lack of food, but a natural sickly emptiness. As if any part of these fucking creatures can be considered natural. Besides just that, the lower jaw was clearly sticking out further than that of most Homo sapiens. The top canines also appeared more prominent. Not fangs, but they looked slightly longer than I last remember seeing mine in the mirror. Having creeped the holy fuck out of you, just remember that this is all speculation based on the study of one PV. Perhaps it was just some kind of fucked up retard in life. I know I've been up close and personal with numerous PVs over the millennia we've been on the river, I just haven't taken the time to look at them closely. The fact they are usually screaming, shitting, or trying to bite me draws my attention away from a fucking medical examination. The rail-thin monster with an erect and also rail-thin penis hesitantly charged. I held my batlith horizontally, about chest level. Stepping forward, I made sure to put both hands firmly around the grips. Not because I have ever dropped the damn thing before. Honest. Stepping forward slowly, it was apparent I didn't really want to get any closer to the damn thing than it did to me. Why the hell do the peavies get aroused when food is in the vicinity? Sure, I'll admit I get excited to see a steak on the table, but I don't pop a fucking boner. Admit it, we've all noticed dogs get excited about food from time to time. But shit, I don't remember the last time I saw a PV when it wasn't pitching an invisible tent. By the way, this particular invisible tent would have to be exceptionally lightweight. That steak wasn't going to hold up very much or very high. The snail's pace version of Mortal Kombat collided with disgusting effect. My alien blade was pushed out at the last instant. The inner points penetrated the blue skin between its penultimate rib and the one above on with both sides. Yanking my weapon to free it, the shrieking nudist came along with it. Why the hell do I have a problem with getting my steel stuck in ribs? I thought about planting my foot on the stomach and just getting it loose that way, but before I attempted that, I decided to try flipping the grips down, bringing the blade up and back towards me. I should have tried kicking it. 
Maybe because of the poor eating habits of revenants, the skin had become just as weak as the bone. The ribs my blade was currently pushing against caved in under the stress and splintered like toothpicks. Dermis exploded right along with it, breaking open like a rotten tomato in the sun. My blade came free as the belly below the ribs fell open and spilled most of its contents onto the floor. A shriveled stomach was recognizable. I couldn't tell the difference, however, between colon, liver, pancreas, spleen, or any other organs that rolled out with a sickening plop. Alas, it was easy to tell intestines when steaming, shit-filled tubes came pouring out, seeping onto the floor. Three fat men that just left an all-you-can-eat buffet couldn't come close to the amount of reeking sludge that seemed to roll endlessly from the now-dismembered organs. Sloppy logs of mushy, runny licorice crackled as they touched air. Taking in the near-consciousness-depriving scent of the porridge coated in melting tires was such a fucking bonus. I'd never ask for anything for Christmas ever again. The creature could only stare down at its fresh entrails, mouth agape. Accusingly, the bewildered gaze asked an unspoken question. Why did you do that? I need to start being more efficient in killing the damn things, rather than just brutally maiming them. Shit. Hold still and out. Hammer took this late opportunity to step over and swing her massive broadsword between me and the ghoul. The blade zinged through the air, coming entirely too close to me, being brought to the end of its journey after slicing through the neck. Unexpectedly, it didn't make the pass cleanly, as you would figure a razor-sharp blade to do. I had seen it do exactly as one would guess more than once. Why the hell do weird things occur when I'm around? Even though I saw the edge of the sword drive straight through, it was nearly like she pushed Anne Durrell through it sideways. The throat and arteries were forced back to where the hairline of an attached head would be. Dark red blood flowed behind it causing the floor to be black and nearly like the animal had been full of feces. The cranium rolled over, a ragged stump facing me. Unsure why, I almost laughed as the dying nerves fired, causing its tongue to jerk around in the mouth, thereby making the uvula bounce up and down. After a couple of seconds, the eviscerated twitching body fell over into the slop covering the ground in front of it. Like a movie or a novel, the horrific event seemed to drag on for an eternity. In actuality, it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. Horror was perceived instantly through vision. On paper, it takes paragraphs or pages. Just be glad you are only reading about the disgusting events and don't have to watch out for their unfolding smell. Completely dumbfounded, I dropped my hands to my sides. Why didn't you do that earlier? Samus looked at me surely giving me the stink eye behind her helmet. Because I thought you could handle it. She didn't say it, but we all know she was thinking it. Apparently not. Really? Really? You really thought I ever had a handle on fucking anything? Well, I guess I'll know next time. My only response was to flip her a skyward left-handed metal bird. Just as I was about to say something, Surely stinging to the expert, a keening sounded from behind her. We both looked to see Mary pivot on Bradley's shoulder to face the far corner. I knew this building looked bigger from the outside. Obviously, this was the pistol section of the building. The other side must have been the pawn part. That kind of makes sense now. Larry's pistol and pawn, get it? The undead were now coming at us from the outside and through that interior door in the corner. Oh, joy! Why didn't we just give the damn monkey a gun? She could carry a small three eighty or a Derringer pistol. It goes without saying she'd be a better shot than me. Now I can't get the image of Mary in a 19th century western women's outfit with a garter belt out of my mind. A blue cannibal burst through the door with no time to even take a glance at its surroundings. A thick gray-handled dagger appeared, sticking into the door facing behind it. Oh, the Romulan throwing knife was also sticking through the thing's neck. It gurgled and kicked a few times before gradually growing still, hanging limply on the short blade. Mary just had to prove she was more of a badass than I could ever be. The innocent sprang from her master's shoulder, bounced on the display case a good six feet away, wrapped her hands around the knife, pushed off on the truly dead infected to again land on the counter, and then backward jumped to land perfectly still on Daredevil's muscular shoulder. Don't forget that in the jump back to her original position, she made sure to do a fucking somersault. 
Why the hell doesn't Mary count as the third member of the party? She can do a shitload more work than me. You can bet your ass she's better at it than I am. Clearly, she's more efficient with her blade. While I was still trying to wrap my mind around the flying monkey ninja on the other side of the room, raving nudists were piling unnoticed through the front door. Like opening night of the Dark Knight. The armored heroine sure noticed. Her mad rush into the coming horde broke me away from my daydreams of the incredible primate. Shit. I was going to have to join in the melee. Andural must have been enchanted or had a fucking power-up. When Hammer brought her blade around in a half circle in front of her, I swear it actually knocked PVs down that she didn't even touch. She sliced open at least half a dozen monsters. Another six were lying on the floor with clearly broken bones. Again, I'm not sure how the hell that was even possible, but there it was. A torrent of blood and bodily fluids appeared as the flame of the West disemboweled, dismembered, and completely fucking destroyed every blue zombie and naked cannibal it came in contact with. I was pretty sure I even saw some green blood. Looking a bit closer, I couldn't see any pointed ears. There was, however, more than one soft penis about the thickness of an elf's ears. Don't ask me why I looked or how I know that. More than one of the undead was merely cut in half. Insane screaming came as the upper body slid away from the rest of the animals. Organs spilled and squished onto the floor. These ghouls suffered immeasurable pain, but they were probably the lucky ones. They would die while maimed fellows writhed and pleaded with their blue deity for an end to their tribulations. Demonic creatures not killed outright had to stare at their own organs that were vital in the digestion process. It's beyond understanding to see so many empty and shriveled stomachs, none larger than a peanut, lying among intestines that were bursting at the seams with what looked like chunky chocolate pudding. If these things were starving, how were they crammed full of shit? If all these lunatics had been female, I'd suggest they add more fiber to their diets. The expert's apparently magic bone-crushing broadsword left quite a few naked cannibals with a caved-in pelvis, destroyed hips, smashed ribs, and some broken spines. The peavies lying awake but unmoving must have been paralyzed. Hammer stepped to the side, gesturing with her elbow for me to come forward. I called to her back. Come on, Cap! What I did to the first one was bad enough. You really gonna make me torture more of them? Well, shit. Just then, the second wave started coming through the door, tripping over their dead and dying comrades. It looked like I was up at bat again. The old friend watched his own ceaseless blue tide swarming through the interior door from the other side of the building. He readied Lucille, while the familiar on his shoulder brandished her tiny blade and hissed through her toothless mouth. The animals had to come through the door, past the corner of the glass counter, and then turned to make their way to the bodybuilder clad in red spandex. Slamming the Louisville slugger directly into the nose of the first comer, my former classmate shouted gleefully, Home run! The baseball bat caved in most of the skull without much resistance. Noses immediately exploded under pressure, driving back into the sinuses. The roof of this peavy's mouth folded upwards as its teeth rained down. Yellow eyeballs burst when touched with the barbs, sinking in with the rest of the face. Everything in front of the ears pushed violently back into the brain case. The rabid nudist was comatose before it crashed to the hard floor, cracking the other side of the skull like an egg. Bloody gray matter, mucus, saliva, and running feces pooled on the floor below it to form a congealing grayish substance. Lucille plowed through a blue throat on the right as a peavy approached Bradley's left side. Yellow eyes were locked on the innocent with reckless abandon. She casually waited for the creature to draw close, opening its mouth wide for her scream in a bite. As it came near enough for Mary to reach, she raised her dagger without paying much attention and shot it straight into the zombie's gaping mouth. Blade sliced through uvula, rupturing tonsils and jamming into the back of the throat so forcefully the blood-coated tip could be seen protruding from just below the skull. Gallons of blood geysered from the oral cavity, ensuring nothing would ever be swallowed in the few short minutes of life the thing had left. Its stinking bile-like tainted blood sprayed all over Bradley's tire. I'm glad he was wearing gloves. That's icky. He shattered the kneecap of a revenant as another surged past its doomed compatriot. The old friend swung his bat further past where he struck his original target. 
The jagged barb slammed into the back of the thighs before Bradley yanked upwards. Arterial blood and shit mixed as the PV bellowed and dropped to its knees. Without being ordered, Daredevil's service monkey hopped to the ground to reach into the maw of the quickly fading demon she dropped. Jerking her bloodied knife free, she stepped over to the creature crying and holding its weeping knee, launching herself onto its shoulder. The carnivorous ape stared at the brutal imp silently. A warning never came as the dagger handle appeared, protruding from the left eyeball. She kept her hand on her tiny sword and rode the beast down to the ground. As if I didn't feel useless enough, she strode over to jam her blade into the back of the reanimate skull that was already minutes from Blue Eternity. As she wrenched her blade free from the leaking brain casing, she glanced in my direction with a gleam in her eye. What now, bitch? I was so entranced watching the superhero and his unbelievably badass simian sidekick send the scourges to their true deaths, I wasn't able to assist in the raging battle to my front. Turning my helmeted head, I noticed the expert was decapitating or penetrating the brains of the few living monsters still screaming on the floor. At least she was ending them quickly. Just to let Samus know I can pull my own weight, I rushed over to one of the fallen creatures to put it out of its misery. I slammed my batlith between its eyes, driving the blade to the floor on the other side of its skull. Making myself look hardcore, I brought the upper point to me, causing the cranium to burst apart. My knees nearly buckled when bloody scrambled eggs and snot rolled out into the space between the halves of the skull. Fuck! Now I get that this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs commercial. Except this time it wasn't drugs. It was a motherfucking Klingon batlith. I drew the picture of me doing all the work in the fragile old lady spectating. It's okay, Hammer. I got him. The expert was surely rolling her eye behind the faceplate. Thank God for you, Elmo. In response, I grimaced. Where are the delusions now? Not one damn zombie came through the front door. If they had any olfactory receptors left and were within a mile, they must have been able to sense the literal metric tons of rotten potting soil and the SeaWorld-sized swimming pool worth of stinking infected blood. Any blue bystanders in the parking lot could undoubtedly see their dismembered brethren splattered on the glass door and carpeting the floor. Even mindless husks were smart enough to avoid walking into Captain Sledge's house of horrors. We could finally relax. Over my shoulder I noticed the incredible duo, separated only by species now mopping up the last few stragglers coming through their door. The old friend lowered the walking dead bat to the level of his knees. At just the right moment, he flicked his wrist up to knock against the pelvic bone of a former human. Of course, this pulverized the twig and blueberries on the way. Scrotum basically exploded before penis lodged somewhere above the intestines. Mary lifted her dagger in front of her, pointed down. She jumped just over the now-stunned Peavy, wrapping both feet and hands around the handle and landing perfectly in the center of the skull. She drove the blade on down to the hilt. As yellow eyes rolled back into the monster's head, she rode the now truly undead to the floor, violently yanked her blade free as she landed. Executing a perfect roll in the only clean spot on the floor, she somehow did a mid-air somersault, bouncing off the wall to land on her master's shoulder. What the fuck? There's no way she did that. She's just a monkey. I know I sure as hell couldn't do it. Aren't I supposed to be on a higher evolutionary plane than her? Looking over at the armored heroine, I propped on my batlith. So, should we go help? She chuckled. No, they're taking care of business. We continue taking it easy while watching the horde be decimated. Slinging some fifty shades of gray matter from Lucille, Daredevil spoke without looking at us. Thanks for the help, guys. I laughed. You didn't need us. You had that tiny fucking ninja to back you up. Conceding the point, he shrugged. Well, I guess that's all the Ruskies. Let's grab some ammo. Motherfucker! Are you shitting me? Every damn shelf where ammunition would have been was completely bare. Even the back room was empty of shells. There wasn't even a damn brick of twenty-two. We nearly turned the entire place upside down looking for one bullet. Bradley made his way into the room at the very back of the building, the area set aside for a shooting range. The old friend finally found something. Aha! Uh -huh. Here you go, Hammer. 
He tossed a forty-five ACP magazine to her. Full mag, almost. He glanced over to the body of the man that held the pistol with a now empty well. There was no way to know if this was Larry, an employee, or just some random customer. The survivor obviously secured himself in this vault of a room, safe from the peavies. Only later did he discover being secure didn't mean shit if you didn't have food. Maybe there was some freeze-dried stuff in the pawn shop. The guy didn't want to risk going out and getting bitten. Or maybe he just didn't want to go on as one of the last living people on Earth. He made himself comfortable on the throne of sandbags, put his 1911 in his mouth and spoke his last muffled goodbyes. The mummified corpse told us he did this a long time ago. Surely he wouldn't have been alive by the time we got here. There wasn't a note and nothing scratched onto the cement wall. Sealed into this room, his stench was completely blocked off from the zombies. I guess it was just saved for the dumb bastards that first opened the door. Us. Boy, ain't we fucking lucky. Stupefied, I tried to wrap my mind around all the shit we just went through. Nine rounds of forty-five. That's it. Hammer held up a duffel bag, nearly bursting at the seam. I got a bunch of repair kits for the ARs. Oh, thank God! We'll be able to fix our guns we can't even fucking use because we don't have ammo. Samus shrugged. Well, it's better than nothing. Pretty good haul. Let's go home. Sadly shaking my head, I mumbled under my breath. Good God, what the hell is wrong with these people? 28. Joyous. Silent. Hidden. Undetected. That was the female's attempted goal each time they closely followed the pale ones every time they left the floating construct. This cycle there were three. No, there were four. The tiny hairy one resting on the shoulder of the short squat one was different but the same. They remained completely unaware of their shadow. It was surprising they weren't able to smell danger, being in such proximity. One of the two shelled creatures carried something that held other things. What was this? Where did it come from? And where were they taking it? Knowing there would be no opportunity to strike, just as every other time the pale ones were exposed in any form, the peavy grew accustomed to studying the tasty animals. The large misshapen log was full of some strange items. It was just as perplexing as most of what the animals did. It was extremely frustrating not to have a chance at getting just a small taste. Even though the creatures coming away from the construct were usually not the targeted, smooth-headed beast, the bounty of one close to it would be somewhat satisfactory. Knowing Ezekiel Collins would be feeling loss was exciting beyond just the imagining of a full meal. Ripping the throat from one of these pale ones would be perfect. It would slowly suffocate, using the last few minutes of life to fight in vain. Dark crimson would flow as it slowly grew weak and eventually sank to the ground in defeat. After losing consciousness, the PV formerly known as Warden Slice would dig into the chest and search for the beating heart before it went still. Taking a bite from that which was still living would be almost as joyous as listening to the screams of the target. These delectable thoughts made the female's mouth water. It also created a burning inside that was not the pain between the legs that comes once every full night orb. Soon dreams of devouring the target, Ezekiel Collins, would come to fruition. 29. Memoirs of Benji 3 my co-pilot, Devin Landers, in his Ghost Rider attire, laid his entire weight on the yoke. Our Jedi whirlybird, Skywalker, was pushing the abilities of its MH-60 Seahawk engine to the brink. I was outfitted as Indiana Jones, and our two new compatriots, brothers, Kevin and Scooter Dunlap, willed the frame forward through the air. Peavies in the area had been riled up, which meant no one on the ground was safe now. Their companion, Colin along with the two brothers had set out that morning with plans to drain, or at least find another way to access the nearby Lattawood water tower for a reliable source of clean water. His wife, teenage daughter Mary Ann, and Libby were all waiting at home for the returning conquerors. Well, not so much the conquerors. Colin was dead. Well, that was the only way I can think of him without being sick. Their plans had been dashed upon the rocks. 
Revenants had spotted them and started assaulting the three humans on the tower. The monsters would have had three new trophies if not for a duo of naval flight officers, an F.O. swooping in to save the day. Two of the trophies had been snatched from the blue jaws of the peavies. Now we were on our way to secure two more humans. I was hoping our luck would hold out. Colin's home was less than a mile from the Latterwood tank, as the crow, or in this case as the Skywalker flies. Being in close proximity to such a horrific battle scene and a legion of PVs meant those survivors were likely to be discovered. Why would the living people not have been found earlier, you ask? I have the same question. Probably because it wouldn't have culminated into such a climactic scene. Or to use another cliche, out of sight, out of mind. I'm as thankful now as I was then. This particular trip had been taken without my girl Amy. I'll credit Devon for keeping this blood-drenched day off her calendar. The losses of the Crossroads Mall had been devastating for her, whether she was willing to admit it or not. Witnessing more despicable acts of brutality and evil from the yellow-eyed spawns of hell would have only been salt in the wounds. There was plenty bad shit going around for everyone to grow used to it. Sometimes I think those of us that have survived the apocalypse have grown accustomed to loss and death. As fate would have it, my arrival at Kmart had a seemingly scripted quality. It saved her from meeting a torturous death at the hands of a cruel, twisted barbarian. So that's good. The script also demanded I not be able to save her mother and sister, who were living just before I got there. Even more reason that she didn't need to be exposed to the shit we saw today. Of course she'd tell you that she wasn't fragile and didn't need protecting. She could handle all this and more. Well, okay then, maybe. Contrary to popular belief, however, chivalry is not dead. I will spare the one I love any tragic circumstances, if at all possible. She can pay me back later by driving me to counseling. Mrs. Ashley, she don't know what's coming, Scooter mumbled, gazing to our destination. He was looking at a small brick house being encroached upon by a wave of blue. The peavies had been stirred up, and they didn't have trouble smelling fresh meat. I was stupefied. You didn't have a radio? Scooter dazedly shook his head in the negative. His brother Kevin answered for him. Well, we did in the truck. Colin didn't have time to grab it. My eyebrows rose. I spoke to Kevin through the headset, turning to fiddle with the controls on the dash. Channel, there might still be time. Setting the equipment to the frequency he indicated, I paused. I spoke the first thing that came to mind. CQ! CQ! After a beat, a female voice came back. Ah, uh, who is this? I spit out the fastest introduction possible. Benjamin Collins, formerly with the U.S. Navy. En route to your location in helicopter. Immediate evac required. The same female spoke. She at least understood basic abbreviations. I hear you coming. Why do we have to leave? She couldn't see what we could. The blue demons were surging in their direction at nearly the same speed as our chopper. It was like a scene from some horrific movie. Emaciated, naked blue monsters writhed and swelled over one another, seeming to be pushed onward by an invisible hand, like a blue tidal wave of inhuman flesh hell-bent on washing away humankind. Regardless of where they all had come from, it was easy to see their destination, a small house less than a mile away. How were they moving at such breakneck speeds? A continuous and animalistic, shrieking roar was almost deafening. Their unquenchable anticipation of delving deeper into the bottomless well of their satiation drove them forward, ever reaching toward new heights of depravity. The diseased, filthy mass pulsed from the water tower as if they had a marker on their HUD. Remember those stories about Genghis Khan and the Mongolian horde over a thousand years ago? No animal could have survived being caught in front of this stampeding force. Expectantly, a dark haze hung heavy in the air following the swarm. I was actually surprised to see bark still on most of the trees. The helicopter skid slammed into the earth with the force of a high-powered rifle. It was surprising the impact didn't warp the frame of the entire chopper. Two women, heads down, raced from the carport. I could see there was one pistol between them. Things like that make me shake my head and sigh. How the hell do unprepared people survive even in a world that wasn't blue and covered in shit? Then it happened. Some teacup, 
miniature dwarf rat dog bounded out of the girl's arms and hurriedly ran back into the house. Sergeant Peppers! Rating her terrified scream was easy. Libby bolted for the darkened doorway after the tiny nuisance. Peavies were charging madly down the hill, only a few hundred yards away. Are you surprised? As expected, the mother hen followed her chick home. Throughout my life, I've had more than one dog. The comradeship between owner and dog is insanely intense. I love those canines more than most humans and would have done nearly anything for them. But shit, I didn't carry around a helpless little noisemaker that always needed defending. Zombies would have been running away from my dog. As Marianne turned to go after her daughter, I almost spun to my co-pilot. Fuck it. You know how this goes. Let's just go home. But I didn't. Even though it almost made me weep to do it, I stayed in position to helplessly defend more doomed Americans. On one knee, I watched as the horde closed. Emptying a magazine of 556 into the surging zombies, I reached for another mag, fully expecting Kevin to pick up the other carbine and assist. It hadn't dawned on me what his next move would be. Before I could look up, the young man was on the ground, foolishly going to the aid of Marianne and Libby. He could have at least picked up the damn M4. Good thing he had his little twenty two rifle over his shoulder, because that thing was going to do him so much damn good. What seemed like several lifetimes before, but had only been a flash between Colin's home and the water tower, Kevin Dunlap took the opportunity and told me of the romance between him and Libby Ashley. They had been an item before things started going blue. When May Day happened, they were thrown together, and they remained inseparable. Fate had seen their love grow at a ridiculously high speed. They were now, for all intents and purposes, married. The two of them were trying, in spite of the apocalypse, to continue the human race. The love of his life was with child and in danger, and he couldn't think about anything except getting to her. My screams at his back went completely unnoticed. Scooter, Kevin's large simpleton brother, continued sitting on the bench, hands crossed over his lap. He just stared blankly after his sibling. Waving my arm in front of him several times, I finally got his attention. Questioningly, he looked down at me. I jammed a finger at the spare M4 on the deck. Of course, he violently shook his head in the negative. Was he afraid to use it? Or did he really not know how to point the muzzle and squeeze the trigger? After a long sigh, I picked up the carbine and started duly slamming lunatics with automatic bursts. Pieces of lead punched lines like ragged notebook holes in random intervals through the front lines. Dark puffs shot forth as an equally dark, oily residue was expelled in the other direction. It was doubtful the tiny bullets killed most of the undead in the second row and beyond, but I was able to take some twisted sense of pride in at least injuring them. Some of the discharged feces undoubtedly found its way into a few of the open wounds. Assuredly, this would lead to infection, and they would hopefully die a disgusting and torturous death. Festering and rotting decay was the slow road to the blue infinity, or so I imagined for these evil motherfuckers. The equivalent of gangrene was too quick and easy for these demonic scourges. Dozens upon dozens were put down only to be replaced instantaneously. Bodies of the dead or injured peavies were simply pushed aside or trampled into the ground by the oncoming horde, not even given a second thought. It was sickening just how much they didn't seem to care about their fellows. The prize of human flesh came above all else. Animalistic hunger outweighed any former humanity or even a basic need for safety. There had to be a fire in my eyes. You couldn't really call me conscious. I was just killing peavies with reckless abandon. Taking aim and squeezing the trigger? Hell no, I was throwing so much hollow point lead at the approaching ghouls that I don't even remember Devin calling my name. Had he been using the headset or just screaming? Actually, he might have done neither, knowing it would do no good. That is until he thumped something at me. Embarrassed he caught me, I had no idea if I had been laughing, crying, or a mixture of both. Facing my best friend, I attempted to appear blank and emotionless. Looking back, I realized there was no point. He undoubtedly knew precisely how I felt. What? I questioned through the microphone. Without speaking, he merely pointed to the house door under the carport. My gaze followed his finger and I cried out exasperatedly. Fuck, not again! It took me a moment to notice what he flicked at me to get my attention. 
Now a scarred quarter lay at my feet. Do I really need to tell you which side was facing up? Kevin Dunlap wasn't what you would call a strapping young man. His peers always considered him small, scrawny, and he had often been called weak. Having just graduated high school last year, Kevin received a scholarship for his vocal abilities. Never one for football or any sport, he was a star in choral. Years ago, he had fallen for Libby Ashley. The high school sweethearts had been going steady since his freshman year and had planned to marry after she graduated the next year. They had dreamed of children and a long future. That all changed on May Day. Just surviving until tomorrow was a struggle. Living for and keeping each other alive was all that was important. Plans no longer stretched into the distant future, only to tomorrow. Without any ceremony or legally binding contract, Colin and Marianne witnessed them marry. They swore to be together forever. Nothing could keep them apart. Kevin would make sure he was with Libby until the end. He could see what was happening. His wife and mother-in-law were trying in vain to keep the raving monsters from breaking down the door. They did a pretty good job of barricading the windows. It was just strange the PVs knew the doors of buildings were weak points. Did they have some knowledge of structural integrity from their past lives? How could a wild animal know the function of a doorknob? Regardless of how, but they seemed to know most exterior doors pushed inwards. A dozen yards away, he began shouting, Hey! Over here, you ugly smurfs! They turned as one, making him their sole target. Dunlap pulled his little twenty-two from over his shoulder. Every shot would have to count. The small rifle started popping, merely irritating the enraged nudists. Before they could lunge at the ill-prepared teen, my high-velocity rounds began peppering into them. The rounds from Skywalker may have offered some protection while Kevin was out in the open. Regardless, the Blunatics paid absolutely no attention to me. Instead, they focused on the three warm bodies with hardly any defenses. The boy had somehow worked his way around the peavies and was safely out of my line of fire. Giving my weapon a break to reload, he got his back to the door and started shooting, or knocking them away with his rifle butt. Sure, they were protected by the house on three sides, but barricades could be destroyed by hand much easier than full metal jackets. Would you rather run the gauntlet of automatic bursts, or charge face first into hot lead? Yeah, the zombies might have been stupid most of the time, but they could use their primal brains when it came to food. They know enough that if they can't get to the food, they can't eat the food. The boy with the twenty-two rifle sent multiple rounds at the beasts while backing inside the house. Though most of his shots only wounded the peavies, one of them did drop. He must have caught it in the eyeball or some other weak spot in the skull. It went rigid and then violently shot a stream of black foam from its asshole before falling over to its left. Standing in front of the women, Kevin was on the top step, nearly ready to back into the house and shut the door. There were only a few feet between him and the peavies. I took the opportunity to open up on his closest attackers. They were going to pay dearly for any ground they gained. The first recipient of a 5.56 took the initial round just below the left ass cheek. Thigh muscle exploded all the way around the bone, unwrapping like a sloppy filet mignon. Surely the femoral artery ruptured before the blue testicles popped like overripe miniature tomatoes. The insignificant penis vaporized under violent pressure. My next round caught the thing square in the asshole. For the briefest of instances, one could picture a blue Tara reed before the round erupted from the upper pelvic bone. What was left of the urinary tract was grotesquely severed. If these two rounds weren't enough, a final bullet drove into the lower back. It punctured the kidney before the rest of the digestive organs ripped to shreds. Baby diarrhea and thick blood mixed on the ground in front of it as it toppled to its knees. Its pain had to be excruciating, at least until blood loss robbed it of consciousness. Miraculously, three peavies dropped with the next burst. I didn't see the skulls or chests of any of them explode, but the trio toppled over forward. Now the corpses were unmoving except for final dark bubblings from spasming anuses. Kevin was able to make it inside and slam the door. The three within were surely piling objects against the entrances, attempting to slow the nudist cannibals. The seemingly limitless number of undead crammed themselves into the confines of the small carport. 
Tendrils of black slime clung to the car and every other surface they climbed over. Even without the heavy thudding of helicopter blades, I doubtfully would have been able to make much out over the animalistic howls, barks, and strange chittering of the peavies. Wood splintering was not audible, but clearly visible as chips of the door began flying above the zombies' heads. Of course the door was made of wood, though metal wouldn't have made much difference. Then it would be flying shards of metal. No thanks. Fate was a twisted some bitch. The question must be asked, why was the wood being chipped? How was the wood being chipped? Were they using tools? Thank God there was no electricity. They probably would have been using fucking power saws. Assuredly, they were using some simple bludgeoning devices. Still, that's a huge evolutionary leap for animals that get erections over dill pickles. Would it have been more entertaining for the humans to attempt to flee out of a window on the other side of the house, or did the audience enjoy watching what unfolded inside? I absolutely fucking never wanted to find out what happened in the Ashley home. Just speculating makes my stomach turn. All I can tell you is that we return to Gunnersville completely empty-handed. When you add the six souls lost at the Albertville airport today, and the five survivors connected to the Laddawood water tower, eleven members of the endangered species of Homo sapiens were lost to the sadistic predators that day. At this rate, humanity will be extinct before the canned food runs out. Being the only male of the trio, Kevin felt it was his duty to stack everything that weighed more than a few pounds in front of the door. Having been boarded up, every window in the house and even the other exterior doors were secure. Nothing would be getting in through any other point besides this door, at least without making a considerable racket. Only a few candles lit an eerily dark abode, casting long, strangely dancing shadows on the walls. Entering from the only accessible exterior doorway, the one from the carport, the kitchen-slash-dining room would be the first room accessed. Moving the refrigerator, table chairs, and nearly everything else Kevin could lift in the immediate vicinity had exhausted the young man. He realized pushing living room furniture against the pile would be pointless. If they were able to get around the fridge, a coffee table and a couple of recliners wouldn't stop them. The three of them were standing in the now empty, poorly illuminated dining room. Pushing off from the bar separating the kitchen and dining room, he began making his way to the master bedroom. This room would be their final temporary barricade while frantically trying to pry the boards from the windows to make a run to the helicopter. They would need more than luck to survive this. Kevin brushed Marianne's elbow as he passed her, leaning against the wall. Come on, Mrs. Ashley. We gotta get out the window to the helicopter. Characteristically, the woman was foolishly stubborn. Marianne wasn't willing to leave the place she'd called home for nearly thirty years to a bunch of shitting cannibals. She pulled away. No, I ain't leaving my house to those things. Having destroyed the door, the PVs were now pushing and banging against the refrigerator. It wouldn't slow them for long. The humans inside had to act fast or they'd be acting blue. Libby screamed at her mother. What the hell, Mama? We're leaving. She gestured for her husband. Get her and let's go, babe. The younger of the two women started walking to the back. Kevin grabbed his unreasonable mother-in-law by the shoulder and began forcing her into the hallway. This was her home. She wasn't willing to leave it to these monsters. This is my home. The only thing I have left. You bastards can't have it. A man putting his hands on her and forcing her to move panicked Mary Ann. Oprah had taught her everything she needed to know about feminism. The first rule was to always stand up for yourself, especially when being pushed around by a man. Her initial reaction was to make the misogynist back off. Inconsiderate of repercussions, she brought her right hand around. Marianne hadn't been one to carry firearms before May Day. Now she always kept a pistol on her and had fired more than one magazine of rounds. Finger always stayed inside the trigger guard, ready to pop off some twenty-five caliber rounds at the drop of a hat. Kevin let go of her when there was a light flash and a small pop. He stumbled back against the opposite wall, sliding down to a sitting position. A dark red gushed between his fingers, his hand stopped over the small wound. Kevin's mouth involuntarily filled with saliva. He drooled as he shakily spoke. Mrs. Ashley? The question came out as if he wasn't sure it was her. Unbeknownst to the young man, those would be the last two words he ever spoke. Of course Kevin Dunlap didn't know it, 
but he'd be dead in minutes. The tiny round flipped between two of his ribs, slicing through his left lung before coming to rest in the right. Organs originally meant to hold oxygen were now filling with blood. Wheezing, he couldn't seem to catch his breath. Bleeding, confused, panicked, and suffocating, Kevin wouldn't have been able to speak now even if he wanted to. Marianne was in a state of shock, not believing she had just shot someone. She held the small black pistol up as if it were completely foreign to her. She gasped as it slipped out of her hand and clanked on the floor. It was somehow obvious Kevin was not long for this world. Should I apologize to him? I just murdered my own son-in-law, and for what? So I can die in this stupid house? Sergeant Peppers was sitting in his pet bed, chewing on a small cloth bone. Libby was relieved to have found her companion, and was even happier he was in the room where she'd be preparing to escape from. She could hear her mother and her husband speaking, surely about to enter. They would all be able to leave and go somewhere else. Making a mental catalog, she planned to grab several of Sergeant Pepper's chew toys. Libby Ashley Dunlip came out of the bedroom where she had been prying boards from the window. A considerable amount of light was shining through the now clear glass. She stopped, nearly directly between her husband, who was sitting on the floor, and her guilty-looking mother. Kevin looked up, barely coherent, and grabbed at her hand. It slipped away, revealing a coating of crimson. The young woman nearly screamed. Kevin! Are you bleeding? She angrily spun around to face her mother and held up her blood-covered hand. Mama! Did you do this? The report from the firing must not have been loud enough for her to hear over her frenzied working and the screaming of the peavies. Disbelieving she was capable of the act she committed, Marianne spoke dazedly. So, we're all dead anyway. She glanced down to the pistol at her daughter's feet. Briefly following the older woman's eyes, Libby looked again at her dying husband. She placed her arms over her midsection and insanely, mournfully wailed. You just shot the father of my child! Taken aback, Mary Ann hadn't realized. Kevin may not have even known without a sonogram. It may have only been a mother's intuition, but Libby was confident. In her rage, she reached down for the small pistol. Well, if we're all going to die anyway, you're next! She squeezed the trigger until only a click could be heard. Several tiny black spots peppered her mother's shirt, which blossomed, bleeding red all around them. Marianne backed against the wall and sank to the floor opposite Kevin. Knowing this was what she deserved, she looked up before consciously closing her eyes a final time. I'm sorry, she whispered. No time for remorse, Libby turned from her willfully fading mother to her barely conscious husband. She reached out to take his blood-soaked hand in hers. Come with me, baby. With all her strength, she nearly had to carry him into the bedroom. Slamming the door behind her, she locked it and pushed the chest of drawers in front of it. At least their last few minutes would be together and in the sunshine. Her mother's body would be what the Peavies took initial interest in, so the two of them would have peace, at least for as long as they needed. Before climbing into the bed, she picked up Sergeant Peppers by the scruff of the neck to take him in. Libby could take some solace in the fact that they would all be together at the end. Going out as a family was all she could hope for in these dire times. She lay down beside her dying husband and squeezed his slick hand. Facing one another, she leaned her head in for one last kiss. I love you, she sobbed. Kevin smiled weakly and closed his eyes. Looking up, she clenched her own wet eyes. Letting out a ragged breath, she tipped a lit candle off the nightstand and onto the carpeted floor. No matter how many magazines were emptied into the hoard, I couldn't stop them. There were fucking blue bodies in piles around the car. Somehow they still broke down the door. Whatever barricade the humans inside the house placed against it only briefly slowed the yellow-eyed demons. An excited inhalation from the entire group could be heard as the way was cleared. Cannibals swarmed through the door, shitting with frenzied delight. I was hoping the trio was at least in another room, attempting to get out of a window or something. Seeing them approaching with undeath would be a horrible sight to behold. Kevin! Scooter roared in brotherly rage. I'm coming! He leapt from the Skywalker, rushing to the carport. All I could do was hang my head. There was no point in bothering to shout for him to stop. 
You could bet I sure as hell wasn't going after him. Scooter was really trotting into a house overrun with peavies with no weapons. Thank God he was wearing a long sleeve shirt. I knew I would never see Scooter again. The events that unfolded inside the Ashley home would forever remain a mystery. Thank God for small blessings. Scooter Dunlap bounded over dozens of fallen bodies. Slick, stinking blood covered the carport. If he didn't brace himself several times, he definitely would have slipped. Kicking corpses from the steps, he made his way through the broken door and over the destroyed fridge. Across the room, the zombies were focused on something. Swarming around a figure on the floor, he could make glimpses between shuffling arms and legs. A wet tearing of meat could be heard. The unwrapping of flesh from bone was a poignant sound. Blue nudist growled and scuffled to get closer, to what had to be a body. Kevin? When Scooter spoke, several peavies spun to face him. They smiled, laying their sickly yellow eyes on new prey. Those lunatics who were currently not down on all fours, chopping away at the juicy meal before them, charged at the seemingly defenseless human. Planting his feet, he readied for the newcomers, a pair of crazies wrapped around each of his forearms. The solid piece of muscle that was Scooter rotated each elbow to ninety degrees. Faster than the eye could blink, he brought his fists together, slamming the peavies into one another. The impact caused legs to nearly pretzel themselves as pelvic bones melded together. The minute genitalia of each monster pressed into the other so hard they nearly became one unit. Lower bodies of the reanimants were destroyed as Scooter's elbows met and pulled apart repeatedly. Blue bodies finally unwrapped from his forearms, still breathing but never to walk again. He walked closer to the group, slurping up every juicy morsel of the cadaver on the floor. Lifting a broken table leg leaning against the bar, Scooter decided to make every one of them pay for what he assumed was Kevin. Peavies rushed the young man that now had a weapon. Drawing the piece of wood back, he readied it like a baseball bat. Three monsters went sprawling with one swipe. Ribs were broken, organs ruptured and skin split as the jagged table leg slammed into the one on the left above its hip. The club stopped somewhere near the belly button. A domino effect occurred sending the first crashing into the second. Weak from malnourishment, both hips and sets of ribs splintered when the middle contestant was forcefully sandwiched between its fellows. Animalistic screaming and whimpering came from the trio of immobile zombies bleeding on the floor. Scooter pushed the splintered end of his makeshift bat into the clavicle area, just above the collarbone of the next creature. It stopped to wail in pain and was unable to lift its now-pegged arm. Before it could do anything more than realize it was currently in a world of shit, the batter brought his tool to the left, slamming the pinned peavy into the cannibal beside it. Shoulders of both monsters shattered on impact. Both arms dangled, only connected to the blue bodies by flesh and sinew. No longer restricted by shoulder sockets, the scraggy bicep bones dug into the armpit of the opposing blunatic. Protruding through the tender skin of inner arms, the jagged ivory lodged in the other body. Little more than a stupefying pain could be understood by the nudists before they were violently pulled apart. Scooter again brought the pair together in a horrid union of pulverizing ribs. Cardiac muscle of the demon on the right ruptured, spraying quarts of blood from loosed arteries. The second infected didn't fare much better than the first. Right lung collapsed under the onslaught of another reanimate being pounded into it. Both figures dropped into bleeding, dying heaps unable to do anything but writhe in unimaginable torment. They were the last zombies coming at them. All the others were face first in a steaming mass of bloodied flesh. Scooter walked to the closest ghoul, ass up and pointing at him. Ruining its day, he pushed the pitted end of his blood-drenched table leg directly into the fleshy fun strip between the sagging anus and drooping balls. No matter which direction the jagged piece of wood went, the peavy would undoubtedly wish for true death. As a seemingly random choice, the survivor straightened his arm, pushing the end featuring his hand down, stretching the sack to the limit. Simultaneously, the jagged hardwood sliced into the rectum. Thankfully, this means shit would no longer hit the fan, at least not from this revenant. Before the scourge could spin around, he ferociously jerked his club from its new cavity, bringing a torrent of crimson with it. In less than a heartbeat, he lifted his improvised killing device in both hands and brought the broken end down in the middle of the lower back. 
Spinal cord was immediately severed along with most of the digestive organs. Reanimated corpse dropped limply into a clueless twitching pile. The neighboring zombie on the left stopped chewing, raised its head and took a look to its side. Seeing that its companion's only movement was twitching as it lay face first in the juicy meal before it, it made a confused noise. No movement or sound would ever be willfully made again by the beast as Scooter's homemade club was swung down at the base of its skull. Lack of proper nutrition due to starvation, a result of overpopulation by carnivorous apes with insatiable hunger. This had weakened the bone structure of some monsters, especially of those that were not necessarily the fastest or strongest. This was one of those unfortunate creatures. Brittle brain casing splintered as cerebral cortex ruptured. Connection between gray matter and the rest of the body was permanently disrupted when the carved oak masked uvula and tongue it found through crevices between the chipped and rotting teeth. Bloody mucus drained out severed sinuses and mixed with spinal fluid as the stinking substance gushed over destroyed lower jaw. On the other side of the first fallen blunatic was one of the rare female hunters. It could have been too old to bear children, or had possibly been surgically deprived of the ability to render offspring into this new savage world. Regardless of the reason, it was here rather than back at the nest, being protected by males. Why it was here ultimately made no difference to Scooter. Honestly, he hadn't realized the thing was female. Private parts, especially those of animals, were something he didn't pay much attention to. That is until he slammed his stick into the side of the creature and it rolled over with a painful screech. Deflated blue mammaries stared up at the innocent young man. Trying not to look at what he'd have at one time found embarrassingly exciting, he raised his eyes up to focus on the bedroom door, with smoke leaking out from around it. Not wanting to get in trouble for looking at bad, bad things, he blindly hammered the table leg into the body of the zombie repeatedly. Eventually, the whimpering and any noise from it subsided. Glancing down now, he saw that everything above the ribcage had been beaten into a pulpy mush. Grayish blue skin was coated in a bloodied slime, writhing and twitching as infected crimson blood poured from a heart that had ceased pumping to a brain that was no longer there. He refused to lower his gaze any further. There would only be really bad things down there to offend his eyes, Mom always said. The zombies on the opposite side of the torn open human were aware he was there. They were just unable to pry themselves from the delicious treat before them. Perhaps they were just hoping he'd leave them alone if they made no hostile move. It may have been stupid, but they were starving. When one of the peavies raised its head, bloodied, stringy meat dangled from a stuffed mouth. It looked straight at Scooter, making a confused or terrified noise. The jagged end of the table leg thrust into the right eyeball. At least three inches in, Scooter twisted the stick until he heard a satisfying yet sickening crunch. Reanimated corpse went limp, truly dead. The undead duo on either side of the first, now twitching, shitting form looked up. Faces were dripping dark red, specks of gelatinous grisly fat clung to their cheeks. The chewing, crunching, smacking, and overall mastication of a person was a stomach-turning distinction. Every one of the PVs refused to turn tail, even though they had that look in their eyes of animals ready to flee. Starvation made them steadfast. Compare it to starving hyenas feeding on a dead wildebeest, while a hungry lion fed on the same carcass. Even though the lion had slaughtered several hyenas in the past few moments, the others would keep eating on the carcass, hoping the lion would ignore them. Food was more important than anything to a starving animal. Making it quick, Scooter slammed his killing tool down just behind the skulls of the leftmost pair. He wasn't sure of the names of all the things vital for life that had just been destroyed. The clicks, pops, and snaps that sounded before the creatures collapsed were strangely satisfying. It was only a guess how they would see their ends first, blood loss or drowning in the gory meal on the floor. Twisting his wrists, the club rotated clockwise, catching the two on the right near the same area. Spinal cords snapped like taut rubber bands. These two were just as unable as the rest to willingly do anything. Tiny and black geysers momentarily erupted from between blue ass cheeks before becoming little more than wet bubbles. Finally alone, other than those PVs silently suffocating in a pile of eviscerated remains, Scooter listened for any movement. Besides the blades of the chopper outside rhythmically beating, he could make out crackling and popping. Fire! Looking around, he knew it was coming from behind the closed bedroom door. 
Taking a closer look at the ripped-apart human laying in a soup of nasty, he noticed they clearly weren't his brother. Though the color was discernible, being doused in blood, the hair certainly didn't belong to Kevin. Long. Like a girl's. Mrs. Ashley? Maybe it wasn't Libby. Trying to shake it off, he attempted not to think about the dead person. There was only one place Kevin could be, in the bedroom behind that door. When he reached the closed door, he could feel the heat radiating off it, remembering Smokey the Bear telling him not to touch the doorknob of a room that could be on fire. He started kicking through the thin door frame. I'm coming to save you, Kevin! Waving away the thick smoke, Scooter coughed, eventually making his way to the bed. A curtained four-poster, he lifted the shear and glanced in. There was his brother, laying calmly beside his sister-in-law. I found him! On his knees, he jumped onto the bed and started making his way to them. Holy crap, I was so worried. I think I got them all. We can get... The sentence trailed as he drew on his two last living family members. Kevin was unmoving and ghostly pale. There was a weeping hole in his side. When Scooter grabbed his hand, he was cold to the touch. The man leaned over Libby as her eyes started open. What happened? Scooter began sobbing. Did you hurt my brother? Libby Ashley Dunlap was lightheaded from smoke inhalation. Dazedly, she started to protest. No. I just had him lay down and... And you killed him in the bed! Scooter interrupted with an angry statement. He knew what she had done. <laughs> no, Scooter, I just... This time, the interruption came in the form of a broken table leg across the face. Teeth shattered and flew from her now broken jaw. You killed my brother! It's your turn now! She mumbled out a negative response from her bleeding broken and swollen mouth. In his rage, the large boy ignored her cries and pleas for him to stop. All he could do was wail uncontrollably as he beat the murderess to death. Once he finished punishing the woman he saw as a sister, he sat beside the cold form of Kevin. Holding his brother's hand, he bawled, completely lost. Kevin was his best friend. There was no reason to leave this room if his brother couldn't come with him. I'll stay with you, buddy. His older brother had always been his protector. Now Scooter would be watching over Kevin. I love you, Kevin. He wept while the black smoke grew thicker, making it hard to breathe. A few more crazies tried to get into the house. The initial dozens trickled down and finally stopped altogether. The last PV approaching didn't even make it to the yard. Three five-five-six rounds careened into it. Well, at least two of them actually hit it. I have no idea about the third. This PV must not have been to the point of starvation like the rest of them, choosing to keep its distance and discover my location rather than simply bum-rush the door. It tried to remain hidden as it slowly crept forward. I'm sure it wondered what the hell that big gray thing making all the noise was. Was this one not aware humans often carry projectile weapons? Stopping repeatedly behind tree after tree to take cover and peek out, it always did so from the left. As it drew on a tree, I scoped in just to the left of a large pine. Just a few more pounds of pressure on the trigger and the firing pin would be sending a trio of pieces of lead to the point my red dot indicated. An emaciated blue cranium poked from around the tree. The rifle bucked, but I was able to see the effects of my burst in fully magnified glory. My initial round sliced through the middle of the chin. Lower jaw separated cleanly, at least for a fraction of a second before blood could start flowing. The second shot slammed into the closed teeth. Undoubtedly cavity filled the tiny pieces of bone exploded before the bullet could drive further into the skull. Saliva in the mouth must have been boiling hot for the briefest instance. Could you imagine your own spit cooking your tongue? Tonsils surely simmered while uvula boiled. The unbelievable heat couldn't have registered as the entire brain casing rocketed in all directions like wet confetti. Discerning each individual piece was nearly impossible as fragments of skull became high-speed projectiles. Your guess is as good as mine as to what happened to that third full metal jacket. Things became disturbingly still. After years of being around loud, normally airborne vehicles, I learned how to tune out the deafening roar of spinning propellers. Some wouldn't believe one whose career revolved around jet engines on high-speed rotors could eavesdrop on a whispered conversation hundreds of yards away from an AC-130 ready for takeoff. But surprise was a great secret weapon. 
Listening closely, I only detected the breeze blowing across overgrown fields. Lack of bird noises was bothersome. No movement in the house. No more approaching zombies. Nothing. Finally, I could make something out in the silence. Crackling. Popping. Something on fire. Another moment and I could see thick smoke seeping out from a window on the far side of the house. The exact moment I noticed, Devin extended his arm to point where the smoke was coming from. I don't want to believe he knew the house was burning before it even started, so I just tell myself he just saw a wisp of smoke seconds before I did. That's how I sleep at night. Alas, he had surely foreseen everything that would happen at least moments before it actually occurred. Where were the four people in the house? Where were the peavies? My brain fucking froze up trying to speculate on what could have taken place in there. If any of the monsters survived, they sure as hell wouldn't be taking it easy. If the humans had killed every last revenant, they would doubtfully remain unmoving, even if infected. A headache was coming on while I was trying to decide what I should do. Could the living have snuffed out the unliving with their dying breaths? You could bet your ass I wasn't going in. It's stunning to watch a house burn. Flames engulfed the majority of the residents within moments. Some otherwise abandoned and dilapidated building would not go up as quick. A dry, lived-in house will be swallowed up in no time. This was disheartening. Of the eleven thinking and breathing humans we discovered today, not a damn one of them were saved. Why were we wasting fuel? Was he just waiting for me to break again and tell him to take us home? I know I'd be dead several times over by now if it wasn't for him, but he pisses me off. Why does he allow these things to happen? And why does he think he doesn't have a say? One can decide one's own fate, but if one knows the ultimate fate of another before the other does, can one make any decisions affecting the other's fate? I don't think I can answer such an existential question. At least not now. Nearly weeping, I thumbed in the direction of Guntersville. Let's go home. Before I finished the sentence, Skywalker was already off the ground. Almost a dozen souls lost in a single day. How much longer could we keep this up? Thirty. The Company Man. Isn't the laws of the state park pretty much in friendly territory? Questioned Stewart as they closed on their targeted search zone. No shit, dumbass. I'm not expecting to get jack shit from these time-killing trips. The only reason I even have you stupid yokels scout is so you'll bring your tasty little kids with you. Brother Brown kept his head facing the road as he drove his truck down the two-lane highway. He blinked slowly and spoke, using all the kindness of a guiding shepherd. Yes, brother, safety is my top priority. Our father allows us to take anything initially left, while simultaneously protecting the flock from any danger. It's a win-win. The others nodded in agreement with their pastor. Mike was barely able to keep from rolling his eyes. None of the others were told they couldn't bring their kids. I don't know why these are the only two pieces of meat here for inspection. He smiled as he walked in the direction of the two girls racing around the playground. Maybe things are happening according to a script. It's all like it's supposed to be. The reverend stepped into the sandbox, noticing he sank slightly after yesterday's drizzle. Though he didn't speak, the girls were aware of his presence and offered greetings. What you doing, girls? He questioned the pair, taking a seat on one of the benches. A conversation was started and continued, with a fair amount of response from the children. They eventually approached the seated pastor asking intently about the gathering that was set to take place in the fellowship hall after service Sunday night, and of course what they'd be eating. Discussing the meatiness of chili with the calf before the meal was so exciting he had to cross his legs. He was barely able to contain a hungry snarl when a thought surfaced. Hey, can you two keep a secret? As the two girls nodded in agreement, he rose and stepped out of the sandbox. If you promise to keep it a secret, you two can come over to the house and help me get the meat ready. Both twins nearly squealed. Brother Brown turned, stepping onto the sidewalk. He held out each hand, waiting for the girls to accompany him. Of course they were eager, each grabbing one of the proffered limbs. 
From somewhere deep down, he shuddered with anticipation. Oh my god, I love this part just as much as the finale. I'll shove them into my toolbox. Their idiot father will be riding in my truck with his bound and gag kids in the fucking back. All he could do was smile, feeling the warmth of the young, tender, trusting hands grasping his. Glancing up at the sun before entering the cover of the portico to stand beside his truck, the man of the cloth judged the time of day. Well, everybody else should be getting ready to leave shortly. Do two of you want to go ahead and get in the truck? At their exciting acceptance, he gestured for them to wait and reached into his pocket. Want some candy? After just a few minutes, the twins were getting drowsy. Giggling, they both had to sit down on the concrete. Just then, the preacher heard voices approaching. Motherfucker! Not yet! Turning to raise the lid on one side of the toolbox, he quickly spun back around. We're gonna play hide-and-go-seek. You can't make a sound. They nodded, doing a bad job of putting on stone faces. Lifting one girl, he didn't notice that one of her Reeboks flew away and landed near the door. Shoving her quickly into the diamond-plated toolbox, he then turned and quickly set eyes on the next girl. Your turn! As he lifted this one, unbeknownst to the wolf, the side of the girl's head smacked against the corner of the toolbox. Blood trickled to the pavement as he closed the compartment and locked it with a key. Back at the church, the preacher handed Hamrick the few supplies that they had scavenged to store in the church food pantry. Hamrick attempted to see the good in everything. Well, that wasn't a very fruitful trip. Only found a few bottles of cooking oil, a couple cans of beans, and a container of dehydrated milk. At least the Lord saw fit to keep us safe during our journey. It sure as hell wasn't fruitful, you fucking retard. The only reason we went was because I needed to get close to what's in my toolbox. I'll be mixing up chili, and you people will be wondering what happened to them. Hell, their fucking dad still thinks they must be waiting back with the other group. The preacher jumped down from the bed of the truck after unloading the last of their meager haul. I need to run to the house. I think I left something turned on at home. Stuart chuckled. But your wife is with the other group. No one seemed to catch the joke. Finally, Jones waved the supposedly temporary replacement for the man of God to his truck. Go on, Brother Brown. You do enough for the community and deserve a break. Mike Brown bowed with almost prostrate humility. Thank you, brother. I only do what the Lord requires of me. He brightened and started for the cab. And if I don't get to the house, I may require the fire department. All the men smiled and bid him farewell. Driving away from the church in his ignorant herd, he laughed out loud. They love me. They really love me. Good thing they are blind. Interlude 4 Again, I emerged on the deck a few minutes too late. The round table was already chatting with my dad over the radio. Brother Williamson mixed up a batch of trial mix with extra raisins. I don't think I have to tell you where I was. Maybe I should start scheduling my daily constitutional earlier so that I can get upstairs on time. But that would require thinking ahead. And then we were all standing in the hallway waiting for Landers to finish pissing in the bathroom when we hear a gunshot. My cousin was telling the assembled crew of this journey to Gunnersville. Apparently this is some type of family reunion. I'm surprised Bob wasn't there because he adds so much to a conversation. And I know Bob isn't technically family. He's pretty close, though, being one of the only people from the similar, my parents' group. AZ nodded when he saw me. He's here now. What were you telling us about Columbus? My cousin began. Well, Columbus Air Force Base is probably less than a mile from the Tenton. You'll know where to stop because there's a bright yellow motorboat docked at a little pier directly north of the base. You can't miss it. If you get off there and walk in a straight line, there's no way you will miss the place. Thanks, Benji. I don't know how I'd ever travel in a direct southern route without your guidance. It's nearly painful when I realize my entire family treats me like one of those guys that almost drowned in the bathtub when he was a baby and ends up living with his mother until she dies from old age. Maybe he was giving simplistic instructions because there were going to be women accompanying us on our journey. 
You know, because they're horrible with directions. Yeah, I just went there. I looked at my brother stupidly. Why? He mentally facepalmed as if this had already been explained. Tell him why we need to go to Columbus. He held the radio out to me as if an extra arm length would make an idiot like me understand. Benji spoke through the radio after a sigh. There's a Hercules on the tarmac loaded with ammo. We just took the small amount of 556. Five, there should be more than enough rounds to last you for the rest of your trip to the ocean. I was glad about that. Raiding shitty little pawn shops for insignificant amounts of ammo is the opposite of fun. He made sure to add, Oh, and we clipped the cargo net before we left. It's a good thing he explained that. I would have thought someone else broke into a plane after the zombie apocalypse and snapped the safety net when they left. Does ammunition not get weathered by the elements? I mean, he's talking like he just left the fucking door open. Spiders could have gotten in there. Oh shit, I better not mention that to Easy. Whether they're there or not, he'll see spiders and end up screaming like a girl before bawling up into the fatal position. I'm not going to say it wouldn't freak the shit out of me to have a hairy tarantula crawling up my arm. But he nearly goes into cardiac arrest when there's a garden spider on the other side of the room. My dad sounded. So, y'all have any trouble with your last few locks in Alabama? A few of the crew looked at me and lightly chuckled before I returned. Now, piece of cake. I paused for a second before another thought came to me. Oh, how's everything going with the gentle giant? Yes, I knew before I said that my dad wouldn't get the joke. The nickname for Michael Brown? Please tell me you got that. My mother was within hearing distance. Or maybe he just didn't want to talk about it with others in the vicinity. He hesitated and quickly spoke. Oh, um, a pair of twin girls. Yesterday. It was clear that subject wasn't to be discussed at this very moment. We just got blown off by my dad. Benji has been going out in some of the smaller planes and rescuing survivors. I cut him off before he could go on. Isn't there some kind of helicopter plant or something at the Albertville airport? He responded like he hadn't completely forgotten there was an airport in Albertville. Yeah, we need to see if we can find a chopper. That will make landings a lot easier. Daddy broke away from the radio. After several seconds, he again spoke. Benji has already been there, recovered a Seahawk and attempted a rescue with it. Well, not everyone with my last name is completely worthless, just the ones named Elmo. He realized our lauded radio time was drawing to a close before any of the crew did. Well, I figure it's about time for bed. Let me know how the next few dams go. Sure we will, if we are not all blue and pantsless. Roger, Iron Man, over and out. I'm guessing my dad fist pumped at even more unneeded proof that Easy was the good son. You know, I just realized my mother didn't say I love you to me. Shit, I didn't even get to speak to her. She probably had a personal conversation with every member of the crew before I got up here. But God forbid if she's going to come back into the room and acknowledge one of her offspring. I could only be killed by this time tomorrow. I'm thankful my family is so loving. 31. Sako's Journal 3 our Humvee was barreling across the causeway headed back to the island refuge of Gundersville. The three of us just finished another failed search for missing children. There was reason to believe now that they might have been abducted by a snatcher other than the Peavies. I, or at least the people in this truck, only had just been given reason to suspect this. No one else had even an inkling of suspicion that it could be an islander. Buzzing, the radio crackled. Sako? That Navy pilot, Benji Collins, must have seen the Humvee. I leaned forward, placing my chin on the dash and looking up. Benji had been using the MH-60 Seahawk he and his co-pilot recently acquired to make scouting-slash-rescue missions. Catching sight of the gray whirly bird racing south over the island, I smiled and clicked my radio. You caught me. What's up? Over. Being a military veteran, I was forced to use at least a little proper radio lingo, even though I was out of the habit. We're going to look for the missing twins. They were reported to have accompanied their parents on another scouting mission to the top of the mountain earlier this week. Want to come along? 
There was no way he would have known the three of us were returning from another failed rescue attempt, nor did he have reason to suspect there was any possibility the children could have been abducted by a human. Instinctually knowing how I would react, Mahatma was already gently applying the brakes. Given any opportunity to discover the whereabouts of lost kids, my comrades knew I wouldn't be able to refuse the chance, no matter how tired I was. Sitting up straight, I blinked a few times and then exhaled slowly. If you can set down on the causeway, I'll take a ride. Ten four. Wait one. He came back. Sighing, I looked over to the phantoms. The two of you can get some R&R. They will be enough backup. You guys could use the break. The green trooper spoke from the rear bench. So could you, sir. I shrugged. Yeah, but y'all can get it for me. All three of us don't need to be disappointed again. Get some sleep. To cease any argument, I made sure to add. That's an order. The clone troopers begrudgingly sounded in unison. Sir, yes, sir. I stepped out as Doshi came to a complete stop. Both hits saluted from inside the vehicle and were off. Hand on my fedora, I lowered my head as Skywalker came in for a landing. Climbing inside, I took in the four-person crew. Benji wearing his customary hat and bomber's jacket. Devin Landers, his co-pilot, sat behind the chopper stick dressed in biker leathers. A blonde girl I was becoming more accustomed to seeing, Amy Rice, filled out a red leotard accented with black leather accessories. It was later revealed to me Benji's love interest was outfitted as Electra. Lastly, a civilian I'd seen a couple of times sporting the garb of Captain America, Robert Coe, finished up the quartet. Suited up as Rorschach, I finished up this strange ensemble of comic book characters, complete with the obligatory blotted mask in my pocket. Getting Benji's attention with a nod, I screamed over the engines. Where are we going? After gesturing for me to wait, he reached up front and brought back another headset. He explained the family had taken part in a secondary scouting mission into Cracker Barrel. With effort, I made sure not to arch my eyebrows when he mentioned that Brother Brown had led the secondary scouting mission. Taking his followers to locations in nearly friendly territory would be a great way for him to get close to his targets. Had it happened at this restaurant we were going to? At the lodge? Why had this not been pieced together before? Landers was able to set the chopper down in the completely barren Cracker Barrel parking lot. Being so close to our sanctuary, every vehicle had been salvaged and moved to the gas bank. In other words, the expansive parking lot of the Lakeview Shopping Mall near Gunnersville Island. Eerily, a windblown garbage bag was the only welcoming we received. Why was this building completely abandoned? It was on the mountain a few miles south of Gunnersville. There was absolutely no human activity in the vicinity. No structure not within spitting distance of the island had become property used by the living for much of anything. Whether by necessity or underlying fear of zombie attacks, uninfected people chose to remain as safe as possible. Maybe this business in the surrounding area would one day soon be repopulated. Inactive it may have been, but there obviously was activity here recently and fairly often. All developed area within miles of our bastion had been pillaged so often that there was rarely anything worthy of reclaiming. It was the ideal circumstances for the leader of our alleged scouting missions to get close with his abductees. The cult patriarch doubtfully expected these ventures to be fruitful. He just needed time with as few prying eyes as possible while he toys with his victims. It was a sickening realization. Every cracker barrel I have ever been to in my entire life had a line of rocking chairs on the front porch, from one end to the other. It gave me pause not to see the typical line of wooden furniture as we moved into the gift shop area of the restaurant. Of course, these were salvaged probably on one of the first raids of this place, but it was still somewhat off-putting. The outside of the structure appeared impeccably clean, not a speck of feces. Well, Benji rubbed his gloved hands together. Doesn't look like any lunatics have been around here lately. Lunatics? Was my question, shrugging the NFO offered as he entered the building. Gene's word. Makes sense. Gene, the comic book guy. I agreed it did make sense either way. This word would have to become part of my vernacular. An insignificant amount of anything remained anywhere in the building. In the immortal words of Spaceballs, we ain't found shit. Every scrap of food, nearly every worthless souvenir and even most furniture not bolted to the floor had been taken. It was almost laughable to think a shepherd could lead his flock here with hopes of finding anything substantial. 
Truth only became more apparent to me with each of these revelations. Some sequential evidence was strikingly obvious, and it wasn't the slightest bit funny. Typical restaurants can be deceptively massive. Patrons are only aware the front half of the building exists. They don't usually spend any time thinking about the back half, used primarily for cooking and storage, let alone actually stepping foot in those areas. The entire seating area was spotless, clean of any sign of the monsters. No footprints, bones, or droppings. There was never anything for the PVs to be interested in there. All food was surely gone, but the kitchen would undoubtedly offer at least some sign of activity. The tile floors of the kitchens had clearly been trudged upon by several individuals recently and for a considerable amount of time. Booted feet left most marks, so it was safe to assume the area had remained free of zombie incursions. No room we entered revealed a single thing worth taking. It was doubtful the last scouting mission to this business came away with much. Even the lighting and wiring had been stripped out. If it wasn't being used on the island currently, it definitely would be. Nothing went to waste any longer. Is anything being created? Are we just using up what we have and not preparing for the future? Will the next generation just be using things from the old world until there was nothing left? I understand frugality and not being wasteful, but most modern commodities aren't renewable. Of course, it may not be high-tech, but humans will have to create to make any kind of advancement or even continue at a current pace. Maybe they eventually would, and I'm overthinking about it. I'm a cop, not a professor, damn it. Benji broke me from my thoughts. Why the fuck would anyone come here? The stoves are even gutted. Shrugging, I had to agree. The last search party to scavenge here was definitely disappointed. Only the pilot, his girlfriend, and I were in this kitchen. Landers and Cole were scouring one of the other empty cooking areas, so I figured now would be the best time to bring my suspicions up about Brother Brown. You know when you picked me up, we were returning from a failed search at the State Park Lodge. The girls weren't there, but we did find some other interesting clues. Devin pointed his flashlight at the floor, running the beam as if the light was chasing something. He made a noise of surprise and questioned Robert. Did you see that? The man dressed as Captain America squinted, attempting to see through the gloom. What was it? Not sure, but I think it went under there. Devin gestured with his light to the crack between a standing refrigerator slash freezer and the floor. Robert dropped down flat on the cold tile, shining his flashlight into the tiny space. The area to each side of the unit was bare, so there wasn't an abundance of space for anything to hide. From the look of the untouched layer of dust under this frigid air, absolutely nothing had been underneath it for a long time. Was it a bug? Rat? What the hell did you see? Are you sure you saw something? Doesn't seem to be. Robert couldn't figure out why this refrigerator was still there. You'd think it would have been taken with everything else. Before standing back up, he noticed a rubber seal in the wall at the back of the fridge. Scooting on his chest closer to the object of his focus, he realized it was a wall-mounted icebox. So that's why it wasn't taken. Upon closer inspection, Robert discovered it wasn't actually on the wall. It was on a set of hinges. This fridge is on a door. That's strange. The superhero moved to the side of the large chest, searching for a knob or handle. After finding one, he pulled the previously unseen entry open to its limit. The door came open to reveal a large walk-in freezer, completely unmolested since at least May Day. Airtight for such a time, the cloud of nearly solid fumes from a compilation of melted, decaying, putrid, and rotten foodstuffs rushed out the opening. The stench sent the first Avenger flat onto his back. The indescribably horrid and noxious stench had Robert puking uncontrollably. His head rolled to the side as his stomach emptied. He was thankful that the upchuck in his throat killed some of the smell. The sound of heaving and full-body retching brought the other three running into the ransacked room. Everything okay? Rorschach, who was first into the room, called out. Captain America was lying on his side, throwing his guts up. I looked over to Benji's co-pilot standing innocently in the middle of the room. What happened? We saw something go up under that fridge and it turned out to be not just a fridge. For some reason it was mounted to the door of a freezer that nobody had been in probably since this place had electricity. Ghost Rider shrugged. 
I'm guessing the food was rotten inside and the smell knocked him down. He made sure to affirm it was the both of them that made the sighting of some small critter. If they hadn't noticed said varmint, the freezer wouldn't have been discovered. I don't know why I was inclined to believe him. His words were unquestionably true. Amy curled her nose. Like, what's that smell? Taking a sniff before coughing and nearly gagging, the man wearing the outfit from the Temple of Doom chuckled. Well, I don't know, Toots. But trust me, I've smelled worse. Placing gloved hands on her side, she narrowed her eyes. Totally. I mean, besides just that. I was about to say, I certainly wouldn't be breathing enough to pick up any background sense. But before I could make that quip, Devin cut me off. Not even breathing deep, he spoke confidently. Vinegar. They had been forced to use their sense of sniff to receive their revelation. So I nodded in agreement, not wanting to throw up myself. But how? I would find that one out later. Wiping his mouth, Robert stumbled over to us and lifted a shotgun from over his shoulder. Does it matter? I guess it didn't matter how or why. All that mattered was that we were about to have company, and a lot of it. Of course, the set of missing twins weren't at Cracker Barrel, but at least we got to offer some justice to a few lunatics. Seemingly overjoyed, bestial howling was heard from every direction. The inhuman noises grew louder as the mass of revenants drew closer. Rushing to one of the two entrances into this bare room, I jammed the lock. At least that will be ensuring we would only be assaulted from one direction. Using a stainless steel island in the middle of the room, we all braced our weapons and prepared for the first wave. Let's make them pay. I wasn't sure what I was charging them with, but they would certainly be paying in gallons of infected blood. And shit. Besides being equipped with the obligatory Captain America shield, Robert carried some unusual armaments. Something he called the Devil's Pizza Cutter was a barbarous-looking bladed set of brass knuckles. It was his shotgun that appeared even more alien. His DP-12 was a side-by-side pump-action shotgun he held ready alongside our rifles. This diabolical brawler clearly packed as much punch as his wielder. Now that I think about it, we could have hoofed it back to Skywalker and been safe in the air before the demons even came into view. Dealing some well-deserved pain to the damn peeves was more important than being out of harm's way, though. Somehow none of us feared for our lives, ready for the coming onslaught. Our plan was not to drink it, but we definitely had a lust for infected blood. Having just laid eyes on a horde earlier today, I knew what I would see, but it was still somewhat disturbing to witness. The first couple of mangy, rail-thin, and unbelievably filthy former humans to round the corner seemed more animal than sentient. Was evolution at such a rapid pace even possible? Muscle structure had changed, sinking lower into the back. This new chain started causing arms and shoulders to hulk forward, simultaneously making hands jut upward. It appeared more primal, giving them an overall fierceness akin to apes. Surely if these muscles changed, others had also. Time didn't allow me to do closer visual inspection, however. If the muscular system had altered its positioning, does that mean bone structure could have done the same? I had pictured something similar to the transformation of people into werewolves. What had already happened to the world was taken from fantasy or horror novel, so anything was possible. As far as I knew, Gunnersville Islanders hadn't taken the time to capture a living peavy or even bring in a truly dead corpse to inspect and research. Maybe Dr. George, the medicine man on the Viva and Cora, had already been performing such tests. We needed to understand more about the mutations of these creatures while they were still close enough to our species for us to make sense of them. Get some! Benji again broke me from my reverie, this time with several bursts of 5.56. As he fired, his volleys decimated the initial comers. Round, splintered, malnourished ribs and cracked open, weakened sternums, spilling vitals onto the floor. Amazingly undigested, barely masticated raw meat burst from their shriveled and shrunken stomachs. Strange? They were clearly starving animals but were able to find food. Vibrantly colored organs were trampled upon by their owners. Juices squished out as shit-covered feet planted on each, sending the ghouls flying like Looney Tunes characters. The life-sustaining body parts on the floor could have easily been confused with banana peels. Most skulls simply ruptured upon impacting the hard tile. 
Scramble gray matter nearly leapt from undead craniums. Seeing their fellows dead in the doorway didn't slow the crazed mass of creatures. They were just too focused on the attractant of vinegar to care that their unnatural lives would be shortened after rounding the corner. More lunatics unthinkingly charged ahead to their end. A continuous wave of what had to be hundreds of zombies lined up like dominoes as they bounded through the entry. Rifle bearers emptied magazines at the juggernaut and the blue leotard sent his earth-shaking rounds into the fray. So many decimated bodies were piling up. Peavies had to move the corpses of their fallen brethren out of the way to receive their personal face full of lead. Tapping Benji on the shoulder, he turned his head to see I was getting his attention using a silver canister. He gave me a lopsided grin. Why the fuck not? My own smile was hidden behind my mask. Pulling the pin, I drew back, tossing the white phosphorus grenade in a tumble through the air. The group immediately stopped firing just as a shower of lava came from behind the first rank of peavies. Tortured wailing sounded from the demons as they melted like witches in the rain. A slimy, grayish batter was forming in a standing pool around the doorway. As expected, the monsters continued surging forward as their comrades screamed in burning death. Like, I've got some of those too, dude! Amy tossed her own Willie Pete at the insane onrushers. Screams of pain came as another wave rushed into flying magma. Superheated specks sank into bodies, emitting an odor horrid beyond description. Their nearly textured sense of boiling flesh, melting hair, burning blood, and cooking shit wafted together to create an aroma impossible to escape. Good thing countless battles with these putrid monsters had hardened our stomachs not to mention being relieved of whatever contents after opening the secret fridge. After at least a handful of Willie Peak canisters went off, the swarm seemed to be dwindling to only a few stragglers. That distant howling from earlier was now quiet, probably because it had become the PV slush that coalesced into a gelatinous blob that resembled diseased-ridden blueberry jello. The few ghouls stupid enough to continue the approach nearly had to step down inches to the pockmarked floor after passing over this unbelievably semi-solidified paste. Amy somersaulted over the island and ran full tilt at the first, slow-moving revenant. Yards from the monster, she leaped up again, spinning, then grabbing both sides from the outside of her legs and held them straight in front of her. True death would be coming swiftly. Slamming into the beast, she stabbed all six prongs into its sunken chest. Standing, she yanked her needle-like daggers from the truly dead reanimated corpse and tisked. Damn, this girl is stone-cold blonde fox. Captain America decided to join the melee. Hurling his weight at a malnourished animal, he brought a razored brass knuckle up directly across the shriveled pectoral. Crimson immediately began flowing when his punch continued, landed right below the center of the oral cavity, in the soft part of the neck behind the chin. Teeth shattered. Jaws splintered and tongue split cleanly in two when he sliced into the roof of the mouth. The front half of the lower jaw and part of the tongue rolled down Robert's forearm, bouncing to the floor with a wet plop. So powerful was the punch, mucus started pouring from the nostrils. Did the blow rupture or simply loosen sinuses? That would never be discovered, because the very next move of the first Avenger was to slam the white star of his shield directly into the nose of the beast. It collapsed onto its back, surely unconscious, if not in a coma. Robert followed by swiping the sharpened edge of the shield across the neck, almost decapitating the beast. He made sure it would soon be meeting its blue maker. A zing sounded as Ivory came out of her scabbard. My katana nearly pulled me in the direction of the other two superheroes surrounded with bleeding, sliced-up bodies and severed appendages. The intense call for battle and blood had to be answered. Waiting was tedious for what looked to be two frail, jittery former senior citizens, now crazed monsters stumbling down the hall, seemingly wanting to die. Unable to watch the tiresome trot, I surged into the oncoming zombies. The geriatric peavies were standing side by side. I intended to raise my blade and slice down at an angle through the skull of the dilapidated male exiting above the left arm, then continue into the dried-up female opposite slicing through its midsection and pelvis, Exiting out below the right knee. Bringing my steel to the beginning of its downward arc, I quickly realized things wouldn't be going as planned. Ivory sliced into the scalp of the first reanimate before clanging against something metallic. The force of the blow pushed what I later discovered to be a metal plate away from the weak cranium. 
It squished into the gray matter, obviously causing instantaneous brain death, ending the immediate threat posed by this poor excuse for a zombie. Even though you wouldn't guess it, the true risk to life came in the form of the rickety female to its right. Before I could regain my fighting senses after the unexpected stop in my attack, the fumbling gallop of the barely living undead female became a superhuman acrobatic sprint. It threw itself on me, using less than a hundred pounds of body weight to send me crashing onto my back, somehow knocking my katana out of my hand. Suddenly grappling with the impossibly strong monster on top of me, I fumbled for ebony with the other hand. The beast deftly pried my defensive forearm away from my body, using fingers that were undoubtedly arthritic mere months ago. It then slid the fingers of its other hand between the opening of my mask and my neck. I was really about to lose to an enemy that could have at one time been my great-grandmother. Does this thing even have teeth? I wondered aloud as I furiously struggled against its inhuman strength. As if to answer, it opened a set of black, rotten, and bloody choppers and clapped them together. Small yellowish glinting could be seen between clacking. This was it. I was about to become infected by a ghoulish waif of a grandmother that magically became undead Wonder Woman. It was craning its neck to take a bite of Asian food when something miraculous happened. As I watched my own death approaching, unable to do anything but scream in impotent rage, the balding skull of the revenant disappeared. Truly dead, the reanimated corpse now collapsed onto me, what seemed like gallons of crimson gushing from the now open neck. Of course, similar amounts of liquid onyx rolled out the other end. After a second, I realized what happened. Lifting my chin, my eyes moved up and behind me to see my savior. It was Ghost Rider, standing with a slack logging chain in his hand. Because their melee weapons were somewhat ranged and not exactly rapid fire, Benji and his co-pilot had allowed the three of us to move up while watching, ready if needed. Lanners must have seen my predicament and stepped in to save the day. No reason to place any type of supernaturalness on his intervention. He was just in the right place at the right time, like any military serviceman would always be. Glad to see you made it. I chuckled at the leather-clad hero. As he reached out his hand to help me up, he returned jovially. You're always where you're always supposed to be. After doing my best to wipe the detritus from my clothes, it was obvious my shirt and pants would need incinerating. But thankfully, the blotted Rorschach mask remained pristine, untouched by the filth. It was funny that, like in the comic books or movies, the faces and images of the champions remained pure. Enemies both foreign and domestic may make sweeping blows and seem to take the upper hand. However, good always triumphs over evil. My companions taking part in the brawl were wrapping up, or slicing up, the festivities with their last few playthings. There were enough dismembered limbs and fresh organs littering the blood-drenched floor that it was safe to say humans wouldn't be using this building anytime soon. We would be doing the rest of the survivors a favor by burning the place to the ground when we left. Even anything sealed inside that recently discovered freezer had undoubtedly been permeated by the rotten food or the naturally created vinegar. Inside the insulated unit, we discovered a container of Welch's grape juice, full of what appeared to be red wine vinegar. Strange. Mrs. Collins, the mayor's wife, later explained to me how this was possible. You might not think it would happen, but vinegar can occur spontaneously in nature, especially when the juice has been sweetened with sugar. When left at room temperature with no great disturbance, fruit juice can ferment and ultimately become vinegar. This was surprising. It didn't take some human involvement to create the substance. Though I didn't ask her, my next question would have been, did the juice turn to vinegar while the door remained sealed, or had the fermentation happened instantly when touched by air? That just figures. Things remain completely placid until humans, attempting to leave as small a footprint as possible, enter the scene. Fuck you and your cat, Schrodinger. Not even bothering to look through any of the supplies in the walk-in freezer, we finished our search of the skeletal remains of Cracker Barrel. There was absolutely nothing worth taking and no evidence of the missing girls. Frankly, I was wondering if they had even come with their parents to this empty building. Accustomed to finding no trace of any of the missing children up to this point, I accepted the disappointment with much more grace than the leading naval flight officer. Collins was the first to storm out the door in the direction of the chopper. Fuck it. There's nothing here. 
This whole exercise was another complete waste of time. From behind him, Amy snickered. Yeah, but I had fun, for reals. Sighing, I pulled a handkerchief from my pocket. Last out of the door, I set it alight and tossed it over my shoulder. Amy's right. It wasn't a total loss. We took care of some infected that won't be posing a problem to anyone else from now on. Devin interrupted me with some strange, seemingly prophetic wisdom. You'll find out more about the kidnapper next time. Tune in to see our heroes tackle the caper of the disappearing children. Same shit time, same shit channel. Did my stories of Brother Brown convince him that the kids were being abducted by a living human? He spoke as if he had prior knowledge of this. He was also confident that it would be me to solve this mystery. Maybe his presumptions would be affirmed. As the five of us boarded Skywalker, Captain America attempted to lift the spirits of Indiana Jones. Shrugging, he pronounced, What we came for wasn't found, but we didn't lose anyone else. Let's take this one on the chin and keep on trucking. With that, Devin started up the rotors, ending any chance of conversation. As we lifted into the air and turned back to Gunnersville, the restaurant was being consumed by flames. Only our memories and stories of the frantic melee that took place inside Cracker Barrel will remain. To those that haven't experienced the ungodly horror known as Peavies, would our tale be believed? Thirty two Black Moon Rising Damn it, here comes that idiot. What's his name? Hamprick? And his bumbling retard buddy Olsen. That chili was out of this world, brother. We both just finished our second servings. The man that could be ultimately thanked for the main attraction of the community potluck spoke. I heard about your tacos. I would love to get me some of that. Not only are all these people stupid as shit, every goddamn one of them is as greedy as me. Those two little bitches made up more than enough for what I brought tonight. I guess that's why they say parts is parts. Praise be to our Father for allowing me to share this bountiful harvest with the faithful. Brother Brown grew somber. Maybe we can get a cow slaughtered from Brother Williamson's herd. I still have some taco seasoning. Both recently bereaved fathers deflated. We were hoping you still had some of that freeze-dried meat. That stuff tastes perfect. Are you fucking shitting me? Does human flesh have some addictive quality? I was going to eat them myself, you rotten motherfuckers. Not much longer and they won't even care they're eating their fucking children. I'll be able to tell them where I'm getting the meat. Then they'll be lining their goddamn kids up for the meat grinder. Smiling sheepishly, the wolf looked around for his wife, making an offer. I'll talk to Mrs. Brown and see if there's any to scrounge up. Guess I'll need to do some hunting. The sun was setting low in the sky. Almost every single member of the congregation nearly fucking worships me because I know how to make their kids taste just right. With the entirety of church members walking to their places of residence for the night, the preacher casually strolled to his truck to fish out a garbage can. The hefty bag contained a handful of small human skulls. Taking a stroll for a few blocks won't kill me. Besides, I could use the exercise and burn off some of this extra fat from the plump, juicy meat I've been chowing down on. He almost laughed out loud at the last thought. Mike Brown walked toward the courthouse, making sure to keep his distance from any occupied buildings. Don't want any of these stupid bastards noticing their messianic shepherd and coming out for a chat. I've got people to defame. Sliding into the lengthening shadows, he made his way to the south side of the building where he found a darkened alley to place the false evidence. Perfect. Reaching into the bag of bones, he pulled out one of the small bleached skulls. Holding it up, he examined the small hole in the middle of the forehead. Which one are you? Brandy? Tommy? One of the others? Mentally questioning one of the small heads, he found this situation comical. Like I give a goddamn. No one else will either. They'll see some little kid's bones and bye-bye, Mayor Collins. Wedging one skull between the building face and the dumpster, he shattered the second on the opposing brick building, and the rest he dumped into the open waste receptacle. Brother Brown was ecstatic that this had been so easy. 
It's like one of those movies where the bad guy wins. Nobody can stop me now. I'll be the king of this little bumfuck island. Barely holding back a maniacal cackle, he dropped the plastic bag. Not like I gotta worry about fucking fingerprints. The pastor hadn't initially seen anyone when he looked around, so he nearly screamed when a voice came from behind him. Brother Brown? What are you doing? Spinning on his boots so fast his cowboy hat nearly came off his head. Grabbing the brim, he didn't do a convincing job of sounding nonchalant. Oh, hey, Hunter. I, uh, was just doing a little cardio after dinner on the grounds. Missed y'all there tonight. The Collinses and their usual entourage hadn't attended most gatherings at the church for quite a while. Brother Brown, Hunter, and pretty much everyone else knew this. It just seemed like the Christian and neighborly thing to say. I just need to hold the little fucker's attention on me. The boy craned his neck to peer at the facade on the other side of the alley. Did you break something? Sidestepping, the preacher tried to regain Hunter's focus, but the saffron-haired child moved his gaze to the dumpster. Are those bones? The boy asked with growing trepidation. The supposed temporary replacement for the man of God was about to have a heart attack. Crafty, he'd never been caught in this particular criminal fetish before. People can't find out. This will ruin everything. Hunter took a step back and began to turn. Mrs. Collins! With only a thought of keeping his reputation pristine and flawless, the wolf lunged. Thirty-three. The Missing. What, are you a fucking fag now? No, baby, it just caught me in the act, and I had to stop it. Where else do you want me to take it? The wolf shrank under the chiding stare of his superior. Shrugging, the alpha eased. Well, it is blonde, and it looks like they feed it pretty good. No reason not to expand our menu. I guess we can at least try it out. Brother Brown broke into a wide grin, feeling he had placated Lauren. This gives us a wider range of candidates. Scoffing, she glanced over at the boy, unconscious with a black eye and chained to the wall. Maybe, but it's another fucking male. You know how much I despise males. Attempting to lighten the mood, he returned with his own shrug. Ah, oh, well, supplies all limited. She smiled wickedly. I guess you're right. I want to crack its little balls and fry them up with butter and salt. Mike's eyes grew wide, and that wasn't the only thing growing. Oh my god, that's so fucking sexy. He started moving to her. I just want to fuck you so bad. Reaching down to grab his crotch, she seductively giggled. All right, let's do it right here before it wakes up. After they finished, the Alpha trudged upstairs to prepare for some cooking. Her husband remained in the basement to make his own preparations. This is my favorite part. He turned the lights down so it was almost completely dark, set his chair in its typical spot, moved the captive bolt gun beside it, and sat down to be the first thing Hunter saw upon waking. She can have a mountain oysters after I have my fun. Did she want to remove them while the thing was alive? That's fucking sick. He chuckled quietly to himself. Stirring, Hunter began to open his unswollen eye. Cluelessness and dread made him uncharacteristically speak. What happened? Where am I? Masquerading so as to sound fatherly, the pastor soothed. It's okay. You just tripped. That voice was recognizable to Hunter, and he immediately grew chilled. No, I didn't. You did it. You're the one that's been taking all the other kids, aren't you? The wolf's smile was nearly audible. You're a smart one. You caught me. You know I wasn't planning on taking you. You're not like all the others I've taken. A little older and male, but I couldn't let you tell anyone what you saw. Standing, he picked up a shiny device, turned a knob and the hiss of pressurized air could be heard. Stepping into Hunter's field of vision again, he held up the device. You know what this is? It's a captive bolt gun. They're used in the cattle processing industry all the time. Hold on a second and I'll show you how it works. Spontaneously, the young boy started screaming, 
calling for any savior. Help! 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 Brother Brown was expecting this. That's the reason he had calmly stepped out into the garage section of the basement and started the small wood chipper placed there by the previous owners of the house. This would be used to ready the wood for some meat smoking, later to more easily dispose of some of the remains from the slaughtered animal and simultaneously killed any of the noise. He walked back into the area where Hunter was chained, excited about what came next. It would be a new experience, a different taste for his palate. I wonder if the texture or consistency will be different. Fuck, I really don't give a shit. Brother Brown was mere inches from pressing the bolt gun against its forehead when a crashing sound started coming from the outer door. Thirty-four. The Realization of Sako. I can see I'm not the only one taking these failed investigations hard. Every member of the department is sick of finding nothing. They are also aware it is starting to happen more often. First child was taken quite some time before the second went missing, but now there are only a couple of days between the last two abductions. Some people were quick to deny that a human could have been responsible for the disappearance of the missing children, but as the rate increased there seemed to be a trend forming. Then these wild rumors trying to incriminate our fine mayor started to spread. I'm convinced that he has no connection to the missing children, other than our shared interest in ending this disturbing mystery. He and I most assuredly share suspicions about a most unlikely suspect. I must tread carefully where my investigation goes concerning one well-respected local pastor. Finding answers will require some specialized detective work. Yawning and stretching theatrically, Detective Sacco began speaking so everyone near can hear him. I'm exhausted, people. I think I'm going to take the rest of the night off. Any law enforcement official knows coming up empty-handed time and again is depressing and tiring. None of the others had a problem with him going home early to get some much-needed rest. But I'm not going home. Now I will have a chance to do some unofficial investigating and surveillance concerning a certain cowboy preacher. Sure thing, boss. We all know you can use a break. Comes back as the general response from the rest of the policemen. Throwing on his trench coat, Sacco walks out the door, smiling as he tosses up his hand. Gunnersville finest don't seem willing to accept that someone who has survived the end of the world might now be kidnapping children. They have been quick to blame the naked blue crazies rather than even suspect a living, rational human being. But Sacco is a realist. I smile as my feet touch the asphalt, placing my fedora on my now masked head. I am in my element. As I disappear into the darkness, a quote from the watchman rolls into my thoughts. Investigation comes first. Consequences be damned. Remaining in the shadows is easy. Night can be a tool used by both good and evil. Tonight I intend to discover if there is evil posing as good. A wolf in sheep's clothing inside our island sanctuary. Paradise can be lost. Lost. When the powerful are willing to prey on the innocent to feed their twisted desires. Lost. When average citizens turn a blind eye to the evil that is right under their nose. Lost. When the sins of those in power are exposed to the light. The people must choose on which side they stand. But they choose evil over good. Lost. When some believe that they are upstanding and righteous, but steadfastly cling to their false prophet, unswayable in their faith, they too must be cleansed. Lost. When they remain self-righteously ignorant, their bare bones will be cast down beside their masters. Evil cannot be allowed to prevail. Who will be left standing while the sycophants are obliterated? the few that are not willing to allow darkness to corrupt society, those of us that stand absolute against evil, those of us that hold to the side of good. Light shall cleanse the darkness, and good will overcome evil in the end. Moving in the shadows and staying out of direct light as often as possible, Sako's radio crackled at its lowest volume. Mayor Randy Collins brought in for questioning after human remains discovered outside the courthouse. A lump formed in his throat. 
I'm not willing to believe the leader of this safe haven is a child murderer. Besides, clues are pointing elsewhere. Has he been set up? An additional message quickly comes over the radio. Hunter Daniels, the ten-year-old boy that Mayor Collins and his wife have been recently fostering is now listed as missing. Due to his proximity to the situation involving missing children, Hunter's missing status has foregone time requirement. I've seen the mayor and the blonde boy together more than once around me. There never appeared any hesitation or hostility from either party. They seem to have a father-son relationship. Hunter must have been taken by someone else. Breaking into a brisk trot, the trench coat clad detective covered over half the island in no time. Sacco now stood in the darkness of the backyard where Pastor Mike Brown resides, remaining completely unnoticed. He has never been investigated or even openly suspected of doing any wrong, at least in Gunnersville. Fortunately, this home doesn't have a fence, dogs, tripwires, or any security whatsoever. The street light in front of the house gave some residual illumination to the roof pitch at the rear of the structure. The detective walked in the open, now to stand in the darkness against the back of the house. Shuffling to a window, he can see lights but no movement in the house. As he made his way along the back wall to the end of the building, every window frame presented him with nothing. All appearances suggest someone is home, just not where he can get a glimpse of them. Maybe I can catch movement in the next pane. Then the detective heard voices. At least two people were speaking. The conversation grew in pitch as Sako neared a door which appeared to lead into the cellar. He made his way closer to this basement door. There he hears a male speaking mid-sentence inside the basement. Supplies are limited. He immediately recognized the voice of Brother Brown. Now an adult female is speaking. I haven't spent much time around Lauren Brown, but I believe it is her. I guess you're right. I want to crack its little balls and fry them up with butter and salt. This is beyond strange. What the hell are they talking about? The preacher replies. Oh my god, that's so fucking sexy. There is shuffling and a pause before he speaks again. I just want to fuck you so bad. Sako was surprised to hear a supposedly upstanding religious leader using profanity. The voice he assumed to be the preacher's wife returns with a low laugh. All right, let's do it right here before it wakes up. Really? Am I going to have to listen to this for at least the next few minutes? What a wonderful soundtrack. This will give me time to figure out what this it is they keep referring to. The most painful three minutes I've ever endured have passed. It is impossible to decide which one of them made the loudest, more animalistic noises. Thankfully, now spent Mrs. Brown is excusing herself to go upstairs and get the kitchen ready. I can hear the pastor moving items around within the basement. Everything is completely still and quiet in the basement. After a few minutes of silence, there is a third voice. The words are not clear, but there is obvious panic from what appears to be a child. Did they really just have sex with a kid in the room? Sick perverts? Brother Brown speaks reassuringly. It's okay. You just tripped. A young boy's voice interrupts him, sounding angry and accusing. No, I didn't. You did it. You're the one that's been taking all the other kids, aren't you? You're a smart one. You caught me. You know I wasn't planning on taking you. You're not like all the others I've taken. A little older and male. But I couldn't let you tell anyone what you saw. Whoever this child is and whatever he saw Brother Brown do, the minister just admitted to taking other children and having taken this one. Things are starting to come together. In the basement comes the squeak of a knob turning and then the hiss of air leaking from something. The hell is that? Then the preacher speaks again. You know what this is? It's a captive bolt gun. Even though I can't see it, I know what it is. They use them all the time in the cattle processing industry. Oh, fuck. I know what's coming. I've got to get in there. Damn it, the cellar door's locked. If I push with all my might. Hold on a second and I'll show you how it works. No! Help! 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 That's Hunter. I have to do something. From inside the basement again, the sound of a spinning electric motor starts and then something even louder drowns it out. Wait. What is that? What the hell? He started a loud motor. 
It's dulling any sound coming from in there. If they're talking, I can't hear them. Is the preacher running a lawnmower or goddamn leaf blower? It must be his way of concealing his crime. I have to get inside while there's still time. If I can put my full weight against the door... Wait. I can see the old hinges in the door start to give. It won't... take... much... more. Thirty-five. The Fugitive. Help! 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 Hunter Daniels called for help from within the basement where Mike Brown had him chained to a wall. Hunter had witnessed the supposed temporary replacement for the man of God, planting evidence to incriminate Mayor Randy Collins in the kidnappings that the pastor himself had committed. Unknown to his clueless faithful followers, this cowboy preacher was actually the wolf. The faux minister, a diabolical cannibal secretly preying on innocent children, finally convinced his wife, the Alpha, that even a male would taste just as good as others they had eaten. Good thing I turned on the wood chipper. Most of them cry out, but this one is loud. Not like that idiot neighbor Jones would hear anyway. That fucking retard is probably too busy praying at his shrine to Mike fucking Christ Brown. Before Pastor Brown stepped back into the basement from the garage area, he looked at a stack of wood. Mosquito hickory. Decisions, decisions. By the time the reverend re-entered the dark section of the basement, his meal was attempting to escape, trying to force the clasp from around its wrist. Moving forward with the captive bolt gun in hand, he thought he heard something banging on the outer door. Loud whirring from the gas motor might keep noise from any nearby good Samaritans, but it also impaired his hearing. Trying to place the projector against the boy's forehead, Brother Brown fought to get it in just the right position. Hold on, it's not going to hurt, I promise. As he said this, the door in the corner to the left of Hunter began collapsing inward. With one last forceful shoulder slam, Hirotaro Sako, the former Marine and police detective turned post-apocalyptic superhero came crashing through the door. Mike Brown pulled away from the boy in surprise. Sacco, outfitted in the garb of Rorschach, landed on the hard basement floor but was on his feet in an instant. There were no words spoken, just the zinging of Sacco's katana ivory cutting through the air. The investigator was going to make sure this was the last lost child investigation he would have to pursue. The pretend preacher lifted the compressed air canister he was holding. It was his only means of defense, taking the blow of Sako's sword as it struck. Ivory impacted the metal cylinder, rupturing it. Sparks flew as steel met steel and the metal tank exploded. Freezing oxygen forced its way out, blowing the policeman's Japanese steel out of his hand, sending it flying across the room and against a far wall. Motherfucker! The pretend preacher spat angrily at Sako. Where the hell am I supposed to get another tank now? Then the wolf chuckled sadistically. I guess I can always just hit them in the head with a fucking sledgehammer. Disgusted, Sako brandished Ebony, his tanto, which was basically a shortened version of a full-length katana. You're under arrest, you twisted bastard. Offended, Mike scoffed. You're going to arrest the man of God? Why the fuck would you want to lock up a dutiful servant of the Lord? Even before Sacco broke down the door, it was all starting to click together in his mind. Now within his vision was a chamber of horrors. Shackles attached to the wall at a child's height. A bloody butcher's table with bone saws, meat cleavers, chef's knives, and meat tenderizing hammers. He now understood what had been happening to all the missing kids. Kidnapping. Murder. Sacco paused, seeming to choke on the words he never thought would ever cross his lips. He clenched his teeth to keep from spitting into the blotted mask. And cannibalism. Mike arched his eyebrows and cocked his head. Good job, detective. You caught me. He smiled and raised his hands. You're a smart one. I surrender. Rorschach smirked under the hood. I don't mind being the smartest man in the world. I just wished it wasn't this one. Now lie on the floor and keep your hands open and flat. 
As the pastor sank to his knees, Hunter began to speak. In that brief instant, Staff Sergeant Sacco glanced away to look at the boy. The wolf took the only opportunity he had. Grabbing the closest object he could use as a weapon, leaning against the wall was a steel bar used as a spit over an open fire. Mike put his hand around the cold metal and launched it at the investigator's legs. Sacco noticed the briefest of movement out of the corner of his eye, but it was too late. He instantly turned back to Brother Brown, but that fraction of a second was all it took, and he went crashing forward in excruciating pain. Brown was coming to his feet as Sacco went tumbling to the floor. The bar careened into the former staff sergeant's shins. He maintained a grip on the onyx pommel of his tanto, but his knees were assuredly bleeding, along with the front of his calves. His fedora was lost somewhere in the fall. Sacco realized in the dimly lit basement that his mask might have lessened his peripheral vision, reached and pulled it off. As he stood again, he tossed the hood somewhere into the unlit darkness of the room. Now his vision would be clear. Brown stepped back, grasping more fighting implements. A steak knife and another long metal bar which he used for stirring coals were within his reach. Taking his own step back, the detective looked at the young boy, attempting to pry the shackle from his wrist. Here, pull it tight. Doing as instructed, Hunter yanked on the chain with his ten-year-old might. Staff Sergeant Sacco slammed his tanto into the links, surprisingly breaking the chain. I wasn't even sure if that'd work. Thank you, ancestors. Run, Hunter! People have to be told! Without speaking, the boy started moving, not knowing why he picked up the fedora and shoved the discarded Rorschach hood into his pocket. Before bolting out the door, he picked up ivory for defense, if the need arose. Unbeknownst to the blonde child, every remaining protagonist on the island would soon be required to protect themselves from what was about to come. Now that the primary goal has been achieved, there's only one thing left to do. There'll be no more wild goose chases. Not another disappointing failure. The hunt for lost children had exposed the most barbaric atrocity imaginable. I'm going to make sure he's stopped. Walking backward, the wolf moved through the doorway from the basement into the garage area. Palm exposed he lifting his staff, trying to sound calm. Hang on. Can we talk about this? There's got to be some kind of compromise. I don't compromise, even in the face of Armageddon, Rorschach bellowed. The Japanese investigator moved forward, razor-sharp blade in his gloved grip, pointing at the murderer. Once they had both passed through the doorway into the underground garage, the detective leaped at Brown. To defend against the sword, the sham evangelist instinctively raised the shaft. The room was lit much like the basement area, dark and drab. The air had filled with exhaust fumes from the wood chipper, making every breath thick and noxious. The racket of the wood chipper was nearly deafening. At least no one will hear what I'm about to do to the preacher. The fake reverend yelled over the loud motor, trying to make an offer. This isn't the way it's meant to be. We can just pretend like this never happened. Sacco was again forced to interrupt. I was meant to exact justice. At another watchman quote, he brought his blade around to strike at Brown's opposite side. Flecks of fire flew as the preacher parried with the steel shaft. Grabbing the steak knife was a distraction. Sacco didn't notice that the minister simultaneously picked up a syringe full of vecuronium bromide. This agent, a paralyzing drug, would render a person utterly immobile after only a few minutes. Brother Brown had asked Lauren to bring home a just-in-case measure from the clinic. He would use it if his subjects became a hassle to deal with. Much to Mike's morbid delight, they would remain entirely conscious and able to feel everything. I'll bring an end to your lies. The world will know what you've done. Rorschach screamed as sparks rained with each slam of his blade. The wolf smiled wickedly. You know I can't let you do that. Sako came around for an uppercut on the right with his katana. The supposed man of the cloth brought his staff to that side to stop the blow. Seeing an opportunity, he only grinned maniacally. The steak knife fell out of his hand revealing the end of Rorschach. The needle jammed forcefully through the tattered leather trench coat, stabbing painfully into his upper arm. 
His thumb pressed the plunger in, dispensing the fast-acting serum into the detective. Jerking back, Sako winced. What did you do? came the hero's confused question. The preacher cackled. Oh, just gave you a little something to make you more pliable. You'll find out soon enough. Though Sako had no clue what he just injected him with, he was sure it would somehow quickly incapacitate him. He had to finish this fight before it had time to take effect. But elevated heart rate and physical activity would most assuredly make the drug work faster. Detective Sako was aware of this, but nothing differently could be done. He grew weaker as Ebony continued to clang against Brother Brown's metal bar. Within mere seconds, he was hardly able to stand. The former Marine was at the point of collapsing. The cannibal minister stood with arms at his sides and began laughing. You've come to the end of the road, detective. Prepare to say goodbye. Glancing around the supposed temporary replacement for the man of God smiled and nodded, as if finding what he was searching for. I've lost count of how many lives I've taken, and I've tasted every goddamn one of them. He pulled his arm inward, slamming the heavy steel pipe into the investigator's knee. This blow was completely unnecessary, but it brought Mike immeasurable pleasure to inflict pain. Sako's kneecap exploded as nerves and bones were crushed. Crimson gushed from the gaping wound, leaving the lower leg connected to the rest of the body only by a few strands of tendons and wet meat. As the detective toppled to the side, he was able to force out one last burst of energy. Slashing upward with his blade, he managed to cut cleanly through the joint of the deceiver's elbow. In his last conscious movement, the sacrifice severed the wolf's left forearm from his body. Motherfucker! Brother Brown cried out in pain. He quickly pulled his belt off and cinched it around his bicep, unrolling his flannel shirt to use as a tourniquet. There. It won't be a permanent fix, but at least I won't goddamn bleed out in the next few minutes. Now this some bitch needs to find out what he gets for fucking with me. What was the point in that? Aren't you supposed to turn the other cheek or some shit? The reverend chuckled. Oh, wait, that's me. Too goddamn bad for you I don't practice what I preach. Brother Brown lifted the stump of his left arm, pointing the bleeding appendage nearly straight up. Being above the heart might at least slow the flow of blood. Maliciously, he looked over to the wood chipper. We are about to have some fun, detective. I won't be disappointed this time. Insanely laughing, he grabbed Sako by his uninjured leg, heaving the dead weight with his remaining arm in the direction of the running machine. Straining to lift the detective on the table at the mouth of the waiting wood chipper, he paused to catch his breath and build his anticipation. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. The preacher snickered, walking over to an empty wheelbarrow, working it in front of the chute to catch anything expelled. Though fully aware the staff sergeant was just now able to open his eyes and move his mouth around, his body was becoming acclimated to the injected toxin. The whirring motor was somewhere below his feet. Oh my god, really? Feet first? As the wolf purposely stepped into his field of vision, Hirotaro Sako spoke with all the defiance and conviction he could muster. What are you waiting for? Momentarily silent, the preacher walked to the end of the table and began moving the detective's legs into position. Do it! Sako screamed through his impotence. No matter how hard he tried, he was unable to move a muscle. Do it! Sako's eyes were growing wet. The last intelligible words of the sacrifice came out in a roar. Do it! His feet dropped into the wood chipper. Certainly Hirotaro wanted to scream incomprehensibly, but he forced himself to make absolutely no sound. Just like his ancestors in ceremonial seppuku, he remained utterly silent as not to dishonor his family. The wolf was infuriated not being able to enjoy his final screams, attempting to take pleasure in imagining the uncontrollable wailing of the sacrifice. The whirring of the wood chipper slowed when reaching the abdomen. The meatiness of organs, excess amount of blood and bone, thickness of muscle and overall mass caused the motor to bog down nearly. It was almost to the point of grinding his cardiac muscle into a sloppy mush, ending his torment. 
Only a few more eternal seconds of unimaginable torture and everything will stop. After this, I will gain my place among my ancestors. With only a quarter of the body remaining intact, it squished slowly into the machine. When Sako's clenched jaw and set eyes went slack and lifeless, Mike understood. The sacrifice was finished. Continually ripping and grinding flesh, the chipper completed the task. There was no excitement, no exhilaration, and no pleasure to be taken from a heinous act that should have been unbelievably satisfying to the wolf. Sako steadfastly refused to give in to him or the pain, a hero to the end. Brother Brown leaned against a table, thoroughly disappointed. Walking to kill the motor of the now-empty wood chipper, he slowly blinked, taking in the scene. Blood dripped from the wheelbarrow, now full of ground-up meat. He stepped back, trying to take in and fully understand everything that just happened. That kid, Hunter, God damn it, it's gone! Well, I'm going to have to do some smooth talking to get out of this shit. The realization that he lost his arm in the fight was just coming to him. Turning, he bent over to pick up the severed arm. Tossing the cooled appendage into the chipper, he waited for it to finish grinding before finally turning it off. He shrugged, mumbling to himself. Oh, well, all those stupid sheep think I'm fucking magic anyway. Christ knows what they'd do if I told them they were eating me. Swimmy-headed, he glanced up at the door to the house and urgently yelled for the Alpha. Hey, Lauren! I'm hurt! And I'm going to need some help, quick! Maybe it was the blood loss making him goofy, but he giggled and added, Oh, and do you think my faithful followers would like some Asian food? Postlude We sat around the table, waiting for my father to buzz the radio. I was uncharacteristically excited to give him news of what had been going on. All the shit with Festus would need to be discussed. The pirates and how we dealt with them. And of course, I would have to inform him I'm now a badass that shot a fucking cannon. I was itching to tell everyone that would listen about my new mad skills. I guesstimated it was at least a minute past the scheduled time. Hesitating, I decided to speak into the radio. Daddy? There was no way in hell I would use his call sign if that's what he was waiting for. Homo? A teary female voice came from the other end. I was confused. Mama, where's Daddy? I didn't want to seem like an asshole and quickly made an addition. And what's wrong? I was beyond surprised my mom was even able to use the radio. She cannot use any kind of technology, even though she claims to be a computer whiz, at least when she is not around me. She turns into a blind and illiterate old lady when she gets on the computer in front of me. It's immeasurably painful to watch her try and load up a Word document, or God forbid pay a fucking bill online. I would rather kill myself than try to convince my mother that there is a big, flashing button in the middle of the screen. Even though it was there when I looked at the computer five seconds ago, she will swear that it's not there now. She sniffled. He's down at the police station being questioned. I waited for more of an explanation and received nothing. Question four? It must have been the emotions breaking her train of thought. He's a suspect. I was shocked. Suspect of what? She seemed disjointed as if she wasn't thinking clearly. Where is Eugene? I broke away from the radio and spoke to the crew. Somebody go get Jane. He's probably downstairs watching Charmed again. I turned back to the ham. He's coming. What's up? He's got to know. I nearly tapped my foot. No, what? If they discovered Ark of the Covenant, I was going to be pissed if Jean gets to know before me. She frantically wailed. Hunter's missing! This has been Zombie Paradise Lost, Still Alive Book 6. Written by Javin Bonds. Narrated by S.W. Salzman. Forward narrated by Eric A. Shellman. Copyright 2019 by Javin Bonds. Production copyright 2019 by Javin Bonds and If I Only Had a Monkey Publishing. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.